and he has devoted his last 30 years of life to develop this technique globally and uh, 
always motivated us on every thick and the thin parts of the spine surgeon's life. As well, uh, whenever we need, he always stand behind us like a wall. He, whether he is in abroad or he is in the social or the family function. So, due to some health issue, Dr. Gore sir is not here, but I know that his blessings, his blessings is all over us. So I want to a big applause to Dr. Gore sir. Thank you. So what is the migration basically? Migration, when we call the migration that uh, when the fragment displaces its original site like the protrusion, that is called the migration. Number disc herniation cases mostly around uh, 70 to 80 percent cases presented with the paracenter and the down migrated disc herniation, and there is a correlation between the horizontal with the horizontal and the vertical migration. If the disc is the paracentral disc herniation, there are the lot of chances of the down migration, and when it is the extra foraminal, then it is uh, equal chances to the up migration as well as the down migration, and when it is the extra foraminal then there are the lot of chances of the up migration. And vertical migration can be divided into two subtypes, uh, near up, far up, and the near down, and the far down. And if it is up to the lower part of the upper uh, part of the foramen, then it is the near up, and beyond that, it is the far up. Same if it is going down towards the upper half of the lower pedicle, then it is the near down, and beyond that, it is the far down. And uh, if you want to deal the, because I am coming directly over the surgeries, if you want to deal with the, the uh, migrated disc herniation with the surgeries, there are the lot of surgeries available from the open discectomies to the endoscopic discectomies. But I think at the most places, the open discectomies has been obsoleted due to these disadvantages. And then the, to overcome the, these all disadvantages, the microscopic discectomies came in the field. But microscopic discectomies also has some challenges to deal the migrated disc herniation. As most of you know that we use the single port in the microscopic discectomies to deal the visualization as well as the to use the instrument. So there is very tough to get the uh, hemostasis in the case of the micro discectomy through the single port. And there are a lot of chances of the root retraction in the micro discectomy. And I think there is very hard to deal the micro, uh, hard to deal the extra foraminal or the far lateral disc herniation with the microscope without the sacrificing of the pars or the facet, and that will lead to instability. So, to overcome all these complications and disadvantages, the endoscopic surgeries came in the field, and the endoscopic surgeries can be with, uh, can be done with the two ways, with the posterior or with the posterior lateral. In the posterior cases, either the UDE or the PSLD. So there is need to remove some part of the bone, lamina, as well as the ligamentum flavum. And one study shows that the ligamentum flavum provides the stability near about the 24.7% in the single mobile segment of the spine. And another thing, if you want to deal the up-migrated disc herniation in the case of the uh, with the PSLD, then there is a very hard to achieve, uh, hard to track the fragmented part which is trapped under the axilla and there may be the more chances to insert the exiting nerve root at the axilla. And I remained always in dilemma before starting my surgeries uh, around in 2017 when I started my endoscopic surgery journey. I was on, remained uh, in dilemma then the pathology, name the disc pathology from the anterior to posterior then why there is need to go from posterior to anterior and cut down the normal structures. And I got my answer with the transformal and endoscopic surgeries, what I started in 2017. And since then, we have done more than 3,500 surgeries at our center. And with these all advantages of the transformal surgeries, the best advantage of that, this surgery performed under the local anesthesia. So there are...
and then take an X-ray and where we were. So let me show you. So this was the intraoperative picture. So you can see in AP view, it was the tip of the hook in the paracentral zone, and while in the tip of the hook in AP view is the completely in the epidural space. So we can say that we have removed completely the fragment and we have done our job. So intraoperatively decompression, you can appreciate it that the thecal sac is completely decompressed and it was the acute fragment and you can see the tip of the fragment, it was the pinkish and it was the big fragment. And if you will compare the MRI with the zone wise, here you can see the preoperative and the postoperative, you can appreciate that what was, what was the big fragment and here is a nothing. And here you can see that uh, in axial view, in axial view you can appreciate why zone wise very clearly, preoperative it was same in the postoperative, while in the middle zone you can see that the fragment has been removed out and the we have left for the annu annulus for the healing purpose. And in lower zone one and lower zone so second, you can appreciate pretty good and the fragment has completely removed. Another case, the patient was a 26 year male and patient presented with the left leatic cyst. You can see the patient is working with the left leatic cyst and uh, he is very hardly to manage the walk with the left leatic cyst and he had the pain on the right lower limb. So this is the MRI from right to left side again. If you will see that the right foramen is the totally free and medial most part as well. And if you will go for towards the left side, then you can see there is the G naught. What is the G naught? G naught basically is the soft tissue amalgam at the tip of the ACP. So you can see at the medial most part of the foramen, there is the G naught. And uh, again, you will move towards the left side. So here is the up migrated fragment. And if you will go, then uh, another I want to share that the PLA is lifted up here. So we can say that the disc fragment was content. It was the content disc herniation. And on left side, if you moving left side, then you can see that the left foramen is the completely free and the exiting root is completely going free. And if you will study the MRI by the log, uh, zone wise, so you can say that the upper zone, again, I will say that the planning, you can see the planning of that particular part of the herniation. On other part, there are the other three cuts. That is why the generally technician does. Like in here, but here you can say that uh, I asked for the five or six cuts, one from upper zone at least, and upper zone there is the migrated disc fragment that is uh, that was coming from the anterior wall, mid zone. It was the large protruded fragment that is coming from the uh, anterior wall, G naught at the tip of the ACP that was the lateral wall, and the hard collagenous annulus that was coming also from the anterior wall while the ligamentum flam hypertrophy that is uh, that is due to the posterior wall. And lower zone, there was nothing to deal. So we decided to operate this patient from the left side because uh, the main fragment that is, you can see the axial cut. Axial cut here is the left, uh, for, uh, left fragment that is compressing that right traversing the root. So we decided the patient from the left side rather than the right side, generally the patient operated from the complaining side, but we decided to operate from the uh, left side. So here you can see that I am doing the job in the middle zone and my direction of the cannula from the middle zone to the upper zone. This is the end plate of the upper vertebra and this is the end plate of the lower vertebra. And this was the main fragment that was going from the middle zone to the upper zone from left to right. So we removed that, almost videos are same. So I would like to skip that videos. The main part is that you can compare the preoperative and the postoperative MRIs. So here you can see that the good pulsating thecal sac and removing the upper part, uh, sorry, up migrated disc herniated part. And uh, it was the hook that I placed on the, after removing the fragment. And finally, we cut the annulus, hard annulus, and achieved the hemostasis with the radio plasma ablation or the RF ablation. This is the way to put the hook on the desired level. So. And if you compare the preoperative walk, just postoperative walk, and the after two months of the downline, you can see that the patient just uh, preoperatively he was walking with the left sciatic last list, and this is the just after the ten minutes of the surgery, and this is the two months of the downline. So here you can see that patient will show show the uh, scar mark of the surgery, and it was hardly visible. So here you can see the scar mark. So it was the scar mark of the surgery. So you can see that how pretty good this surgery 
and uh, if the time is allow for me then uh, i can show the third case but i will want to share only the mri not in the detail of the videos so this was the pre operative videos and here again the because it is my routine practice to see the mri by the zone wise so here is the upper zone patient is a down migrated disc herniation at the, le at the level of the l4 l5 upper zone there is a no problem upper middle zone there is a hard to see anything but lower middle zone there is a hard uh, disc herniation and that is going towards the right side in lower zone 1 so we decided to operate this patient with the transferminal technique again and this was the final decompression and you can compare the preoperative and the postoperative mri basically dr mayesa covered that uh, this surgery beauty is that that there is nothing to change we'll see in the mri of the postoperative surgeries but you can see only the fragmentectomy so nowadays we are calling the fragmentectomy uh, rather than the disectomy so here you can see that the here in this section this is the down migrated fragment while in this section post operative nothing is there and how pretty is this was removed and you can compare the axial cuts in upper zone low upper middle zone lower middle zone lower zone first where it was the fragment here is nothing and lower zone second so it's all about the migration pre operative post operative mri and uh, generally it's a routine practice to use the derwent plug derwent plug how to play the make the derwent plug it's a, i think it's an another talk uh, Dr. Ravind, we have Dr. another, Ravind. yeah. So this is the way to create a Durban plug and we put in the discal area to heal the annulus, remaining part of the annulus. And what should be the end point? These are the end points. Uh, Dr. Mayesha has been covered well, but it may be differ for the different patients. But uh, it's my routine practice. We should not touch the root directly or the thecal sac. The good pulsating uh, pulsating feeling of the thecal sac and the uh, root is good enough for the end point. And this is for take home message to the beginners. Rethink what is the best for the patient to deal the migrated lumbar disc herniation. I think the transferminal is the best least in minimal invasive technique. Proper planning to the target fragment by the reading of the MRI by the zone wise and the key proper instruments, flexible instruments are very helpful because many times it happens that your scope is visualized on many things, but your rigid instruments is not able to reach up to there. So flexible instruments are the very helpful to reach out the, that particular part. And it is, it's my suggestion, and I think all endoscopic surgeons knows that the without Gore's hook, surgery should not be started. And start the endoscopic journeys for the simple cases. From my part, paracentral, I started paracentral in the vertical non-migrated disc herniation at the level of the L45. Then I started the down migrated lumbar disc herniation. Then I drilled the central. Then nowadays I started with the up migrated disc herniation. And we very careful for the up migrated disc herniation to keep, uh, uh, to save the insult of the exiting the route. Thank you so much. Thank you, Girish. That was an excellent talk with uh, beautiful videos. Any questions? I mean, this 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 type of surgeries are not for the beginners, and uh, over a period of time, we need to do at least 30 to 40 surgeries in plane of the disc. Plane of the disc meant more of a epidural line. So once you do that, once you know where to go and how to be uh, maneuvering your uh, your instruments in those areas, then you can you can slowly you know think of operating up migrated or low migrated. In, uh, I mean, down migrated discs. Uh, I call upon any questions. Anything? I just want to add one thing. Uh, you can tackle almost most of the migrations with the transformational technique, uh, with the new tools and new techniques. But you cannot do dorsally migrated discs, pure dorsal, where there is no connection between the fragment and the... Uh, if you have something hanging in the side, in the lateral recess, you can still manage. But pure dorsal herniations, you cannot tackle with transformational endoscope. That you should keep in mind. Okay. I request Dr. Neil Gowda Patil to come to the stage, please. To hand over a moment to Dr. Girish. Dr. Neil Gowda Patil is uh, the HOD, is the head of the Department of Orthopedics at uh, Mysore Medical College. Thank you so much, Dr. Girish Gupta, sir. A huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I call upon Dr. Ajay Krishnan. Dr. Ajay Krishnan is from Ahmedabad. He is uh, basically an open 
and open spine surgeon. But uh, he has been flirting with uh, endoscopy for a long time. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity what uh, Ravindra has created. And uh, I myself, I always am indebted to Sir Gore Sir, who, whom with it got, we got that opportunity to learn the very basics. Hello. We are all because of him. Yeah. We pray for his best health and uh, continuing transforaminal things, which he is still exploring, putting all efforts. Thank you so much, sir. Now, this, this, these are things which we are. Uh, Excuse me. So th these these are things. What we are uh, talking about is uh, calcified disc. Say everything has got a stage, as very clearly told by Mahesha Girish. Say you start from something, and after you have acquired your knowledges and skills to a particular level and limit, you will try to figure out what extra can be done. And those are the things which this comes into the extra. I see Mahesha publishing transilia guy doing transilia guy. I see him doing abscesses, uh, tumors. Everything is possible. So everything is a possibility, not an indication. Say it can be done once you have mastered it, and if you want to do within the ambits of the safe spine surgery. So this is one of those topics which is there. The clear cut uh, contraindications of a transforminal surgery are a non-willing patient. That is one. Second is a dorsally displaced disc which has gone dorsal through the axilla to the dorsally completely displaced. That is the second. A third one is central disc herniation is contraindication to a uh, transforaminal approach. Migrated, high migrated disc, they are contraindication. But this all was five, seven years back. And central disc herniation is not even talked about an indication or non-indication. So everything is moving as a flux. We handle m almost all, all migrations now. We handle most of the central disc, which in books, in articles is mentioned as contraindications for transformal surgery. But they, are, they, doesn't, they don't become indications till everybody as a must start doing these surgeries. Anyways, coming to the point of our discussion, so uh, the calcified disc is what we are talking about is the ventral part of the compression which is not just because of a disc and the disc itself is not an a nuclear fragment what we are talking about but as age passes or with other pathologies there is significant amount of stenosis component which sets in which includes end plate spurs which is there cartilaginous bony humps there and this is what is the actual stenotic component of the patient we are by rule and by all means have been taught the posterior approach of the surgeries wherein we go in inside and address the lateral recess. But we have to understand that this pathology starts even before what is the uh, dorsal pathologies. Though that is coexistence, but there are cases wherein there is only the anterior one which is present, which is the ventral stenosis or the calcified end plate spurs which is present. And that needs to be addressed when we are doing transformal surgeries. We are not talking about this group of patients of instabilities, imbalance, modic, bad degenerated cases where when we need to do fusions. We are talking about decompressive surgeries. Now this is the part, uh, uh, article which I would like to quote and talk. This is the concept changer wherein uh, uh, Rajshekran sir, our own Rajshekran sir has come out with this paper as an ISSLS a paper winner wherein he has completely concluded a different thing that the disc prolapse is transannular going through the annulus only in 40 percent of cases most of the cases 60 percent it is annulo cartilaginous junctional failures and this finally ends towards this when they heal more epidurally so you need to do a foraminoplasty there and get it more dorsal get more you have articulated instruments there, so use your endoscope like a joystick to reach more dorsally and burr, articulated burr, both are things which are needed for achieving the decompressions here. So as a joystick you can move this and you have widened the Cambin's triangle. More cases, complicated cases, quadra equina syndrome, you have to do a bipodal approach. Mind you, I am not talking about the bipodal endoscopy, I am talking about bilateral transforaminal endoscopy. So large disc, they need to be addressed by this. 
like this is the case wherein you can see this is the fragment which is there lying you use osteotome therein to remove so and just comes out but these are the bony things which you have to end up removing to have that decompression complete these are the instruments which are helpful this articulated burr is a wonderful thing which is there scoops are there osteotypes are there the the articulated instruments they work good and the technique is to go inside there first then remove uh, the subannular decompression then you cut across burr it down make it thin use osteotome to cut it now it is floating you pull it out remove it slowly and finally you achieve a flat cord with uh, decompression which uh, which is very much clear and evident this is after having gone there it is burr work which is there off work so you have to thin out thin out both the end plates first and finally you are able to see the neural tissue you are able to find the end points of decompression there so it is burr what does maximum amount of job with osteotomes you are breaking instruments here that is care and you should not be this is the osteotome which is being used to cut it across and once those gets free you then pull it out and once this all is free and separated it is possible to remove but it does take time definitely it, these are all usual surgeries one and a half two hours which takes this is what is the epidural space now exposed this is what is there all style there so it's all is a possible thing what you can do the earliest earliest cases which i was seeing say there were end plates per i tried to remove this was there was a block which was there i could remove with an osteotome there and you could achieve a good decompression there this was the earliest of cases where i started thinking something like was there this was a double lever case a doctor dr bangar uh, i remember his name so he came to me with radicular pain and at those time that is to say around 8 8 9 years i think and i was not exploring and venturing into this category of patients I, and i told being doctor by get an open surgery done this is not my cup of tea and i don't know anybody who doing this also but he said ki i know you will be able to do and just do it so after having consented i went ahead and did a by uh, two level uh, decompression because he had l5 symptoms as well as s1 radicular symptoms on one side only kept up decompressing it both sides this is what the decompression you achieved. the patient was absolutely fine the symptom which he had been carrying on since an year he that van he was completely okay but this patient come came to me after 12 days after 12 days he came to me with i am noticing a limp now he was post operatively completely okay and there was a l5 deficit which was noticed post operatively after 12 days which then again i explained that i should go in open and do a open complete decompressive surgery he said sir wait let's see and three weeks he recovered again complete so probably there was a epidural hematoma which was not evident on the mri which at that time also so it's a possible because it does expansion this is the l3 for case i am a graduate and this is what is l3 for calcified this there and he came with a cauda equina syndrome impending he flown from calcutta there and this is what we have achieved by the bipodal approach and this is you Uh, you can do so this is an l12 again a corner syndrome a 19 year old boy with a paraparesis he had come again bipodal approach you can decompress it you can see across the cord there and this is what is the opposite side cannula you can see this this these all are uh, extensive cases no doubt this is one of my friends uh, we are buddies also arvind kulkarni i saw one of his papers of a posterior surgery calcified surgery where in the stand on decompression tubular decompression i got very much impressed and thought ki just room mein soft fragment in of the cases of calcified disc so this was a case of a calcified disc who came to me immediately after i had seen that paper of arvind and went ahead and thought that i'll just remove the fragment which is main culprit in this you can see this this cannula also does not go in this is the calcified part but i thought that, that the patient has come with an acute symptom why not do just the acute fragment removal i removed the actual fragment he did not get relief i had to convert in 10 days to an mld so that doesn't work it doesn't work in the way we are thinking and everything uh, all pay all things on and top of it there is bilateral facet arthropathy this chronic over the chronic disease when you see the next cut at the lower end plate there is acute fragment here so there is acute fragment in the right lateral recess and also there is a recess stenosis patient has only predominant right symptoms no left symptoms and uh, occasional back pain so the plan is to decompress the right l5 root through transforaminal approach here because facets are uh, 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 hypertrophic 
and when you see the superior facet, it is big, and uh, there is a lateral recess stenosis. So maybe we might have to uh, drill a bit, uh, might have to do a foramenoplasty also here to get access into the uh, foramen and uh, decompress the root in the lateral recess. So we are going transforaminally here. Uh, the approach, patient is under uh, local anesthesia, sedated, made prone. So... Can you show the T2 images, sagittal? Sagittal, yeah. Remove this film. Uh, put this film. There must be one more film showing only T2. And one more film is there. Unko ka, unko ka. Innan film tabli da. Okay. Yeah, anyway, we can make out in T1 also. Yeah. Um, so you can see the the down migrated. Still images also here. Yeah. There is a small down migrated fragment here. I'll just show you. Remove that. Put it. Yeah, that is the correct one. So you can see here when you come from the the right side the foramen cuts. You can see right right side there is a foramen stenosis here. Yeah. yeah. Can you see here? Yes. Yes. So then there is a medial uh, foramen and lateral recess is stenosed, and there is a small acute fragment here. Yes. Yes. So that's why it has become symptomatic. So Correct. there are components, a soft component. Uh, maybe chronic hump and a lateral recess stenosis, uh, the facet, uh, medial facet ligament is hypertrophied. So we are dealing with a, a, a acute and chronic case here. So we might have to little bit drill also. Yeah, so I think tip of SAP and also a little bit of the facet yeah. will have to be drilled. So now uh, we have uh, positioned the patient, uh, uh, now we have positioned the patient and uh, when we push in the patient for beginners, they should take some precautions or uh, some uh, prerequisites that patient back should be flat so that if you can make some comfortable position to the patient where his back is flat, that is the lordosis is uh, circumvented, what happens, the foramen little bit opens up and the, the space for working is easy. So try to, whenever we are going transforaminal, try to make back flat so that there is no lordosis. If you have a good table, you can break the table so that we can uh, make the, uh, the position more flat on the back. Once it is done, then we should have a good uh, CM technician who is wonderful here. What we should do is, first we should see the AP image should. <coughs> can you see the AP image? Yes. So here again, uh, for uh, beginners, they should know whether the, the X-ray, the CM is positioned properly, the midline is in proper position, the interpedicular distance or the pedicle to midline, both distances are equal. So from the midline to the bilateral pedicles, the distance should be equal. So you are, uh, there is no oblique X-ray here, marking is easy. So once it is done, we are fortunate today that the end plates are parallel. So maybe the both lines, the AP line and the lateral line, where Dr. Anil Sangli was describing before, might meet because it's a, it's a parallel, end plates are parallel here. So first, once you have done a CM adjustments, then you tell the, the technician that the CM base should be fixed. It should not be mo moving all the time so that you get a uh, wrong calculation. Once the position is done, then dilate. So we take a AP X-ray. First, we'll do a AP shot. Shoot. This is a midline, so I'll mark the midline. So just mark the midline here. Once the midline is marked, then you take a AP transverse line. Shoot. So you can, uh, just I'm taking a AP transverse line there. One line, transverse line I'm taking. Then once this is done, then you should take lateral image. So when you are in la doing lateral, then here take care should be taken that uh, the base of the CM should not be moved. These all precautions are important. 
patient for a transforaminal surgery, if you are doing an interlaminar surgery, you need not worry too much. And I am taking a lateral image here. Shoot. 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 So here I am uh, uh, marking the, the lateral line parallel. So the, again, once you mark the parallel line, this is both are meeting together, as I said before, AP. Then the confusion starts for the beginner. How to enter, what is that centimeters, whether it is 5, 7, 8, 10, 12, a lot of uh, being debated, discussed about it. Uh, uh, so, uh, Dr. Gore sir has also done a lot of work on this. The common thing is in Indian population, it is come somewhere between uh, 9 centimeter to 13 centimeter. This is a normal average we should go. If you want to go more medial, so uh, midline disc, you take little bit lateral entry. If you want to take uh, foraminal, uh, or extra foraminal take more medial entry. That's, that is a simple logic. Then here, how to enter over period of time, uh, uh, we have done our own uh, uh, observation where you can see the flat here. You can see the, the flat of the, the back. Can you see the flat here? Yes. So you just uh, 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 imaginary lines where, where the flat the slope. Usually, most of the time, that is your entry point, most of the time. It uh, comes around uh, 12 to 14 centimeter. We'll measure here with the scale. So, it is coming 13 centimeter here. So, most of the time, you can reach from the lateral recess to the midline with this entry. Whether you want to go for a month and go more medial, maybe 10 centimeter, so that you can reach the foramen, extra foramenal area easily. Where you want to go more medially, that is midline or paracentral, this entry will take care of it. Now, once this is done, we give a local here. We will give a local just because the patient here is in local anesthesia and with some that you always remember. Oh, So we give with a local here and then use a <coughs> bevel of the 11 blade Thakundi so always uh, uh, the anesthesia again what anesthesia to be given for a beginner uh, for any transforaminal case always start with local because uh, we should have a good anesthetist if you want to do under epidural because it is quite sometimes dangerous if you want to do epidural and anesthetist uh, gives uh, intrathecal uh, then it becomes a uh, intrathecal anesthesia and patient might have problems. So you should have a very good anesthetist with you and you are confident and setup is good. Then only you try epidural or sometimes a GA. But most of the time as a beginner, because you are going through the Cambin's triangle, exiting now route is there. So always try to take care. And uh, once a small local is given, I give a small stab here. The advantage of this stab I will explain later. Give a small stab. Needle. Give a small stab and here I am using a, either you can use a 17 gauge or 18 gauge needle, which is a stiff needle with a bevel. You can see the bevel here. Can you see the bevel of the needle? Yes, yes. Yeah. So the bevel of the needle helps you to, uh, what you say, uh, navigate whether to go on to go superiorly or inferiorly. So we'll just show when I'm going inside with the bevel up and with some angle. So you don't know how much angle to be gone, uh, go inside. So with a simple angle, your target is to go to the midline. So where we have marked in the AP, as Dr. Sangli said, the AP line, that AP transverse line is for the uh, direction that is uh, medial lateral direction. So this is a direction, we target the midpoint here and go inside. Shoot. 
so never go with too much angle because you will enter the abdomen, abdomen. So, so you can always err on anterior side so not what i am seeing here is uh, i am little bit uh, cranial here i need to come caudal so here to gain that i need to come to caudal now uh, my bevel is facing at 12 o'clock what i will do is i'll turn the bevel towards cranial side because uh, sorry caudal side because i want I want to go caudal, then I will turn it to the cranial side. So I have turned the bevel to the cranial side. What does this do? I will have turned the bevel to the cranial side, then I will just direct it caudally. Shoot. Now you can see the bevel is facing cranially and the needle is going caudally. Can you appreciate that? Yes, sir. Yes. So I am just going, and as Mahesha in previous uh, uh, discussion he said, Needle always should be in the lower foramen to prevent, as a beginner, to prevent uh, uh, nerve injury. Shoot. So I am just standing there, just gone at uh, stopping at lateral pedicular line. So I don't know how deep I am. So I always stop at this point and take lateral. So now I will make bevel again, 12 o'clock. I made the bevel 12 o'clock. Now I will see how deep I am, whether I have gone below the facet or I am just touching the facet, I can understand it well. Now you can see I am just uh, below the, the facet now. So I will just go down a little bit. Now further I will progress my needle further in. Adjust further so in. when you reach this point, you should always hit the facet with sure. the needle. Because sure. once you hit the facet with the needle, your root will be away. And you have to graze the facet and then go in. So that is sure. the way you can avoid the, the root coming there. Now you see, I just stopped there at the annulus. The annulus stopping here. Now I'll take AP, how medial I am. Just take AP. So if you touch the annulus without any resistance, that means you don't know where the root is. So always, so uh, before entering the disc, always take a AP so that where you are. Now you can see, I am just in the mid-pedicular line. I have not crossed the medial pedicular line. So what does this explain me? I will be entering the annulus at just at this point of time at this point of junction. So I, I will be entering the annulus at, at the medial foramen where I will enter the disc. So what, where is our pathology? Our pathology is in just at the medial foramen and which has migrated inferiorly and going centrally. So we can address the lateral midline with this entry very easily. So now I enter, I will just enter the disc here. Should I just entered the disc, uh, gone <laughs> beyond the medial pedicular line. Now I will see in lateral where I am. So Can here, you? if you are just in the posterior one third of the annulus, we are right there. So So here you should have a very good X-ray technician. Can you see there? Yes. We are just at the posterior annulus. I'll just advance it a little bit because here we wa want to go into the annulus completely shoot. I've just gone now. I'm in the posterior one third. I'm in the posterior one third. This direction is okay for me because we are also dealing with a small inferior migrated fragment. So this direction is okay for me. Shoot. Now you can see my needle is almost reaching midline and in lateral we were just at the posterior one third. So this is the ideal position always a beginner should have where he should. Now I will remove the stilet. I remove the stilet and stilet is measured by the assistant the guide wire so that as a beginner you should not plunge inside. So I measure the stilet, how deep I should go, where should I stop. So I measure the guide wire and stop there. So but this allows me that I should not go beyond that. Then I'm with a, just a twisting movements. I'm just removing the, the guide wire, uh, the needle. Can so you show the uh, operative field? 
Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. So I'm just removing the needle now with the twisting movements. Once you have done that, then hold the guide wire, ask your assistant or yourself, hold the guide wire. Common mistake done by a beginner is here. He tries to remove the needle, guide wire also comes out, and you are again, you have to do the procedure again. Shoot. So now guide wire is there. I can easily remove. So if we are not given the stab, then I could have been struggling to put a, extend the incision or put an incision. Now because I've given a stab, all I have to do is just lift the guide wire and extend the stab incision. So that's very easy. That's the advantage of giving a stab incision. And also if you don't give stab, some of this plastic and also some dermis can go inside and inside. cause infection. Infection. So that's an important point. So a dilate inside, follow the basic principles, the guide wire and the dilator should be in line. You should not tilt it, otherwise it will get kinked and you might have problems. Should. This is the time you should tell your anesthetist that I am putting a dilator, patient might complain of pain, so they will also become aware and uh, you tell your assistant also to take some local in hand. Don't use adrenaline, use plain local anesthesia. Use plain local anesthesia. Don't use adrenaline here because sometimes you are in the foramen and you give uh, <coughs> adrenaline mixed local, patient might shoot up and also cause uh, bleeding when you are operating. So use plain local when you are near the foramen. So I am going towards the foramen now, just gently twisting. Show no. the uh, operative field. Yeah, okay. So gently pushing the dilator in. You and also make sure that you don't push the guide wire. So you can see now the dilator is little bit going cranially. I adjust the, adjust the shoot. So adjust the line now again. So just push it. And I stop here. Once I come to the foramen, I stop here. I will not push further because I will push my dilator always in lateral position. Why? I will tell you. You stop here when you enter the foramen. You stop here and take a lateral image. So the lateral image helps you. You, should, you will not injure the end plates. Should. So now you can see. If you <coughs> direct to cranial, you might injure the end plates. So that's the advantage of taking a lateral. And I always should. Should. So I always push the, uh, push the dilator in lateral position. Now I remove the guide wire. I am sitting on the annulus here. And I just tap it. And can ask. Should. So just I'm going in with a very, no force, I'm not using any much force here. I just entered the annulus here. Now we'll take AP to see. You can uh, see that that black part, which is about 15 millimeter, it has entered into the annulus, subannularly. So this is the ideal entry you can make for this case. Yeah. If you are too deep, then you'll be just debulking. You will be removing a lot of Should. disc except the fragment. Now you can see we have gone till the midline, till the midline. So that is what we want. We want something to be working till the midline. So again, you see here the no plastic has gone inside. No plastic has gone inside. Now I'll use a bevel here. This is a bevel uh, cannula which uh, morning uh, the uh, previous speakers were telling. This was in introduced by Anthony Young, where the bevel cannula increases the field of vision because we are using a 25 degree or 30 degree scopes. This will increase our field of vision. And you have a marking also on the cannula so that it will give you a rough estimate how much deep you are going. And uh, there is a <coughs> pointer here. This will denote once the cannula goes inside, the bevel which ties, which uh, where the bevel is, so it will uh, help us. So
So now I'm putting the bevel again. We are operating from the right side. So as Dr. Gore sir has described this, you use your right hand when you're standing on the right side. So use your right hand and you can see this is a traversing route and this is a exiting route. So you face the bevel towards the axilla so that you will not injure the, so I'm facing the bevel towards the axilla, towards the axilla, make sure no plastic goes inside here and I'm just pushing the bevel. What happens sometimes the disc is so rubbery, when you're pushing the cannula, the dilator pops out. So you should make sure that the dilator doesn't come out, should. And you if you push the dilator, I mean push the cannula without the dilator inside, then your dilator, the cannula may get damaged. So you that's should. why dilator has to be there inside. Now you can see I am at the foramen now. So now I'll uh, just tap it inside. So I'll just tap it inside. Very gentle, you not be, no, your force is used here. I'm just using gentle tap, shoot. I've gone in, shoot, I've gone inside there. So I'm there at the middle now. So I'll just remove the dilator, shoot. I remove the dilator, we are there. Now we'll just start looking into it. So what- Just what? show one uh, lateral also for yeah. the beginners plus. so that- uh, I think plus. Uh. Sorry, the lift mod it could we are using a, I use a shoulder arthroscopy drape where it has a bigger pouch so that the water can get collected inside easily. Yeah. Wait, 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 shoot. Can you see the cannula there? Just the bevel is. Can you make it bigger? Yeah. Shoot, AP. Yeah, we can see. So the bevel is just sitting inside and... You can see that half of the bevel is inside, half is outside. So that is very good. So, so here what you should imagine is now what we will see here. So once we are there, you might be seeing a PLL and some epidural fat and posteriorly, some uh, uh, torn annular fibers and some uh, disc fibers. So this is what the picture should be there. So we'll go now inside, we'll take the scope. So I am using a 25 degree scope today uh, by uh, Richard Wolf, the Revospine Wolf. Uh, so this has uh, again for the beginners, uh, just for sake of uh, demonstration I'm showing. Can you see the, the opening here? Can you notice it zooms yes, Tava? Yes, we can see. So I am using a bevel scope where it has a irrigation with the light source and this is camera connected to the monitor. So again, it depends upon which system you are using. Uh, a light off, a light, uh, light off mode, but 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 so now I'm going inside, I'm going inside. So now I'm going inside, I'll just adjust the, the focus. Can you see the video now? Yes, yes. The endoscopic image? Punch, yes, we can punch, see. Punch. So now once you put a scope here inside, we are standing on the right side. Uh, we are standing on the right side means right side of your screen is cranial, left side of your screen is caudal. This is a very simple logic. We are standing on the right side. So <coughs> right side of our screen in front of you is the cranial side. And the 6 o'clock is uh, for anterior and the 12 o'clock is towards the thecal sac. So this you can see the inflamed disc here, so much of inflammation is there. First, what I'll do is just try to work at 6 o'clock first. That's yes, a, a make bigger. the endoscopy bigger. Okay. So, always try to work at 6 o'clock as a beginner first because you don't know how you have entered, where you have entered. So, always work at 6 o'clock first. Try to remove the loose fragments deep in the, annular, uh, the disc space. Once you have done that, now you just get that 
saline konchu increase pannu now you get some uh, anatomical understanding rf so here you can see at 12 o'clock the uh, annular fibers are seen so i'll just come out a bit so that you can see the you can see the pll fibers and the epidural fat so you can work better so you can see here this is a fragment which is a chronic fragment which we are seeing as a chronic hump there which is more darker uh, the radiologist dr mahesh was telling chronic or more darker and t2 this is the annular fibers can you appreciate the annular fibers here yes yes so this is the annular fibers here i am using rf 4 megahertz rf here to just shrink the tissue and make our feel better the floating filaments always makes you confused and disturbed so always try to enoda hook irunchila hook hook enadu so now what i'll do at this point of time is i'll just come out little bit just uh, maybe 2 or 3 mm i'll just come out now what you start appreciating you can see here at the posterior you start seeing some uh, uh, at 12 o'clock you start seeing some horizontal red fibers above at uh, 12 o'clock uh, more posteriorly you see white fibers so those are the annular fibers and the pll fibers you are seeing you come little bit further out further out you can see now 12 o'clock yellowish structure is seen now yes. so that is a epidural fat now you take a shoot here shoot and you see here you are just bang on the can you see the ap image not yeah yes so you see the ap image as we have come out you are seeing we are just working below the traversing root here the epidural fat denotes that we are come to the lateral edge and the pll has ended there and we are seeing the torn fibers now rf rf so now what i'll do is we are dealing with a small acute inferiorly migrated fragment on so we have to just then we do intra so i am just coagulating the annular fibers here annular fibers. Is most of these fragments are caught by the annulus so there is a rent in the annulus through which the fragment comes out and it is held by the annulus so, so what i will do is i'll just rotate the the sheath caudally i can can you see i am yes. just rotating the sheath caudally now shoot what does this uh, uh, makes you understand can you see the caudal uh, directed bevel there yes so cutter karud cutter so once you cut the annulus the fragment gets released you take it out so now what i am using is a a uh, uh, annular cutter which is a very small cutter you can see uh, it is a curved cutter and the mouth is so small you can see the mouth is so small now here again when i work the both instrument the scope and the instruments are in one line it is difficult to see that's what girish was telling in the morning when you try to cut the annulus you don't know what you are cutting so always try to rotate the scope you see i am rotating the scope here once i rotate the scope i can see what i am cutting so now i'll just cut the filaments i just cut the fibers here so he's cutting annular fibers so i'm just cutting the annular fibers and I
Hello. Yes. Yeah, so now what I did is just a little bit cut the annular fibers. Okay. You can see the uh, 11, uh, 12 o'clock, you can see the flapping. Yes. That's the epidural space. So the advantage, one more advantage is whenever there is a disc prolapse, the disc lifts the thecal sac more posteriorly. Yes. So you have some space to work there. Now you are seeing 12 o'clock is the thecal area. So we n cut her. So now we can cut the further fibers, more, some more fibers here. I'll just cut the straight itches, straight cutter. Yes. So I'm using a straight cutter now because it was too angulated. So I'm just using a straight cutter, just cutting the... Once I cut little bit, as Mahesha was telling, the intraannular fragments or the fragment gets released. Little bit becomes loosened, your uh, working becomes better, so you will not injure any tissue there. So what at this point of time, I will do is I'll use a hook here, try to hook out the... Actually what you can see is the base of the fragment. So I'll just use a hook here and try to hook the area and see here it should be very gentle, you should not use any force. You can see here, this is a, the inferior... Uh, end plate. End plate, should... Should... Akachubich. Can you see that's an inferior end plate, X-ray? Yes. yes, yes. So what I'll do is I'll little bit come out and I just re tease there and try to work there in that tree and the space between the inferior end plate and the annulus. You can see my the this uh, the tip of my instrument is going very easily here. We have not cut here. We have only cut here, but medial to it, you can see the yes. instrument is going very easily. So. Yes. That's where it has torn and the fragment has little bit migrated inferiorly. All we have to work is this area and just see whether a fragment comes out, otherwise we'll cut little bit more. So you can see the fragment. Yes. Upturned punch. In, upturned. So I just use a angled punch here to hold the, grab the fragment, grab the fragment there. I'm just going in grabbing the fragment. Can you see the fragment yes, coming yes. out? Yes, we so can. So that's see. a fragment. That's a fragment. It's quite big. Quite big. Straight. You can use the straight bigger yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Straight. So initially to get it out from the migrated position, you used a small angled instrument. Sometimes you can use a flexible instrument, but they are not strong enough to get it out because it is very big. So now it's a fragment is coming out. You can see the fragment. Can you see the fragment here? Yes. Can you see the fragment? Yes, we can see. Yeah, so I'm just removing the fragment now. And you can see the red tinge, uh, red tinge. Just switch uh, off the light or... Switch keep off the light, light switch off. Uh, light source. Light, light off. Light button. source. Light source off for a while. Yeah. Can you saline? I'll off the saline. Yeah. Can you focus here? Can you focus? Can yes, you we can see the red. Uh, uh, can you see the red tinge now? Yes. So yes. that's a that's a fragment which was causing the the pain for the patient for now. So the light. So now you can see there is some ooze coming out. It means that the epidural space has opened up there. Now the next part is to work on the base of the fragment. So we have worked on the tip of the iceberg. Then 10 minutes. And now we need to we need to understand what is that. You can see at 12 o'clock the pulsations have become better. Yes. And I'll also you can see the epidural ooze. Yeah. So then I'll use a hook again to confirm whether my complete fragment has come out. I'll just use a... So you should be... This, this is a least invasive surgery and especially when compared to interlaminar and transforaminal. 
transformal is least invasive because you are not violating the facet many times. If only necessary, you drill it. And that to non-articular part, you drill it. So definitely, this is more uh, less invasive than compared to any other endoscopic procedure. Now, the epidural loose. And at 12 o'clock, you can see the epidural space is flapping better now. Yes. So what I do is now just I'll clear that area further with my cutter yeah. and uh, see the traversing route. What you see here is the annular hump. Cutter. The fragment has come out. The acute herniation has come out. The chronic hump is remaining. So what I do is I just cut this area. I'm cutting this area. Just small cutting, not a big cut I'm doing. So I just clear this area so that I'll be dead sure that morning there was a lot of questions. What is the end point? So end point is, one is this epidural loose. Then uh, when you compare to the MRI punch, that the fragment has come out or not, then flapping of the now, flapping of the now, which has been removed or not. So these are the basic uh, endpoints. And there are other advanced endpoints. If a chronic hump is there, I always try to remove, as Ajay Krishnan was telling, chronic humps, if you leave it, they become symptomatic again. So though they were not symptomatic before, if you leave the humps, they will become symptomatic again. So always try to flatten the hump so that nerve is decompressed completely. So that habit you should make, spend more time around the pathology. I am trying to go deep into the disc now, look for the base where sometimes we are only tackling the tip of iceberg and uh, the base of iceberg is left and the patient comes with a, a recurrence. So we can't afford the, we cannot afford that uh, uh, patient coming back to us again just because we have done an inferior surgery. So always take care to remove the deeper fragments if you are, because we are, we are dealing with a chronic disc pathology, degenerated disc pathology with multiple fragmented disc. So intraannular clearance is also necessary. It is not an acute extruded or migrated disease. Acute on chronic disease, so there is uh, some uh, element of intradiscal problem also. Uh, what I am trying to, just I cleared that area, RF. I am just shrinking that uh, area so that your vision becomes better. So now we can just uh, shrink this. That is the root you are seeing there above at 12 o'clock. Can you see the root here? Yes. So that is the root area. And this is a PLL, which is uh, thinned out and inflamed. I'll just try to just cut that PLL. Why reason, I'll tell you. Uh, just a bit of PLL I cut. I'll cut PLL, uh, cutter. Cutter. So I'll just cut that small bit of PLL here. Just I'll cut. When I'm cutting, I'm making, make sure that you're not holding anything else other than PLL. So I just cut this. You can see so much inflammation here. You have to be careful in this step because you can easily catch the dura. dura. Sometimes there can be additions between the dura and the PLL. So what happens, there might be sometimes uh, some more fragments be more medial here. So that's why I'm taking extra precaution to. So I just, there is a chronic hump. This is a chronic hump we were talking about. So the, you can see this, this is a chronic hump. This one, this is a chronic hump. Uh, cutter. I'll just little bit go inside now because we have removed that offending fragment. I can grow inside and remove that uh, uh, the chronic uh, hump. So this is a chronic hump which was causing the central bulge. Now if you take a C arm, you will see we are into the medial side. Should 
Can you see the medial almost? I'm at the midline. Can you see? Yes. So this uh, midline hump which we are talking about, there was a hump there, and just trimming it so that our area becomes much clear, and we are uh, removing the the chronic hump also, and uh, annulus does remodel punch nicely once you have done uh, removed the pathological area rf ready mm -hmm. so i'll just remove that hump here you can see that it's a chronic fibrous fragments which are there just below the pll so these are things which are very important to be removed otherwise patients so you can see the fragments now coming out yes this is always important. I am still working at the just medial to the root. We have done below the root, fragment has been removed. Now I am working medial to the root. So just removed the fragments, cleared the annular tear, chronic tear. Now you can see it is flapping better now, RF. So I'll just shrink that area. So we are almost done here. There is one epidural bleeder there. Yeah, yeah. it's a small bleed. Yeah. I'll, I'll shrink it. So you can use RF uh, very close to the dura or the root, but don't use RF directly over the dura or the root. Any questions you can ask now? Now again, I'll just want to go and remove this uh, hump here, you can chronic uh, fibrous. I'll just remove that cutter. I'll just remove this part. Cure it. You can use even cure it, cure it here. Cook madri cure it here. You can use a cure it. So I'm using a curate. This hook and curate credit goes to Dr. Gore, sir, who has done this. And uh, this is a very good instrument where no one uh, has ever thought of the curate and the, the hook. So initially designed by him, then so many we have local companies now punch. But uh, the hook concept, works uh, uh, wonders in transforaminal. In interlaminar, it is not necessary much of, most of the time because you can go there and reach with the scope turning to the fragment. But here, because you are fixed at one point, so always hook helps a lot, hook and cure it, because we are opening it, working at a very small place. So I'll just, what I did now is, I rotated the scope little bit infi sheath inferiorly RF making sure that I am removing that chronic hump inferiorly also. You can see that the dura is well decompressed now. So you now dura is well decompressed, flapping down. Can I all notice the dura now flapping down? Can you see at 12 o'clock? That's the dura flapping down. So now I'll shrink the whatever the rest of the, the floating things or any acute things will come out with the RF coagulating. Sukumar, so are you doing some LCP drilling because there is some foraminal narrowing or it is enough? I think it is enough because he doesn't have any L4 symptoms as such now. Yeah. And so also he's young, I think. Young, very young, 31 years. So he's absolutely asymptomatic for that. So, and if I had not gone the, gone this, uh, if I had not got this image, uh, the end point, I would have gone and drilled the facet. So, yeah, because foramen, it may be appear, it may appear as stenotic, but foraminal stenosis uh, has a, I mean, it doesn't become symptomatic uh, that acutely. So, like now I'll just use a hook and show you the landmarks which you can correlate uh, at the MRI. So, you can see now I'll just hook here, I'll keep the hook middle most part where we are seeing the image here, I'll just keep a hook here. And shoot, take a shoot, shoot. Okay, you can see there, we have gone middle to the root there. Can you see the x-ray image? 
Yes. So we have gone medial to the root. So then I come laterally, again go inferiorly, shoot. Can you see? Yes. So I come to the pedicle area there. So it means that we have gone in. Can you see the epidural uh, space yes, we there? Can see. So you yes. can see the epidural space is free. Nothing is there. Then I come and keep that at this fat area. Shoot. Can you see this is at the medial pedicular line? Yes. So it means that from medial pedicular line, beyond the root, you have decompressed. So that is where the pathology was and is symptomatic was. So you can see the pulsations. Yes. Pulsations are night. So I'll just come out and just show you the, the just anatomy group. here, this epidural fat, the epidural fat. You are not seeing the facet yet. Now you started seeing the facet at 12 o'clock. You can see the yeah. facet Yes. Yes. 12 o'clock. Just show uh, the exiting route also. Yeah, 3 o'clock would be the exiting route. So when I'm coming out at this point of time, I'll just rotate, rotate towards the 3 o'clock. Can you see the fat there? Yes. That is a 3 o'clock exiting route. You can see? Yes. So this fat is nice. Uh, cushion of fat is there. You don't see any facet impinging there. So I think we need not drill here. Yes. So unnecessarily young patient, you can see, that's a tip of the facet. Yes. So that's the tip of the facet. I think we can leave it here. Below also there is no osteophyte, there is no hump. Yeah. Normally what happens, you see a hump between the exiting and traversing route in chronic cases yes. here. Yes. So here you can see the uh, annulus is flat here, the annular yes. surface is flat. So don't use RF here near the exiting route, otherwise you will injure the, the ganglion. So I'm just rotating it and now I'll just come out. So I'll just come out and you see how the things fall down. When you are coming out, you can just see how things fall down. See the, see the uh, muscles are just opposing each other. They just fall down and just coming out. Thank you. Okay, thank you Sukumar for that uh, uh, wonderful surgery with the detailed explanation. A big round of applause for Sukumar. So we will proceed with the talks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, lunch we start at 2 o'clock. Uh, I'm keeping you hungry for some more time. Uh, we'll just quickly finish off with two more talks and then we break for lunch. I invite Dr. Mahindra Singh. Dr. Mahindra Singh Chauhan uh, is a neurosurgeon and he is currently practicing in Nairobi, Kenya. He has come all the way from Kenya for this conference. Uh, he is, does exemplary work in um, epilepsy surgery, DBS, and uh, I'm, I'm not uh, aware of what all else he does because I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so we can. <laughs> I can then operate. <laughs> Am I audible? Okay. So I was given one of the difficult topics transparamical endoscopy in difficult setting. When I am not so a beginner, I would say so. Um, <coughs> so we'll observe some difficult cases which I uh, went through and uh, learn in the process. I thank uh, Dr. Gore and Mission Spine to invite me uh, to give this talk. And I was excited and I'm, um, I'm so much in love with this city. Love at first sight with my sir. Dr. Mahindra. I'm practicing in Nairobi Neurocare, uh, Nairobi Neurocare, which is my own company, and it's working with uh, uh, in uh, Kenya and neighboring countries. Uh, I went there four years back, and as soon as I went there, I got caught in COVID and uh, totally locked down. So that's when we, we started the endoscopic neurosurgery. I would like you to take a closer look at this painting, which I liked, and uh, I saw something which which uh, transparable surgeons in their beginning, they always see. And I also like the, the, the way Dr. Gore is seeing. Anywhere he sees a hole and he, he takes a picture of it because he compared that with the foramen. <coughs> so this painting uh, comes from the inspiration of Moby Dick, the classic story of uh, America. Uh, they have made a movie also, it's like a, to me it looked like more like a like a facet, sorry. 
And so superior facet, inferior facet, and this is one of my favorite approach when I'm doing the surgeries because as a, a spine surgeon who has been doing uh, neurosurgery uh, oriented spine surgeries, open surgeries were done for the last 20 years. And uh, for me, always do doing a complete decompression, ligament flavectomy and all of these things, then doing fixation was my main idea of surgery as we have learned from the seniors. But when I went, came into endoscopy, for me, doing a lateral recess decompression was one of the obsessions. And for me, uh, this became, uh, once I learned the transforaminal surgeries, this particular view uh, is what I, I like uh, doing. And uh, whatever I am learning, uh, mostly I was learning through my own, through surgical videos. So <coughs> I learned an endoscopic spine surgery in 2019 during the COVID lockdown and the credit of all of it goes to Dr. Gore and COVID. So initially when it started, I bought both of the endoscopes, which uh, <coughs> now I wouldn't suggest any new beginner to start with. If you have two scopes, then you are many times confused till the last cases, whether you want interlaminar or you want to go transferaminal. For me, interlaminar was a natural progression from an open surgery. Uh, but then there were times when I was thinking whether this way or that way. But now I'm mostly doing transforaminal surgeries. So this is what I used to have initially, but we learned the process. One of the favorite things that I learned uh, is uh, SAP syndromes. And these are the ones which are uh, many times missed, and particularly with the old patients. So SAP syndrome is the one when uh, there's a, this uh, superior articular process working. Superior articular process goes and com com compresses the nerve which is exiting. <coughs> so this is a very beautiful CT scan which I would like to show you. If you observe this patient actually came to me with uh, he was on wheelchair in a difficulty getting up from the wheelchair which means proximal muscle weakness and the MRI was showing there is a severe compression of the L4 and L5 nerve roots. But I did the CT scan and we found that if you compare these foramens, they are okay, but at L2 and L3, this SAP is going all the way up and compressing. There's no space left for exiting nerve. So, and here also you see the facet is rotating inside. Of course, the cross section is different, but just giving an idea, if you see here and here also, um, the nerve root which is going will be compressed by the ostrophytes. The clinical features usually mismatch from the obvious MRI and weakness and pain is more while walking and uh, better while sitting and bending, which is what patient would clearly say. So this was the MRI which uh, was shown to me and mostly they have gone to other doctors and they were saying that we need to do the discectomy and fixation here. When I said that you need to go and we, we need to remove the SAP. So we removed, the, uh, this is what we did. This is the patient who is walking with uh, lot of limp. I don't know, when we connect for a projection, then the videos don't run well. So on the left side, he had this dragging. And uh, I removed this. And uh, this is for the first time when I use an interlaminar endoscope to, to drill the SAP in a transforaminal route because I didn't have enough uh, instruments. First, I was trying transforaminal endoscope and the drill was not able to cut the, the SAP tip because the bones were such very strong in this case. So I had to use a chisel. So I changed the endoscope and I went there and I was able to, uh, to, to drill it out and the patient had a immediate improvement. I did this surgery under local anesthesia and uh, immediately post-operative in the operation theater, he is able to lift his thigh because his main weakness was at iliosos. And uh, after a week, this patient was able to lift off from the bed very well. So then I had another case, same, same SAP, so that's why I didn't repeat the scans. But this was an American patient who came to visit you, Kenya, and uh, he had this foot weakness. and. Uh, when I removed his uh, SAP with a chisel, because I found that fast chisel is much faster than drill. In drill, you keep doing it, but once you visualize, you land, 
on the superior articular process. And if you are seeing that, just use some bipolar and then you see the SAP tip and then you just chisel it out and it very quickly. And then patient says, then I'm feeling much better in my foot. So intraoperatively, I checked his foot and his foot was, w it, it improved. So, so never um, forget the importance of uh, superior articular process. And this is what you see and now uh, quite often I've been using um, the, the interlaminar endoscope for transfer amyl root, particularly if there is a SAP syndrome. And this is the view that you get. These are the bones, ostrified, so you can easily remove them at both sides and you can free the nerve. So I'll just give you a short uh, view on this, that this is my chisel. So cranial, caudal, this is the dorsal view and this is the ventral view. And uh, I've already drilled a little bit and then now I'm um, just to, uh, to, to let you know that the drilling is slower and uh, chiseling is faster and it's still, it's very much in control because these bones are not very, very strong. And uh, now I'm also using it for the canal destenosis. So another case which was very difficult for me, a world-renowned orthopedic surgeon whose wife had problem, acute disc, and she had severe radiculopathy and uh, had a scoliosis all through her life. She was also a doctor, and they said, you have to operate this patient. And uh, I operated this case uh, in front of the doctor. I said, only when you are with me, I'll operate. He didn't do the um, spine surgeries, but he was, I think, former president of CCOT as well. So this is the only case that I did, and then this was the time when I was learning endoscopy. I had to go into laminar in this case, because if you see here, there's a lot of space you can find, wi and then the, the dura is taking a shorter route from, from here to here, so it's lateralized. So I'll just show you this video where the decompression was needed. Sorry. Oh, I have done another video. So this is the video which I did and uh, because the dura was not in his natural space, I have to be very slow because the surgeon is seeing me operating and sometimes he can pinch the dura. And uh, it's, uh, the video is not playing. No, it is there. And let's see if in a smaller one, oh wait, uh, this is working here. Yeah, it, it, it was working. If I remove it, see, it should work. Anyway, so I just wanted you to appreciate that in a scoliotic case, you can have one side spinal canal totally empty and other side the nerve root and the dura will be crowded. Well, so for, for uh, such cases where you are suspecting superior uh, articular process syndrome, which is SAP syndrome, the take home message is take CT thin slices, correlate well with the MRI and clinical evaluation. If needed, dare to explain for multiple short sittings. This is what I was discussing with Dr. Gore. This is when he first hit me when he came to Ahmedabad. Usually what we have seen that we are doing spine surgeries and thinking, patient also thinks and we also expect from ourselves, you do one single surgery and you solve all the problems that the patient has for low back. And I realized that most of the patients with spine surgery, they have this expectation that you will do one surgery and I'll be fine for life. So that's why I would like to say that if you have such kind of things where say you've got two or three SAP syndromes, one on right, one on left, then you can tell them that we are gonna do these surgeries in sittings because usually they are under local anesthesia and takes short uh, time compared to open surgery. So that way you start telling your patients that the such spine surgery should be actually multiple sitting, particularly if you are having patients who are 70 years old, 78. 70, 80 years old. This patient was 84 years old. 
So there's another case who had a cyst issue. This patient also visited Bangalore. Patient had lateral compressions because of the cyst and the canal stenosis were there. Patient also had uh, um, difficulty walking, severe difficulty walking. When he came, he was on a wheelchair. So we again had to do internal manner because this case could not be done transforaminally. And uh, at two compressions, if you see, one was this cyst and the other side also had another cyst, had two cysts and we removed them. This is also father of a doctor and uh, I took the doctor in the operation theatre and operated in front of him. These videos are taken by him. So this is in the evening he started walking but had limited issue. I think he has got associated neurological disorder for which he came to India later on because he was not able to improve beyond a point. Now this is another case. Um, where I did transforaminal endoscopy for dorsal where there is a compression. This patient had a uterine uh, malignancy and then patient was sent home by the, by the hospital saying that you are now completely cured and uh, then she was detected to have multiple metastasis in spine. This was the one which was compressing and she was totally paralytic and uh, we, we found out a little later that she also had uh, metastasis even in the stomach so she was having hematemesis. So the only thing we did was we did decompression only of this comp this part which was ventral and uh, this patient within uh, one and a half days was discharged after the surgery and she started moving. But this case uh, definitely for endoscopy because it's a metastasis we were operating had very severe bleeding a small tissue we were touching and it was bleeding so we chose endoscopy because patient already had multiple meds we didn't want to stress her physiology it was done under local anesthesia took me almost four hours because of bleeding but eventually she improved very well so this was the thing i don't know how it got black and white during the recording but uh, this is what we did without any fixation How much time I'll be left with? We have. I'm just about to see the dura. So this all is bleeding is happening. If you can see this, the entire view becomes smoky. One of the things I have also learned, you also need to learn even in such, when, when the vision is very hazy, you may not all the time just wait for the vision to get clear and then learn to view through all that. So there is another dorsal decompression I did. This is again a metastasis. Again, very hazy because of lot of bleeding. This patient also came with complete paraplegia. So you can see the cord here, completely decompressed with minimal morbidity. 
Another compression, this was probably a tuberculosis because we didn't find any test was positive, but we gave a ATT. Uh, I did transfer amnil with the cage fixation, expandable cage fixation. And uh, patient came uh, barely walking. And I asked for, uh, I requested for his latest video, which he sent me this morning today. Completely okay. So this is dorsal transfer amnil. Another very interesting case which I saw, which um, I think uh, the vision was expanded by Goreser, that uh, patient had a severe pain, right-sided, uh, for two years, not able to walk properly, and uh, she had undergone first uh, over oophorectomy, that maybe the ovary is compressing the nerve, and then she didn't improve, they did a hysterectomy, uh, kind of saying that the, the, the pelvic region is causing a problem, the uterus and uh, the... So this MRI we were seeing and I put it on our group and uh, we found that this is a very enlarged uh, dorsal root ganglion and I could also see that there is some fissure over here is the annulus. So what we said is that we're going to do because the fact that when there is a chronic fissure then there, there is a neurotization of that fissure. So I decided that I'll do a block of this block uh, DRG as well as I'll do a annuloplasty at this level, thermal annuloplasty. And that's what we did. So you can see endoscopically my bipolar is here. And uh, here I have given a block. And the patient immediately started walking after the surgery. So after two years she had it. Another surgery which was a, I'll, I'll show the another uh, aspect of this surgery. This, this instrumentation was done after endoscopy in last three years I have uh, Practically only in two cases I have put screws which were either they had a trauma or they were revision. So this patient came to me with a totally misplaced screw and causing a iatrogenic uh, canal stenosis because the screw was entirely intracanalicular. But uh, and then she had an adjacent level complete disc failure. And uh, we had done a, a cage fixation here. But after that patient had a severe pain. Uh, after about four weeks and she had been weeping me uh, she had been weeping for two days and uh, so I called her and then we did this so this is uh, I'd be taken a radiculogram this is my needle and then we blocked it here and then immediately postoperatively she started dancing So this is also one of a very peculiar case I have seen. I have seen one more case where the cage was put by someone else, but then it has uh, caused some exclusion of the uh, disc material, and patient has got a severe pain in the leg, which we call as chemical radiculitis. Another patient in which the instrumentation was done after that, she had almost 10 epidural episodes where she had pain, and then we found that on the right side, there is a compression because of the facet, so I chose to go into laminar inside, and then we drilled it out. Uh, I do most interlaminar under local anesthesia and uh, some epidural installation, and uh, I can't. Just wanted her to say that she, after almost like three four years, she had a pain relief because of this. So one of the advantage of endoscopy is that you can actually give relief to patients who are already instrumented. So this is the case which I was showing that it was uh, done 10 years back and all these years she was not able to walk properly, severe pain, severe claudication and uh, she had gone to almost 10 doctors from Sudan, she is a Sudanese patient. So from Sudan to Kenya, she had gone everywhere and everyone was doing only pain management. So then uh, I was thinking why no one is trying to pull this screw out, including the, the surgeon who put it, because he had a chance, one screw was broken, he had a chance to pull it back and he was not pulling it back. So I thought everyone is thinking maybe this is intradural and if we remove it, then we can further cause damage of the nerve. But I was thinking because it's a, if you put a screw, you're winding it. And if you're winding it, it was intradural, then the nerve root should have already wound around it and she should have paralysis already. So we chose to uh, remove this and uh, they did a long interview with me that why do you want to do this when everyone else is refusing. I said she's a 56-year-old lady who has got still 20 years to go. This is 
Patris King. We also did a myelogram, and uh, this is the surgery that we did, which uh, shows the screw, the extra dura. Exactly from sacral row, which I blocked, and also she sacral So they learned during the process that.
Uh, thanks to Dr. Mahindra. I request Dr. Chandrasekhar so to hand over a moment here to Dr. Mahindra Singh. Dr. Chandrasekhar is a senior neurosurgeon. He was practicing a uh, uh, little bit away in Mysore, but recently moved to Bangalore. I think guys have broken for lunch. <laughs> We break for lunch now. I think uh, then we assemble back maybe as the shortest time possible, 15 20 minutes. Is it possible or you won't take uh, more time? Because one more live surgery is uh, on the way and uh, Dr. Gore is waiting to give his lecture. So, okay, we take 30 minutes to come back. Okay, yeah, thank you. Check, Madan Garu. Check, one. Nagaraj. Check, one. Check. Ah, Shiva. Ah, Madan Garu. Check, ma. Ah, okay, kada kada. Na ko okay. Madhya madhya na endu ko ne switcher ne jani ko. Na dekhe re kado. Me ko ne ne je ko na me ko malla adi me ro. Ah. Match ko ne me ke tapo poin na. E P change eshe chudonge. Okay. E P two X L R o various berda me ko. Okay. Na ko E P two X L R e da problem usu ne man doctors. Aho na. Eta? Ah, okay na ite. Ah, next. केस उन्हें मिल गई नेक्स्ट लंच ब्रेक तरह आते पुरु लंच ब्रेक आएंगे पुरु केस रेडी होने मार्क ओके राइट सर राइट
Patrick. कैमरा बिट को नो अल्लाह हेलो सिस्टर सिस्टर हेलो सिस्टर सिस्टर इधर तकों बिट इधर ट्राली आकड़े तकों मिट ये ये डेट को डाय दो डेट तो चला ये ये नो नो टेक द ट्राली आउट अंदर आ ट्रे आचे तक उन लोगी फर्स्ट फर्स्ट इकड़ा ये इकड़ने चाहिए फर्स्ट दिन की फोकस दिन Hello, anybody there? Phone mark, buddy. Hello. Hello, anybody there? Sir, can you hear us? Yes, yes. The hall is empty right now. If you will have to wait for 10 minutes, I guess. Okay, people are hungry. People are eating. Okay. Almost finished. Yeah, you just tell them we are ready here. Yeah, I'll uh, ask them to come up. Uh, patient is uh, lying prone, already painted, draped, marked. So just uh, if they can... Uh, Maybe another five minutes we have people walking in. Uh, yeah. I'll call uh, Dr. Ravinder and ask him to... Maybe you can up. announce that case is ready. Oh, they okay, can sir. come in. Sure, yeah. sir. Okay. Thank you, Raghav. Yeah. Now because he's in the local... Uh, he's awake. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you? Let's go here. 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 He is telling me after this I will come here. Sister, you don't have any sterile here. You don't have any sheet here. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you connect all the cables. Connect.
ಇಷ್ಟು ಶೀಟ್ ಕೊಟ್ರ ವಿಲ್ ಕನೆಕ್ಟ್ ದ ಸ್ಕೋಪ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಎವ್ರಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಫ್ರಾಗ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಗಾನ್ ಅಪ್ ಅಪ್ ಟು ದ ಪೆಡಿಕಲ್ ಸೊ ಹಿಯರ್ ವಿ ನೀಡ್ ಎ ಟ್ರಜೆಕ್ಟ್ರಿ ಸಿಸ್ಟರ್ ಇದು ಕಟ್ತೀರಾ ಉಲ್ಟನ್ನ Anil, you, you wrap that, uh, uh, this one also tightly. She is putting the pay tape, no? Hello, Adi. No, no, no. You will never go mad about it, adjust mad about it. Yeah, yeah. So, mad, mad. is a middle aged person with a severe uh, left side radiculopathy uh, not able to stand straight his posture is uh, there is a lot of sciatic list and uh, he is stooping forward and also there is left uh, ehl and ankle weakness <coughs> so on mri here you can see can you see the axial cuts here yes yes see? so here what has happened is at the level of the disc when you see these two cuts at the level of the disc there is a annular tear on the left side causing severe compression of the root on the left side from here what has happened we go to the previous cuts at the upper end plate cuts so when you go to the upper end plate cuts there is a fragment further up in the foramen medial foramen and the uh, uh, traversing root area there is a, a fragment going up up to the pedicle so almost uh, the l4 pedicle the fragment has gone up so this is here we are dealing with a uh, tear the uh, annular tear with a, a fragment which has come out and uh, up migrated you can see here can you show the so here this l4 5 in the sagittal view there is a annular bulge disc bulge in the next cut you see it has started migrating upwards when you come to the cut again you see here it has gone up compressing the foramen so the fragment has gone till the upper uh, pedicle that is l4 pedicle so here first you land in the disc remove the base then again tackle the 
uh, upmigrated fragment. That is one way. Second way is land in the foramen, remove the fragment in the foramen and upmigrated fragment, then you go to the disc proper. Either way it is okay. So once we place the needle, then we'll understand whether we are going easily or not. So the plan is, again, same thing, uh, land in the disc, uh, as we, the same principles as we did in the previous case. Then we come out, drill the base of the facet, and remove the apex ligament so that we can go superiorly easily. So here, patient is prone with a loca local anesthesia and some sedation. Uh, here we are on the standing on the left side of the patient here. So we have marked the uh, marker. Could so Kumar, is there any special technique that uh, the, you have obliterated the lordosis and uh, the lines are parallel? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, here, uh, not uh, just uh, using a lo local uh, technique. We have used a pillows here. We don't have a, uh, the horseshoe bolster here. We just have a pillow. The normal pillow we have used here. And luckily, we got that uh, the, uh, the flat back. And here I've marked the lines for the sake of uh, saving some time. Mark. So now again we'll uh, do the marking. So the AP line. Hello. The AP line shoot. It actually Short. 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 Can you see the AP image now? Yes, yes. So here again the spinous process and the distance between two pedicles, it's uh, 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 matching. So I put a first uh, AP midline, then AP transverse line, I'm marking shoot, shoot, shoot. So this is a AP, I have not taken any Ferguson view here, normal AP, true AP, I'm taking a line here. Marking a line, then lateral. Okay, no? So we are taking a lateral line here. So just because there is some lordosis here, obviously the both lines will not meet. So there will be some shoot. 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 Short. Short. So now I'm in the middle of the disc, parallel to the end plates here. I've taken a line. So when I mark the line here, can you see the both lines are not matching? Yes, correct. So That's because uh, I mean, there is squaring some is squaring is not done. So. Yeah. So there is lordosis, and so <laughs> what does this AP line denotes? It's the it's the level of the disc. What does the lateral line denotes? It's the lordosis or the inclination of the disc space. So we take the marking from the lateral uh, line that should be the entry point. So again, as we discussed in the morning, uh, the entry point, so I'm measuring the scale and taking the scale here. Here, because we are want to be more epidural uh, to tackle the space, to tackle the uh, fragment, so here, I'm taking 13 centimeters here, local. But I think this fragment will come from inside the disk space itself. Yes, yes. Because so it is uh, connected. Connected, connected yeah. yes. So I'm giving some local here. So I give some local. Uh, 
I'll uh, take a stab, go off this code. I just take a small stab here. No needle code. You have to take a little bit of water. One minute. White bell in side chair. You do it, no? Yes. Needle. Gauze piece. So I'm again going with the angle. My aim is to reach this point. So I'm going inside, shoot. So again, you see here, I'm going here and touch, going towards the disc space. As Mahesh has said, try to feel some bone. So I'm just stopping there at the mid pedicular line here. A lateral, lateral, lateral. Here, uh, my idea is to work in the foramen, also tackle the disc and the lateral recess. So I should play around the medial foramen and the lateral recess. So you can see here, I'm just <coughs> inferior. I'll just come out and make it uh, in the middle of the disc space. So I come out a little bit, shoot. So I come out here, come out here. I'll come out further, shoot. Then I use the bevel. I point the bevel inferiorly, then try to push it further, shoot. So I've just, <coughs> shoot. So I'm in the middle of the, trying to uh, touch the middle of the midpoint of the disc, shoot. This I'm okay. So here I'm on the mid, uh, just on the annulus here. Now I'll take a AP, shoot. AP. So I'll take a AP here to see where we are exactly, where we are entering the disc. Hello. Yes, yes. Good. You see here, I have a mid particular line. So I'll be somewhere. See that the needle is in the posterior 25 percent of the disc. The AP yes. it has reached yes. the midline. So this is a perfect entry for. So again, I measure the stillet, the length. So this is how beginner should make it a habit. So I measure the stillet length. The guide wire is measured. So then I place this guide wire here. So I need not worry whether guide wire has reached or not because I know the. It has reached. So I'll just, with the twisting moments, I just remove the needle shoot with the guide wire there. So I'll just hold the guide wire and remove the needle. Now I use a knife to extend my incision. So here. you can see the shoot you see the guide wire is advancing further so this should you take care just pull out the guide wire a bit always try to 
maintain that guide wire is in the midline, should? So guide wire is there in the midline, so I'm just pushing the dilator in. Tell the anesthetist um, this procedure, this part might be painful, so they will uh, give some their magic drugs like Fenta, Propofol, they'll keep ready, should? Here, a little bit patient is moving because there is a foraminal fragment here. Uh, so, uh, what I'll do is I'll just give one cc of local plane here. Go hospice. So, you have a uh, one more opening for giving local here. There are two holes here in the dilator as morning uh, the speaker, one speaker told, is you have to give the smaller one. So, YCC syringe are the left. Is it the left? So I'll just give a one CC local. Our anesthetist has given some drugs. So I just give one CC of drug there. Just wait for one minute or two minutes so this local acts there so that patient journey is not very painful. Uh, Gospies. Gospies. So, if anesthetist says yes, I just try to push the dilator further in and see whether patient is having any pain. So then I stop here, should? I stop here and take a lateral, lateral. I take a lateral shoot here. Sulpa, Munde Madi, the Hodia K. Shoot. Any questions? So you can see there, uh, Mahesha, can you see the X ray image? Yes. So we are just at the annulus. We are just entering the annulus. And we are in the lower foramen. As Mahesha was mentioning, always try to be in the lower foramen. As a beginner, try to be parallel to the end plates. Don't oblique your uh, dilator, so you might injure the exiting route. So always follow the principles. I'm just gently tapping, shoot. Patient might feel some pain because of the lot of big fragment there lying there. Shoot. So I just entered the annulus, shoot. Then I'll take a AP here. AP. Are you ready, Mark? Sheet ready. Hmm. Look, okay. okay. Can you see here, we have reached a midline here. Yes. That's what we wanted. So we just, uh, I'll use the sheath now. I'll use uh, the sheath. So now I'll take uh, this, uh, it's a beveled sheath. Again, the same principle as morning. Facing uh, cranially, that is the, because we are on the left side here. So left traversing route and the <coughs> exiting route, I'm going with the bevel facing towards the axilla. So can see the plastic is trying to go inside, I'm preventing it. So just I, once I go there, take a shoot. So I'm there, so dilator has not come back. So you should always remember dilator should not come back. Then I hit here, gentle tap. Patient is little bit moving because of some pain, shoot, annulus inflammation has gone inside. So this is the pa painful part. When this shoot, I just gone in now. So again, <coughs> we'll now go inside with the scope. So just yes, take one lateral. Ah, one lateral. Is only for uh, teaching purpose. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So the understanding same as before. The bevel should be just the edge of the bevel, posterior edge of the bevel. If it is in the epidural space, then you are in uh, right position. You can see here. So just I'm below the annulus here. Once uh, two millimeter I come out, I'm, I'm, I'll be seeing the epidural space. So I'll just now use the scope and go inside. I use a shoulder drape because it is useful. Uh, the floor doesn't get wet. <coughs> so I need a shoulder arthroscopy drape. I'll use the scope now. 
స్కోప్ అమ్మ వైట్ బ్యాలెన్స్ టన్ లైట్ ఆన్ కొంచెం స్వల్ప ఉద్ద మాడి స్వల్ప లూజ్ సుకుమార్ కెన్ యూ టెల్ అబౌట్ ఇరిగేషన్ ఆర్ యూ యూజింగ్ పంప్ ఆర్ బ్యాగ్స్ ఆర్ బాటిల్స్ వాట్ ఎవర్ యా హియర్ వి ఆర్ యూజింగ్ అ పంప్ హియర్ ద ఆర్థోస్కోపీ పంప్ సో ద లిబర్టీ ఆర్ లగ్జరీ ఆఫ్ యూజింగ్ ద పంప్ బట్ ఇఫ్ పంప్ ఇస్ నాట్ దేర్ నో ప్రాబ్లం వి కెన్ యూజ్ అ గ్రావిటీ విచ్ ఆల్సో వర్క్స్ వెల్ idea is uh, use a turp set that a bigger uh, iv set where turp people uses and use 3 liter saline so <coughs> that will uh, uh, help you not uh, uh, creating some pressure otherwise uh, the 2 liter bottles the pressure is not adequate yeah. when so you yeah when you use bottles they don't collapse so so you have to use pumps with Mayesha, bottles can you see here inside Uh, always use collapsible bags so now we are gravity. on the illi on illi on the go ida ki uh now we are standing on the left side so the concept here you should understand is we are standing on the left side so my left side of the screen uh, what circle you are seeing is cranial can right? you show the uh, okay we can see now yeah. yeah so the left side of the circle is cranial right side of the circle is caudal because we are standing on the left side and uh, 12 o'clock is posterior so, so here on, uh, do you have to uh, fine tune the camera a bit one uh, minute i'm doing it is it okay now uh, no we are not seeing endoscopy picture now endoscopy picture make endoscopic picture bigger is it okay now we uh, okay yeah okay yeah yes so again as i said you can see the uh, disc space is empty here yes yes the all it has gone out posterior yeah. disc space is empty i'm just putting my without uh, opening it i'm just putting it and pushing it it is very very much empty there because a big fragment has come out yes but still i try to hold any uh, uh, base any fragments are there first i always uh, try to take care of it because otherwise we might miss so many things so just i am debulking the the sub annular part intra discal part first there is nothing here you can see that he is not going for the fragment yeah the Arif. tip of the instrument is facing anterior Arif. because go Arif. for the fragment now the tail of the fragment will be cut and come out so you will not be able to take out the whole fragment so you should not be jumping to pull out the fragment you should release it and then only you should take it out without releasing if you try to pull it out you will end up with missed fragment so now you can see this uh, all degenerated disc yellowish dirty yellow fragment is there and some uh, uh, the annulus is yellow and very firm here i can feel with my uh, rf here it's yellow and firm so it is degenerated i just come out as i said before to see the epidural vessels or the annular fiber so i just coming out take a shoot shoot you can see i'm just below the below the root here i'm just coming out just coming out what does this help me to understand is i am standing in the foramen shoot i am standing in the foramen here and 12 o'clock whether facet is there or not so 12 o'clock if i have not i am not seeing the facet then sometimes there is no need to drill the facet if i am seeing the facet there then we need to drill the facet so because we need to do some foramen work here so you can see there is some bleeding here from the facet this is from the facet as a black is it black it see i am using my thumb to pressurize and it stops so it means that it's coming from the bone ella ra black id ra so what i'll do is i'll come out further use a drill diamond drill to start uh, drilling there because we need to go here deeper and cranial so i'll just use the i come out further come out further you can see this entire facet you are seeing now the 
the that's a facet and when 12 o'clock you see the facet yeah can you notice the facet yes yes so i'll just uh, make you again anatomy the center of the image is the fibers annular fibers torn a bit then as you come posteriorly you see the horizontal some vessels there then the facet there and there is a some epidural fat seen so all we need to drill a bit so that i can become more i can become more 12 o'clock is the facet yeah 12 9 to 9 to 3 is the annular fibers you see and 6 o'clock is the disc space pressure fluid maybe you can drill it will stop once you drill it the bleeding will stop with it. so i will use the drill here here uh, today unfortunately we don't have the articulating bar but it is okay we can uh, drill it see now i have just little bit come out and uh, as mahesh said in the morning when you are working in the foramen then your entire cannula will be floating new matter so this is a uh, the facet you are seeing this is a facet and uh, when you at uh, 9 o'clock will be the tip of the facet 3 o'clock will be the base of the facet so that is what we need to drill drill so we are using a drill here we are using a revo system the drill it's okay. drill na martin rf it suction so here i am using a diamond achirke diamond veda so i am using a diamond bar because that will stop bleeding also so all we need to get a some uh, access the apex of the uh, superior articular facet need to be drilled removed so that the vision becomes better so that is what we need to do here suction connect so i'm using a diamond bar can you see here yes i'm using a diamond bar what you are doing giving it man I'm just drilling the facet. Always try to drill the base first so that you are more safer. Don't go to the apex because it might slip and you might injure the root. So always, you can see now I've drilled the facet there, a part of the facet. I just make it little bit caudal rotation of the cannula. So that I can drill. Should always control the scope with one hand because the scope is the cannula is not fixed. Yeah. It is always mobile. Now I will just show you. I am going towards the base, towards the inferior pedicle. Shoot. Shoot. Can you see the drill there? Yes. So what I am trying to create is a, a space where my cannula can go inside. So there is no. <coughs> RF. So here sometimes you will have some bleeding like this. So you should under try to control it on. So that's why uh, sometimes the outside in approach for a beginner becomes too tedious. Too tedious and they will struggle here because the bleeding doesn't stop and uh, you are lost. So always try to so I'll just now rotate the scope. So you can see the apex of the scope. Hook color, ready color. Drill. You can see the angle of the cannula and the scope. He has dipped the hand down so that it becomes flatter and expose the facet. And just drilling the tip of the going towards the tip of the facet now i'm going towards the tip of the facet i'm going towards the tip of the facet there is some bleeding coming from below 
that will stop you for a, after a while once we have rotated through the scope. So I'm just trying to drill the, make it uh, exhaling the tip of Can you see here, this, uh, it is becoming white. Yes. It means that uh, it, it is getting thinned out. So I'll just try to control that uh, the bleeding coming from here so that visibility becomes better. Uh -huh. drill. So first give me some few seconds, I'll control the bleeding inferiorly. It is coming from the bone, so <coughs> it will not stop. It's a cancel, it's a facet bone. I'll just use a diamond bar. In other, press it. Don't rotate it. Don't rotate it. Are. Wait, wait, on. that hole, there is a hole. Drill. Press it far, tightly. Torture Manopolar hook or bipolar? You can use uh, over the bone, it's not a problem. But generally diamond burn and RF is good. Use of bone wax is difficult because there is not much of uh, uh, freedom to apply it. Because it will go inside and stick to the scope. It won't stick to the bone. So now I am uh, just waiting for the RF here. There is some problem with the RF punch. So, punch. So here always you should remember where you are. Well, the moment you are in uh, foramen, it starts floating. So here, again, this is a disc space. So this is a disc space. You are seeing some epidural fat here. You are seeing some epidural fat at 9 o'clock. So that 9 o'clock fat, is nothing but the exiting root fat. So, so root will be very, very close there. So you should not uh, stretch it or injure it. Yeah. So here you should be very careful. You are uh, just uh, retracting the root with your sheath. So you should be very careful. Sometimes in the beginning you may be lost. So then what you do is put the cannula into the disc face, go inside and then come out. So I'm uh, just now, what we need to understand is create the space. This is a disk space. This is a traversing root area. This is exiting root area. We need to go here. That is what uh, the idea is. So slowly you make the uh, Sure, sure. So that bleeding is troubling us. So on. So I'll just tackle that, otherwise it will not allow us to see the structures better. 
we need to it is coming from the bone it is coming from the bone uh, because of the saline pressure directly it will stop but the moment we release that uh, pressure it will go away drill it is uh, it will stop eventually it will stop It's a handle problem. No, no, it's a problem with the handle. Problem is one more handle is there. So there is a problem with the deal here. So now what I am trying to see is the the apex of the SAP. You can see here. Yes. This is apex of SAP. I yes. will not cut it now. I don't want to cut it now. If I cut it now, then uh, uh, the fat and the tissue start falling into the field. So we need not cut it now. We just thin out the SAP tip, then remove the. Uh, no, it is not the burr. It is the handpiece problem. Remove the burr. Or get one more diamond bill. So all we need to remove this part. Once we remove this and remove the apical ligament, the whole thing comes into your view. Get the one more hand, the diamond bar. So here you should be careful not to uh, plunge, so do gently. You can use the chisel here once uh, things are better, use the chisel. So why I am doing all these things is to create the space. So create the space, once you create the space, create the space, you are completion of surgery is seen better. If you don't create a space, you might assume that you have done a good job, but you might have not done a good job. So that's why removing that cutter, curved cutter. So you can see I have reached, the, I have thinned out the tip. I can chop off the tip. So I'm trying to define the tip of SAP here so that I can remove that. So I'm just trying to come around the tip of SAP RF. So here we, you need lot of patience. So if you lose patience and try to rush, you might injure the, you might uh, injure the nerves or you might break your instrument. So that's why go slow, try to create a good space there and drill them. So now I can see some more cancellous bone, then I will use the drill to thin it out further. 
So I'm going there and just drilling, thinning out here. So I thinned out. One the chatter diamond. Now I'll use a chisel here. Chisel, ma. Drill, kodi, drill, kodi. So I'll just increase the window here. I'll just use the window to drill this part also. In in our chisel, it's called da. So I use a goose here. I use a goose to remove the, the apex. I'm using the goose here. So my assistant is, uh, I have a very beautiful, uh, wonderful assistant today. Dr. Anil is helping me. So I'm just, I removed the tip, just uh, a, a part of uh, Tip of SAP. Oh, hanging part of the SAP, non-articular part towards the tip. Punch. Punch. So this tissue, I keep on removing it. Cutter, RF, and cutter. Cutter, Cody. Straight cutter. So I just coagulate these vessels around the facet. Be on the bone always, so that you are safe. See, that's a bone. So this soft tissue can be removed later. So be on the bone, you are always safe. So now I just go cranially. I just have to. So all I have to remove that uh, edge of the facet further. Chisel. Here we have an issue with the diamond burr, so I'm using chisel here. Otherwise, I would have used a diamond drill further. So I'm using chisel. So I want that apex to be removed, uh, the base of apex to be removed so that I can. So just remove the base of the tip of SAP. So I just made a bigger window there. So what I achieved by this is I punch achieved a bigger window so that I can see better. I can go into the axilla better. So, middle part of the axilla better. So, I've just created some space now. I'll start removing this uh, yellow ligament. Then, cutter. RF kodi, amal cutter. When you work in the foramen, it is vascular, so it will irritate you. So you have to be careful. And you need to have a lot of patience. Cutter. So now what I am seeing is there is a interface here. You can see there is a yellow ligament and there is a fibrous tissue and vessels just anterior to it. So I am just going and cutting this ligament. So create the space, and this is the apical ligament around the tip of SAP. So I'm cutting that ligament now, so that we get a good window.
I'm removing that some part of bone here, which we chiseled. So what I'm trying to do is work in the foramen, medial foramen, to remove that yellow ligament. So it, this is a ligament which morning the anatomy presentation, we saw that there, is a, there are foraminal ligaments. So one ligament which come here becomes calcified, normally get calcified, or if get calcified and causes stenosis, punch. Punch, punch. So now I just clear the tissue in front of me, which is fluttering and causing a and disturbance. So I just cleared it. Now, RF. Again, reorient yourself. Where is the disc space? Where is the exiting route? And where is the traversing route? So this is a entry we have done into the disc. This is a disc space. This is a disc space going medially. So here towards the apex. So I just coagulating it now. All we need to remove this and a part of this bone. One huh? Yeah. Diamond bar, one the chair? Yeah, one the Round bar, one the I'm using a burr, diamond burr, to remove that small curtain of bone. If we had an articulated burr here, would have worked faster because there is a, it is a cutting burr with a articulation. So we can use that articulating burr here well. So we need not use too much force. So here what I'm trying to do is that thinning out that curtain of bone, which is draping the traversing route. So this bone just medially will be the ligament. Medial to that would be the root. So I am trying to thin out the lateral wall, lateral wall of the a part of recess. So this is a recess which just going in there. All we need to remove this bone. Drill. Sorry, chisel. I'll try to use a chisel and try to see whether I can remove that if possible so that our work gets faster. Yeah. So I just removed a part of that curtain now. I'll just remove it further. Punch kodi ma. Drill kodi. Sometimes we can use a upcut also here if possible, we can use a upcut here, dissector, tube sheet punch. Upcut. I'll try to use upcut if possible so that it just becomes, work becomes faster. I'm using a upcut here, trying to, I used upcut here now, so, so that that curtain can be removed faster. So you can see here, now I removed the curtain nicely now. Now we can uh, remove the yellow ligament and proceed for the fragment. So here what we have done again, I'll just update RF. RF. So Kumar, one question. Yeah. Back home you will do interlaminar or transferminal for this case? <laughs> uh, that's <laughs> a good question. 
Yeah, because uh, interlaminar would have been much faster. Yeah. Uh, less trouble. Yeah, less, uh, less uh, what you say, tedious to the surgeon. Correct. And it becomes very fast. So, and radiation, because whenever there is a complicated case, which may take few hours, up and cutter, uh, your radiation also goes up. So, uh, what correct. I am trying to do is, now you can see the epical ligament. So, everything is a, a part of epical ligament uh, and the medial uh, ligament uh, draping the facet. So, because you have drilled the facet now, we are seeing this ligament. So, this ligament is the one sometimes causes uh, stenosis. So, I am just removing this ligament now, so that once we remove this, our vision become better, we can see the exiting route better. We can see the... Uh, yes, uh, we can see the root there. Root there, yeah. punch. So, every time I see there, I use the sheath, you can see my sheath going in and I retract that. See the root? See. Punch. I'll show you in a minute so that I'll... First, I remove this floating things. So now here, this is a disc space. I am going towards cranial side. This is a cranial side. So all you need to remove this ligament, things becomes much clear, RF. So now that is the ligament which is in the lateral recess. That's a, you can see the horizontal fibers nicely. Can you see the horizontal fibers? Yes. So these are the fibers which are there. So can you show the root also, exiting root, so that yeah. they can orient. See, this you is the exiting the root. root. This is a, uh, the mud body. So this is exiting root. Yeah. So just exiting root, uh, we know in MRI on. We know in MRI, the uh, disc is also pushing the exiting root also. So all we need to work here, drill. Just a part of this bone I'll remove so that I can be more, my foramen, everything becomes much wider. Diamond drill is always safer here because even if you just, it slips away from your hand, it will not injure the root. So the cutting bar sometimes lacerates the root. So always be careful. Though it takes some time, use a diamond here so that it is always safe. As a beginner, it is the diamond drill has more control. It will not slip. So always use a diamond bar where you are working close to the nose. So what I have done is uh, increase the curtain, uh, increase the space here. Again, now I go in, I go in here. I can see, I can see the ligament there. I just have to remove that ligament. Up cut Kurtira. I'll just use up cut to remove that part of bone. Then I can easily. Then here in uh, MRI, you should uh, understand where is the root, whether root has been pushed medially or fragment is in the axilla. So if it is in the axilla, root will be pushed laterally. So you will encounter first root rather than the fragment. So always you should be very careful understanding the MRI, if you don't understand it properly, you might think root is pushed medially and you might injure the root punch. So then now I have made that ligament is seen better now. So this is a disc space, so I am going up, I remove this ligament, then we see the fragment here. Katarama. RF first. RF. So 
So after this point, you can do one more maneuver, again go inside the disc and again come out. So that is one more maneuver you can do where you can see that the whole thing is a ligament medially, nicely that's a low ligament that is towards the apex. That's the apex. That's the apex. So all we need to remove that ligament now. Tambi. 45 degrees cutter so I use a cutter here uh, long cutter yeah. so I am using a cutter here which is uh, almost 90 degree like kind of a thing which, is, which will cut this ligament better see you can see I am cutting the ligament with the precision it is a very small profile. So I'm just cut, you can see something is seen medially. So whether it is a root or whether it is a fragment, we don't know. So be very careful. Can you see the uh, structure, something there? Yes. Sir. So you should be very careful because that might be a, a root also. Sikumar, uh, the instruments what yeah. you're using all are from Rio. No, no, no. <laughs> the what cutter I used is uh, from uh, Shiraj, okay. MP, MP Surgicals. Uh, I use Hebar uh, one some instruments. So I'm using a mix match here because we need to have a result rather than which instrument you are cutter again. So I'm just using this uh, again that cutter. This, uh, how does this help is near the facet, I find this shape useful because it is just 90 degree up, so it, it cuts the nicely. So just everything should be visible, eh? it should be done visibly. Curate Kortira. So just I have to remove that yellow ligament, then what I'll do is I'll again go inside. So I'll go inside, reorient everyone, then I'll come out again. This okay. is a ligamentum flame which uh, he's removing. Yeah, so I just... Cutter, cutter, normal cutter. Again, when you are cutting, be very, very careful. All right. So once you have done this, now you have created a space there. So you have removed a part of facet and confirm that you are at L4, L5 space. Yes, you are at L4, L5 space. Then search for the fragment. So now, this is the analysis rent I've made. So somewhere the fragment should have migrated from here till here. So what I'll do is now I'll cut here to search for the fragment cutter, curved cutter. So now again uh, you see you orient yourself where are we. So I'll check a X-ray shoot. I'll take an x-ray here. Can you see here, I'm just medial to the root here. So okay. I'm just cutting uh, you here. You want to see the x-ray picture? X-ray picture, please. Can you see? No, not yet. X-ray image. Yeah, yes. So now I'm going towards the fragment now. Are you what I did here is little bit annular cut I did here so that I can reach that fragment better. So I can feel something there, but once I go deeper, because of that blood, our field is not clear because of that bleed, uh, because of that uh, blood coming from that bone. 
so stop stop do you at times consider removing the migrated fragment first and then going into the disk later yeah yeah definitely if uh, the fragment lay up cut fragment lying down lying outside is bigger then i go for the fragment first uh, the migrated one first if uh, the intradiscal part is bigger then go to the intradiscal part so here because it was there was a connection to the intradiscal part so i thought i'll go first intradiscally but here so all i am trying to see the fragment where from the disk it has come out yeah. so i see something uh, there so i'm just come going out and removing that ligament so that i can see better punch punch fast Many may not know that uh, Sukumar is an artist. He does wonderful paintings, and uh, so are his surgeries. Yeah, surgeries also so artistic. But, but we appreciate him always for the, the beauty of his surgeries. Very clean, very precise. Here on the fragment. So it might be just I am trying to uh, make the things clear. So. hook so now you can see the disc and some uh, still the yellow ligament fibers are still there i'll just uh, hook it out in the other hook you see no they didn't they are did it's mine uh give some curate then you can take the nimu uh, curate punch ma punch no that's secure it anil that's secure it not a hook uh up tend punch up tend punch so i am just using a forward punch here because i can feel something so what i'll do now is better is i go intradiscal so that i can see the uh, tear then i can grab the fragment so here i'll uh, because of the bleed i uh, my precision is not coming so i'll just enter the disc again how do you enter the disc don't push it like this take the dilator dilator take the dilator use the dilator use the dilator then again push it shoot hammer the tap under the i'm using the dilator i just went in shoot abhi karna shoot so i'm using the dilator now to shoot so i've gone in now then again i'll come out yeah so i'll just go in so now i can orient myself where is the fragment so where is the fragment i can now orient myself better panchama panch 
So patient is having some pain, it means that uh, we are pushing the, fra the fragment, that's why he's having some pain. So here is a tear here, there is a tear. So to be careful. So this is a fragment. You can use a bigger grasper because yeah. that grasper is not holding. No, I just... Hook, Kodi. Hook. I'm just hooking out the the fragment here. Punch. Upturn punch. It's all intradiscal part. Still, I'm in the intradiscal part. RF. RF. I think there is a little bit of fogging uh, yeah. happening. RF. Yeah, yeah, we'll do it. So. Fogging. Hmm. Take, give the one more, this one, sister. When you see haziness outside the circle, then Ma. it is foggy. Sister, clean my deck and gauze. Haziness outside. Pradhanar, jaldi kodbe kro. Camera is not covered. Clean my deck. Adhe lens clean my deck. Aache, aache. Kolagi aache. So just uh, remove the ca disconnected the camera and stand up. Okay, Nada. Huh? Now it is better. Can you see better? It is better now. Yes. So. Maybe you can cut that sleeve of annulus. Yes, yes. Then it will come out. I'll just cut so cut arama karud cut. So I'm just cutting the. This is a hard component here. Yes. Through that maybe the the soft fragment has gone out. And also you require a better grasper. Yeah. So we've taken a bigger grasper now. Yeah. Clean man, you get it in another clean man. You can tell it. Hook. 
we should be careful. There is something seen there. It might be root edge. We don't know. So we should be very careful. You can see there is a there is a something horizontal whitish thing there. Below that, there is a soft upturned punch. So you should be very careful uh, handling those things. Whenever you have doubt, upturned punch. So that looks like an acute fragment to me, but uh, we need to see. Punch straight, Cody. It's better, but it'll wait. So once uh, the fragment comes out, you can uh, grasp, use a bigger grasper. You need to be a little bit patient. It will come out eventually. So. You can see the root and the fragment. Yeah. Root is above and fragment is below. This is the root, you see? And the fragment is here. So this uh, understanding is very important, Curet, because if you don't understand this differentiation of the tissues, what is a root, what is a fascia, then you might injure the root badly. So here, as we thought, it has not pushed the root completely medially. It has lifted posteriorly. Yes. So that is what we should understand. MRI is always deceiving. Uh, so understanding the MRI is also very important. So now we'll just go de nearby, so that nearer, and I'll just start working there. Punch, um, up and punch. So then we'll sl start slowly cutting the. So that is a fragment. So that seems like a vessel there. Vessels are a vessel. What whitish thing we are seeing that's a vessel? Yeah. So it means that root is nearby. Root is just medial to it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, fragment is right there. Yeah. Maybe I'll just clear some more, some more, then I can, I'm able, I'm holding, the, I'm able to hold the fragment. Yeah. So I'll just little bit uh, clear some more tissue, then we can uh, just little bit deeper. Uh, coffee is ready, so anyone who is feeling sleepy can treat themselves to a cup of coffee. So bit by bit fragment is coming now. So what happens, uh, a bit of fragment comes out, things start falling down and you see the anatomy better. So so here we are completely in the foramen, we have not gone into the disc here. You can see the fragments are coming out, floating out. Pancham RF. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
ट्रैक्टर कटर करूड़ कटर फर्स्ट ऑफ फोर्टी फाइव डिग्री आते हैं इधर Maybe you can uh, try to mobilize uh, with curate or hook and yeah. it will come I'm, out. I'm doing that once I just cut this. पंचम अपटेंड पंचम अपटेंड पंच इतना इतना डू यू हैव ए फ्लेक्सिबल ग्रास पर दे या या वी आर डॉक्टर अनिल हैज इट सो वी आर टेकिंग दैट Things have become much clear now. Uh, there is a, a, di a disc, which is the intradiscal part, has come out. So the migrated part, a bit, has come out. So we are just uh, trying to clear. Then we can go for the bigger fragment. You can see the bigger fragment or part of it is coming out. Yes. So slowly the thecal sac will fall down. Keep it. We'll just use it. And whenever you use a malleable or a flexible cutter or a this one, always have a visibility, proper visibility, what you are pulling. Otherwise, you might injure. Uh, hook. Hook. Kelsa Marti lala ma Marti dena. so i'm just using a hook to increase my our visibility i'm just removing that uh, yellow ligament further for the upturned uh, cup forceps circle cup force cup forceps ra कटर मादरी फोर से कप फोर से
cup punch. So what I'm trying to do is uh, slowly go to the apex there, uh, to near, near the exiting route and traversing route area where the migrated fragment has gone up. So intradiscal part significantly has come out. Yes. Now we need to go to the migrated fragment. So what I'm trying to go do is to just you can see here there is a ligament. We have gone as medial as RF. So as medial as the traversing route. So, yeah. so this is a PLL which is now flapping. You use a hook or curate yeah. uh, mobilize So now I'll mode. just uh, use a hook. Before that I'll just uh, uh, try to use a curate to remove that ligament further. Curate. Curate. So curate or hook, whichever is comfortable, can use it. So this all uh, articulating instruments are to increase our vision, increase the space, working space, where we cannot use a cutter. We can use these instruments. These are wonderful instruments. Just the purpose of doing this step is to increase the visibility. You know where you are, punch, what you are doing, punch. So, upturn punch, straight punch, so you can see that I am seeing the root there. Yes. So now I'm confident that once I see the root, okay, the root is there, so I have to work around it. So now you can see that's a root area. Can you see the root there? Yes, we can see. So below that you can I can see the fragment. Yes. Uh, now I can use a hook. Uh, now I'm just hooking out the fragment. I'm going there. This is a fragment which yes. has gone in. So, yes. shoot. You can see there, I am coming towards the pedicle. In the image, X-ray image. Can someone show the X-ray image? But anyway, we can see the fragment there very yeah. clearly. It is fully adhered. Yeah, maybe it is long standing. Yeah. But uh, I think history is secured, but this looks like chronic. Yeah, so patient, you should be very careful here. No, when it is not coming, don't try to pull. Maybe pull. a flexible, flexible grasper will flexible grasper. help. So I'm putting a flexible grasper. And again, whenever you are putting a flexible grasper, try not to pull too firmly, too hard. Just hold it and you see what you are holding and try to tease it. Upturned punch. No? Actually, there is a long hook with me which got broke, broken in the morning. I don't know how it broke, so that I'm not able to 
ಪಂಚ್ ದೊಡ್ಡದು ಕೊಡಿ ಹೆವಿ ಪಂಚ್ ಸೊ ನೌ ಐ ಟ್ರೈ ಟು ಗ್ರಾಬ್ ದಿಸ್ ಫ್ರಾಗ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ವಿಚ್ ಆರ್ ಹುಕ್ಡ್ ಔಟ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಕಂಪ್ಲೀಟ್ಲಿ ಸ್ಟಕ್ ದೇರ್ ನೌ ಇಟ್ ಹಸ್ ಇಟ್ಲ್ ಬಿಟ್ ಹಸ್ ಕಮ್ ಔಟ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಯು ಸಿ ಎಸ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಸಿ can see the fragment which has come out now yeah we can see hmm. so there's a it's a part of it i think yes, it's still maybe there may be one maybe or two yeah, yeah more pieces inside so but epidural bleed started now punch straight punch straight punch ಪಂಚ್ ಪಂಚ್ ಟೂತ್ ಪಂಚ್ ಕೊಡ್ತೀವಿ ಇದು ಕೊಡಿ ಅಪ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಪಂಚ್ ಅಪ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಪಂಚ್ ಪಿ ಎಲ್ ಎಲ್ ಥರ ಇದೆ ಹಾರೆ so there is a epidural bleed now so you need to little bit you can increase the fluid up ten punch could occur in the so that is a root can you see the yes, root yes we can see the root yes So Kumar can we proceed with uh, Dr. Goris Lekha? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. You can uh, go. Main part is over here. Yeah, yeah. Because main part is over. The, ro- the root is seen now. Yes. Nicely pulsating here. Yeah. So I think you can go ahead with the talk so that once I am uh, uh, done, I can yeah, just interrupt. Yeah, we will run interrupt. it on one screen. Yeah, interrupt. Uh, yeah. We will run it on one screen. Yeah. Thank you, Sukumar, Thank for you. this wonderful Thank demonstration. You. Big round of applause for Dr. Sukumar. so we will proceed with the uh, uh, gore sir's lecture now 95d he will be giving it uh, live yeah just one screen cutter ma those who want to watch the surgery you can watch here in one of the screen okay chemo ka 
Sir, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Dr. Mahesh here. We are ready to... Yeah, I can recognize. Yeah. What you need to do is to ask that uh, gentleman to make me the host so I can share the screen. Okay, one second. This is not allowing me to go into upcut. Okay, wonderful. So I'll start uh, upcut. sharing the screen the moment he is. Yeah, fine. I think we are ready, sir. Okay, am I audible and visible? Uh, we can hear you and see you. Your screen is yet to be seen. <laughs> okay, I have started sharing. It is saying it is loading. Okay, so it maybe is another sharing. half a minute. Started sharing. Yeah, I think it will come. Okay, so are you able to see the first slide? Uh, not yet. Number canal stenosis. Not yet. Okay. Uh, you see, if it takes too much time, then I have an alternative. I have already uploaded this presentation to the computer there. And I may ask... Uh, ah, now we can see your screen, I think. Yeah, now we can see the slides. Uh, no, that I think they are playing over there locally. Okay, well, should I play from my side or I think I'll take it up over there. We can see the slide. I don't know whether it is... No, no, it this is, is the local one. This is played in Mysuru, not from my side, okay. which is okay. I will start with this. Uh, is Dr. Omkar sort of Omkar is managing? Yes, sir, is he there to play I'm the here, slides? Yes, sir. I'll play the slides. Yeah, okay, please. So, good evening and welcome to my presentation. This is going to be a very intense and sort of mind-changing presentation, I hope, because this is something which is complete counterintuitive and has not been done before by anyone. We have been working on this idea for the last six years and now we are in a position to tell you what exactly we do, how we do, why we do, etc. Uh, if I want to sum up my presentation in one single slide, it is this. You can see a picture on the right side where you can see a blue arrow coming in the foramen from above and going on the medial aspect of the facet joint. The orange line which you see is a line along the lower end plate of the upper vertebra, which is commonly the tip of the SAP. And the yellow oblong circle is supposed to show you the facet joint and highlight the point that we need to go under and medial to the facet joint if we want to treat lumbar canal stenosis. Next, please. Can I get the next slide? Yeah. Now, there are certain basic concepts which have popular, which are popular and talked about commonly in open surgery. And few of these diagrams I have taken from a textbook on minimally invasive spine surgery by Tumi Lian, who is a neurosurgeon from Barrows Institute in Phoenix, Arizona in US. This figure shows you that the interpedicular distance goes on increasing. But if you see the distance between the pedicles from kephalad to kodar, that is mid pedicle above to mid pedicle below, which actually is the functional segment, then the distances go on decreasing. Why? Because of lordosis, that is number one, and because of the anatomy as it is. Next, please. Now, here is a picture to highlight the obsession which we have to go in the disc plane and it definitely entails cutting the kephalad lamina. If you see the images from left to right, the left image is where a tube is put on the lamina as to enter the canal and remove the ligament. The second image shows you the tube in the plane of the disc and all of us know from anatomy that if you try to come in the plane of the disc, 
It is actually on the lower part of the cupellar lamina, as can be seen in image four under the X-ray, <clears throat> and image five on the right side, where you see a dot with three arrows, where the surgeon is supposed to land and then cut the lamina so as to expose the ligamentum clavum in its cephalad, lateral, and lower attachment before its removal. The removal of the inferior articular process or the posterior or inferior facet is a part of entry into the canal. Next, please. Now, here you will find that posterior midline surgery for ligament in an actual cut, as can be seen on the right, is by medial facetectomy. Now, please remember that the ligament which is shown here on the left side, where I'm trying to show with my cursor, there are three parts of it. The part which is below the facet actually is called as a lateral ligamentum flevum, which actually is more important in the upper part of the foramen, in the roof of the foramen. This part between the red line and this whitish line is the medial part of the ligamentum flevum, which actually is symptomatic. It lies on the medial face of the facet. And the part between the white line and the midline is the central ligamentum flavor. Now, here I would like to make one very bold statement that central ligamentum flavor is completely irrelevant as far as symptoms are concerned. It has nothing to do with causation of symptoms. How, why, where, when, I will clarify as we go along. Next, please. Now, here is an artist impression in the middle image and on the right side, where they have shown this very popular triangle with the yellow ligament in the V of the lamina, which is completely false and completely wrong representation of the anatomy of ligamentum flavor. The ligament is actually not like this. I will show you how it is in dissected specimens and then I will try to convince you about what I'm talking. Next, please. Now, here is again a depiction on the left where the maroon part of the cephalad lamina is removed, the yellow, the bluish part of the lower lamina is removed, the medial facet is removed. The second picture shows the same from the ventral perspective, that is the canal perspective. And on the right, we are trying to look at the lamina removal so that we can go over the top to the other side, whatever that means. Next, please. Here again, the same over the top, under the lamina, under the central part of the lamina, etc. And in the middle part of the image, you can see a big window in the upper, that is cephalad lamina, and the lower lamina, and the medial facetectomy. And on the rightmost image, you see the medial facetectomy, and a removal of the lamina and making a big decompression of the ligamentum flavor. Let's go ahead. Next, please. Now, here is an artist impression on the left side and the reality on the right side. On the left side, you will see as if the ligamentum flavor is like a curtain coming from the upper lamina to the lower lamina and extending from outside the foramen from one side to the other side, and the reddish edge of the lamina is the one which is removed, so that in the middle image, you can see the complete removal of the ligamentum flavum allegedly decompressing the central canal stenosis. This confusion, misinformation, misrepresentation of the anatomy must stop. This is completely irrelevant way of showing the real anatomy. If you look on the rightmost image, this is a 3D fusion image of MRI of the lumbar spine, where you see the greenish ligamentum flavum, which is more like a V, like a V. You can see the orange nerves, and you can see the grayish bone, the vertebrae, and you can see this black at the top of the arrow, the pedicle. Now, I have drawn these arrows to emphasize the point 
that if we want to go medial to the facet, we can come like this because the ligamentum flavum leads us from the top to the midline. Next, please. Now, here is an important message to you that in case of surgery of the lumbar canal stenosis, we should follow the ligament and spare the lamina. Now, in open surgery, what we do is we start at the midline. Now, let me orient you to this picture. This is an anatomical dissection of the left-sided foramen and the lamina has been removed. The SP process is the spinous process. You can see the lamina above. You can see the lamina below. The lamina below is important because the upper edge of the lower lamina, if you follow, it will slowly grow into superior articular process which will cover this axilla or the roof of the axilla. The LN, LN outside is the exiting nerve and the nerve from above. TRP, TRP is transverse process. And if you follow this LFM, LFM, LFM is ligamentum flavum, which is lateral, medial, and then under the spinous process will be central. Now listen very carefully. In our open surgery, we try to follow the ligament from the midline, from the lower lamina midline towards the facet joint as shown with the black arrow. From below up outwards, we cut the lamina, we cut the inferior articular process, etc. I am trying to tell you that you follow the black arrow, then the yellow arrow and go towards the midline where the midline is not relevant. Only the lateral and the medial part of the ligament is important. So in my system, which I call a Smriti system, which is subparse medial reach, upper transforaminal intracanal intervention. I say that you work on the ligament. Now here, please understand this point, which I'm making. In open surgery, you come from behind, you work on the dorsal surface of the ligament, and you are working against the dural sac. So there is a high chance of dural injuries and tears. In case of transforaminal entry in the upper foramen, you are ventral to the ligament, and you are working towards the lamina from below. So we are actually very, very safe. Next, please. Now, there are some secrets which I will quickly explain to you. The symptomatic changes in the canal, that is lumbar canal stenosis, are inside the canal. Now, I know what I'm saying. I'm not saying that there are no changes outside the canal, but they have nothing to do with causation of symptoms. And these changes are only in three important structures, that is the disc which is the anterior wall in the middle zone, the facet, which is the posterolateral wall in the middle zone and the lower zone, and the ligamentum flavum, which covers the posterolateral and the posterior wall. Please remember that disc and facet are absent in the upper zone. I will clarify this point very soon. Now, understanding the ligamentum anatomy and imaging of ligamentum should be changed. Ventral dissection of the ligament is necessary and an oblique coronal MRI is necessary. I would make a comment that artist impression of ligamentum flavum is completely wrong, irrelevant, and should be stopped. The problem with MRI imaging is we get good sagittal and coronal images, but when we get the axial images, the plane is only the disc plane and the MRI specialist does not give us the axial cuts of the upper and the lower zone. I will clarify this further. And please remember, it is not the foramen, but the canal that needs attention with the extra foraminal axis, dorsal to the intertransverse plane towards the roof of the canal. 
Now, stenosis surgery with respect to ligamentum plevum is working under ventral to the ligament against the bone and as a target on the wall or lateral to and not end of the scope. Now, what I'm saying here, this is very important. In our endoscopy of the disc, our targets commonly lie in front of us. So when we go through the scope, we are able to grab them and work on them. In case of canal wall, which is changing in stenosis, our coming on the wall, we are working on the side and not at the end. And therefore, we don't need caricens, but we need curates to work on the wall, the soft tissue on the wall, the ligament on the wall, through the slit of the active sleeve. What is that active sleeve and slit? I will clarify. This is an instrument which is patented by me, and there are some other additions which I will clarify. Next, please. Now, here is a coronal oblique MRI where we take what we call as a sacroiliac joint protocol, and then you see this black thing where there is a blue arrow. Now, this blue arrow is actually pointing towards the facet joint. This is the ligamentum plevum from the midline up to the upper pedicle or the roof of the foramen. L is the lateral part of the ligament. M is the medial part. C is the central part. And as I said, lateral and medial are symptom causing parts of the ligament. C central is completely irrelevant. Now this arrow with the red head is the surgical strategy for open surgery, where you start here, digging here and go up eating the lamina above, right up to the pars, and sometimes you may even break the pars, destabilize the segment, and then restabilize it smartly by putting the screws in the pedicles. This is available to everyone if you ask your MRI specialist to give you a sacroiliac joint protocol for lumbar spine. The sacroiliac joint protocol gives a coronal oblique image, which actually is very, very important. Next, please. Now I'm going to talk about my concept of zones, walls, causes, effects, planes, detection of the changes, and clinical assessment and imaging in very short. There are three zones. The upper zone is above the disc up to the upper pedicle. The middle zone canal is behind the disc and the lower zone canal is below the disc inside the pedicles of the vertebra below. So the upper zone is within the confine of the upper vertebra. The lower zone is the confines of the lower vertebra and the middle zone is behind the disc. Now, the structures which lie inside the canal the traversing nerve is immobile at the entry to the root canal and around the pedicle. This is very, very important. As I pointed out in the morning during the talk on MRI by our friend in the morning, nobody mentions this, but this is a very important point that traversing nerve is immobile. Now the changes in the canal stenosis are changes in the disc the facet, the cover of the facet ventrally, and the ligamentum flavor. Now these changes effect on the, give effects on the exiting mobile route in the upper zone, the immobile traversing route in the lower zone, and the thecal sac between the jaws of the facet insert in the middle zone or the central canal. Now please understand this. The upper zone stenosis, or can be called a soft tissue foraminal stenosis affecting the exiting nerve. Central canal stenosis affecting the facet, medial face, and the thecal sac, and the disc in the front. And the lower zone or lateral racist stenosis affecting the immobile traversing nerve are three different entities. The upper and lower zone can give rise to pain because the nerves are involved and the middle zone or the central canal stenosis commonly give rise to numbness 
or commonly gives rise to claudication and it gives rise to chronic coda equina. Posterior elements, that is the lamina and the interlaminar window, slope down and away from the dural sac. And the interlaminar window is below the plane of the disc. The ligamentum flavum is attached ventral to the upper lamina and on the edge of the lower lamina. Now, we need to understand here that the clinical detection of the upper zone stenosis is possible by asking the patient to extend the spine in standing or lying down. And with extension, there is an increase in the radiation along the posterior aspect of the thigh. As I mentioned, the imaging needs to change and it should come in the plane of the facet. That is a coronal oblique image should be available. Extra foraminal zone is important for the access to this area. And we are concentrating not on the foramen, but walls of the canal. Next, please. Now, this is a video which I would like uh, Dr. Omkar to play. This is a revised anatomy of upper zone. There is an audio to We're the video. To look at so, the... please play it. I will keep quiet. And once it is over, then I'll talk further. Please play the video and with the anatomy sound, please. Of the upper zone. Sound, the upper please. Zone sound. Essentially in the confines of the vertebral bone. Sound, body. please below the pedicle that is it starts from the lower border of the pedicle and it goes right up to the lower border of the body so this part of the canal is the upper zone canal what we are looking at now there are several important points to be understood here and we are going to look at those points one by one so first thing is the upper zone starts at the lower border of the pedicle and it extends from here to the lower border of the body. This is the anterior wall of the upper zone and this is covered in the midline by the ligamentum flavum. Most of the time the ligamentum flavum is a little weaker in the paracentral area. So upmigrated herniations etc. are common in these areas. We will also note that the articular surface of the IAP begins more or less around this line. That is, if we draw a line along the lower border of the vertebral body, it will pass above this joint surface on the IAP. If we look at the pedicle, we will find that the traversing nerve, which is immobile here, comes along the groove under the pedicle and the exiting nerve here will then become mobile and come out of the foramen. That is an important content of the upper zone. The immediate dorsal area to the nerve root or the dorsal root ganglion is the pars interarticularis as you can see here and this is an area which may be affected by a defect in the pars, which is spondylolysis, and the body may have some attempt on the repair of this pars defect, which can give rise to fibrocartilage in this area, pressing on the dorsal ganglion. So, we may have a cause in this area to create issues. In addition, we have to remember that the Exiting nerve comes out from here, the traversing nerve goes down and the axillary tissue which is here, which also includes the lateral part of the ligamentum flavum, can give rise to symptoms. Now let us look at the posterior wall of the upper zone. The posterior wall has a ridge like this. Now, these ridges which are seen under the IAP, as you can see here, this ridge is actually the border between the central canal and the lateral canal. And this ridge, which you can see here, is the upper attachment of the ligamentum flavum under the ventral surface of lamina, the upper lamina. 
Now this ligament of flavum stretches from the midline up towards this area that is the lateral part of the ligament is this this is the medial part of the ligament here and this will be the central part of the ligament here which is very important part of the anatomy that is the ligament extending from the midline towards the upper pedicle and not only covering the facet joint horizontally please remember again the ligament is attached under the ventral lamina in the upper zone here and therefore if there are changes of hypertrophy in the ligamentum flavum here in the lateral part of the ligament as we have seen here then for an open surgeon we will have to cut this area we will have to weaken this cortical bone instead of that we can easily go in this area dorsal to the nerve through the landing in the middle zone that is the disc level canal so we'll just repeat this is the anterior wall this is the posterior wall of the upper zone and if we look at it as a matter of open surgeon towards the upper zone then we will find it is entirely covered by the pars here this is the lower border of the vertebra and the upper zone will extend from the lower border of the pedicle to the lower border of the vertebral body so this upper zone is not accessible easily by going from posterior midline there is an important point here that the segmental artery will be somewhere closer to this part under the transverse process so whatever we are doing we must remember that the extra foraminal zone medial to this area is safe the moment you start going lateral it becomes much more risky so this is an important part and important points about the upper zone anatomy again repeating one simple point that upper zone is within Sorry. the confines of the vertebral Sorry. body Sorry. this margin is where the central canal starts this is the pedicle and we will be noting that the pedicles are little oblique which in the lower zone gives rise to the lateral graces yeah next please we are going to look at next. the anatomy yeah now this is about the lower zone play the video there is a sound to it i will keep the quiet lower zone the lower zone is behind the body of the vertebra below the disc level and it is within the confines of this part of the vertebral body we are using the same model to understand the lower zone here now let's look at the anterior wall of the lower zone which is the lower end plate of the disc at that level and the bony wall below that we will note that if we look at it from the side then from the lower end plate at the disc to the upper border of the pedicle there is a small area which actually is part 1 of the lateral graces there are two important structures here the one is the traversing nerve which is somewhere here which is immobile against the bone as it goes below the pedicle and out the second important structure is the attachment of the annulus to the lower end plate is not like the attachment to the upper end plate there is a pouch of the disc in this area and a disc bulge in this area can cause involvement of the traversing nerve in part 1 of the lateral graces now what is part 1 part 1 extends from this lower end plate to the upper border of the pedicle part 2 is from the upper border of the pedicle to the middle of the pedicle and part 3 called as buffer zone is from the middle of the pedicle to the lower border of the pedicle so what is part 2 if we look at it like this if we look at it with a oblique angle from the other side that is from the left 
we are looking towards the right. This is part two of the lateral braces, which extends from the upper border of the pedicle to the mid part of the pedicle. Now, what is, is this mid part? Why do we call this as part two of the lateral braces? There are two or three important anatomical things. Number one is the nerve is close to the anterior wall and is going down along this wall and out in the foramen. The nerve is not close to the posterior wall. Now here, if we look at the posterior wall, the first thing which will strike you is very important and that is the superior articular process, that is the superior facet becomes the lamina here. Okay, the upper edge of the lower lamina is continuous with the superior articular process or the anterior facet. Now, the inferior articular process is going to articulate here, form the facet joint, and the facet joint ends somewhere along the uh, middle part or the transverse plane, middle transverse plane of the transverse process or at the middle part of the pedicle. So, part two of the lateral race is here. In the posterior wall, we will have the passive joint right up to here, the middle part. And we must remember that the inferior articular process will have an articulation here. This would be where the ligamentum plevum will be attached along the upper edge of the lower lamina. And as you can see very well, the lamina below, that is this upper edge of the lower lamina, doesn't come at the level of the disc. It is much below that. It is almost at half the body where the nutrient artery to the vertebral body and the nerve to the vertebral body are entering in this area. So again, part one will have this pouch of the disc Part two will have these tissues which are dorsal to the nerve, which would be mainly the facet covering of the soft tissue and ligamentum plevum, and changes occurring at the lower pole of the facet in the form of synovial cyst or other synovial changes. So, we have to note that we will have changes in the anterior part of part one and the posterior part of part 2. Part 3 is completely bony as you can see here and it will not be affecting the course of the nerve or the function of the nerve. Here there is one more important point which we have to know is from this to this from the posterior aspect is the central canal and this is a part of the lateral braces where the pedicle forms the lateral wall of the lateral races. Let us once again revise one important point. The SAP, which is the anterior facet, continues as the upper border of the lower lamina, where the ligamentum plevum is attached. The inferior articular process is posterior to the SAP. It has nothing to do with the canal here. It is behind this SAP. So, whatever changes which occur here will not affect the nerve unless this distance from the vertebral body to the lamina is so short like in a congenital stenosis that the nerve will be affected. Please remember that the posterior midline where the ligament is attached will have a pre area here dorsal to the dural sac. And anyway, the nerves are not lying in the center of the dural sac. So, in the lower zone, we will have the problems in part 1 here, part 2 here. That's it. Thank you. Now, let us come. Yeah, please play this video. This video Let's is about the middle zone. Real crux of the issue where we are going to talk about the middle zone. The middle zone canal is this canal which lies in front of the interlaminar window but not only this because this is already lower zone, the canal which lies little above and here you will appreciate the first important point that the interlaminar window is not in line with the disk space. 
okay the disc is above the disc is kefilad to the internal minor window number 2 is if you want to go for the disc which is what is the basic point of the surgery most of the times you need to remove this lower part of the upper lamina of course the other reason you remove it because you want to remove the ligamentum clavum attachment to the under surface of the lamina the second point which we can see is the inferior articular process is posterior to the sap to the superior articular process or the anterior facet and it cannot possibly hurt the nerve the traversing nerve here which goes along the pedicle unless this distance is very short for example in a um, congenital stenosis now let's see what is middle zone middle zone is the area of the canal which is in line with the disc space as we have already said the one which lies above this end plate above this bit up to the lower part of the pedicle is the upper portion of the zone upper zone upper portion of the canal the one which lies behind the body and here inside the pedicle is the lower zone so the middle zone is the part of the canal which is in line with the disc space behind the disc space here in line with the disc space anteriorly it is the disc laterally it is the lower and middle portion of the foramen and posteriorly it is very interesting to see what we see here is first of all the posterior midline is quite away is quite dorsal to the dural side this is the lamina and if you watch very carefully this lower portion of the lamina will be having the attachment of the ligamentum clavum which will extend up towards the upper part of the foramen where the lateral ligamentum clavum will be situated now this portion which is what i call as medial face of the facet it has the cover of the ligamentum clavum which merges with the facet capsule and the ventral capsular tissue now this tissue on the medial face of the facet here and here if you look at it in a cross section they form the jaws of the pincer as we call it that is the facet joint per se will try and grab the thecal sac in a narrow canal if there is a hypertrophy of this tissue so here what we have to remember is this portion will be involved and now naturally just look at this if you are talking about the medial face of the facet by doing a removal of the ventral surface of the sap that is a ventral facetectomy you cannot reach the medial face of the facet easily the smruti system is essentially to reach this area and this area and therefore please listen carefully we are sub pars here then we reach medial to the facet here so it is sub pars medial reach trans upper foraminal intra canal intervention so that's why the system is called as smruti system it starts dorsal to the transverse process it is in the medial portion of the para spinal or the extra foraminal area not too much away because the segmental artery is situated somewhere in this plane so we stick very close to the lateral border of the pars we come from above we land on the tip of the sap and then we go medial to the facet so this is the crux of the issue where we are covering the medial face of the facet okay now that is very important and here again the internal minor window is against the lower portion or the lower vertebral body so if you want to go for the disc or the ligament which is not in this plane remember that you will have to cut the lamina here if you want to go lateral to the dural sac and on 
the medial face of the facet, you will have to cut the facet here. All this removal of the bone can be avoided in my system. Another important point is when you are operating through the interlaminar area, you land on the ligamentum flavor and you are working between the plane of the bone and the ligament against the dural sac which is ventral to it. Okay. Whereas when you come here, when you land here, you are landing between the ligamentum flavum and the dura and you are working against the lamina which is dorsal to it. One more important point is please remember ligamentum flavum which is lying here dorsal to the dural sac and which is lying in the midline is completely irrelevant to the symptoms from lumbar canal stenosis. Yes, I am saying this again. The central ligamentum flavum lying in this window, which is below the disc level, away from the traversing and the exiting nerve, is completely irrelevant to the symptoms of lumbar canal stenosis. So let us bury this ghost once and for all for a better understanding of lumbar canal stenosis. So let's okay, come next to So there are nine targets in lumbar canal, mainly about stenosis. In the upper zone, there is no disc or facet, so I call it as target zero. The first target is the axillary tissue, which must be removed. Otherwise, we land up with a failed back surgery, as was very common in the past. Target number two is the ligament lateral part or a parse related defect with a repair on the ventral surface by fibrocartilage. In the middle zone, the third target three is the anterior changes in the disc, mainly the loss of concavity, which is one of the commonest causes of central canal stenosis. There is no posterior cause in the middle zone. Posterolaterally, you have the convex facet and its soft tissue cover, which may change. And target number five is the foraminal cause, where there is a G naught, that is amalgamation of soft tissues, mainly osteophyte from end plate, uh, facetal hypertrophy, the soft tissue, then the ligamentum flavum and the intra foraminal ligaments together can form a soft tissue knot there. In the lower zone, Target six is the pouch of the disc in part one of the lateral races. Laterally, there is no target. Target number seven is a synovial cyst. As you know, synovial cysts are never seen in the upper zone because there is no facet there. They are not seen in the middle zone because the facet is covered with a tough ligamentum flavor. In the lower zone, the ligament goes up. So the lower angle of the facet may be bare of the ligament from where the cyst encroaches on the canal. And facet lower pole soft tissue hypertrophy can be target eight in part two of the lateral races. Now, out of these nine targets, there are certain which we can access by open access, certain which can access, which can be accessed by my system. But important point is there is nothing apart from these nine places we change in lumbar canal stenosis. The important point is these changes are universal. The problem is imaging showing these changes does not mean that they will be causing symptoms. And in central canal stenosis, we will be dealing more with numbness, claudication, difficulty in standing and walking, and chronic codiquina affecting the bladder. For open access, we always come through the lower zone and it can only reach two, four, seven, and eight. That is two is sparse, four is um, facet medial face, seven is the synovial cyst, and eight is the lower pole of the facet. I mean, there is nothing else you can reach by removal of the posterior wall unless you extend it so as to go around the thecal sac for the disc or for the upper zone. You cannot reach one, three, five, and six without the bone removal. Four, seven, and eight 
that is medial face of facet, lower pole of the facet and the cyst can be reached by my system. And a classic transforaminal endoscopy using my system, we can reach one, two, three, five and six. And with the new system, you can reach four, seven and eight, thus making it a true BE, that is transforaminal unilateral biportal evolved endoscopy. Next, please. Now, before we play the video, just, just wait for a second. If you feel that whatever I have talked is too much for a day, we can take a break and I can take my talk later on. If it is okay to talk further, please let me know. If there are any questions at this stage, I'm ready to answer them. But please confirm that we go ahead or we take a break. Should we go what ahead? is it? Go ahead. Uh, sir, everybody wants to go ahead. Yeah. yeah, okay, fine. Please go ahead. This is the most important part of my presentation where I'm going Sound to talk please. about the nine targets in lumbar canal stenosis and lumbar spine surgery. First of all, let me clarify quickly that everything which lies above the level of the end plate here or above the tip of the SAP up to the border of the pedicle is the upper zone. The one between the end plate here and here, the canal line behind this level is the middle zone up to this lamina and the posterior line. And everything which lies below the disc level behind the body and below the body inside the pedicles is the lower zone. I already mentioned that upper zone is in the confines of the upper body. The lower zone is in the confines of the lower body. Now the upper zone main content in the dorsal root ganglion and the exiting nerve. The middle zone, the main content is the thecal sac and the lower zone, the main content is the traversing nerve. And the important point is the traversing nerve is immobile against this anterior wall of part one of the lateral braces. Now pay attention to the three targets in upper zone. The upper zone naturally does not have the facet joint or the disc because it is above the disc level. So target zero is there is an absence of facet and the disc in the upper zone easy to remember. Target one is a tissue which will lie in this axillary area where the anterior wall is the body of the vertebra, the lateral is the open part of the foramen which can be accessed from the middle zone and the posterior is this sparse which may have a lytic defect, a fibrocartilage repair. So target one is the axillary tissue which is commonly missed or not operated by open surgeons because you cannot possibly reach there from here and that is the commonest cause of failed open surgery. The target two is a parse defect which is a defect in the IAP which is commonly ahead of this ridge which can be easily accessed from the foramen here and we can work against this bone because this is a very safe area without any nerve or thecal sac here except the lateral ligamentum flevum is here. So target two is the lateral ligamentum flevum or the pars defect repair tissue. So there are three targets in upper zone. I'm repeating target zero is no facet or disc in the upper zone. Target one is the axillary tissue more towards the floor and target two is the lateral ligamentum flevum which is lying here or the pars defect. So these are the targets in the upper zone. Target one axillary tissue, target two lateral ligamentum flevum and target two again is the pars defect. Target zero as I said is no disc of the passive. Now let us come to the middle zone. Now when we talk about the middle zone, we must remember that for an open surgeon, the middle zone canal is accessible only through this interlaminar area by cutting the facet, the lower portion of the upper facet. Otherwise, you cannot really see the upper zone 
and the middle zone. Now the middle zone targets number one is the disc. The disc has a concavity at the posterior aspect. This concavity is lost if you have a bulge of the disc or a herniation which could be migrated and could be central paracentral foraminal extra foraminal. So that is target number three. Target number four is the tissue on the medial aspect of the facet which as you can see here this would be where the lateral ligament would be this would be the medial and this would be the central ligament and please remember the central ligament of premum does not cause any symptoms whatsoever so here we are looking at the posterior wall or the middle zone these are the jaws of the pincer as i call it so target four here, target three is the posterior aspect of the disc pressing against the central canal, which is the commonest cause of central canal stenosis in addition to this pincer. Target number three is the disc, target number four is the medial face, target number five is in the foramen, where you may have what I call a G knot, which is actually the amalgamation of an osteophyte here, a osteophyte here, the disc annulus, the hypertrophic ligamentum flavum, the facet capsular tissue, the intraforaminal ligaments, everything coming together below the exiting nerve and close to the traversing nerve. So there is a knot of soft tissue here which is target number 5. So we have covered 0, 1, 2 in upper zone, 3, 4, 5 in the middle zone. Now in the lower zone, target number 6 is the pouch of the lower annulus, which is in the upper part here, that is between the end plate and upper border of the pedicle here, which lies here, just ventral to the traversing nerve. So that is target number six target number seven and eight will be things happening along the lower pole of the facet here which is as you can see the dorsal wall of the part two of the lateral races here which can be seen from behind like this it is here that the thing is like here or here now target number seven and eight will be ligamentum flavum related changes here or the synovial cyst which commonly comes out of the defect in the ligamentum flavum from the facet joint in the canal unless this distance is short as in a congenital stenosis part two of the lateral races will have a dorsal cause which is much away from the nerve okay so please remember this. Now we will again revise our targets. Target 0, 1, 2 in the upper zone, target 3, 4, 5 in the middle zone and target 6, 7, 8 in the lower zone. Now let's see what we can do by posterior midline axis. In the posterior midline axis, you are opening this window. You're removing the lamina in this area going to the attachment of the ligament of flavum, you are removing this facet and trying to go lateral to the thecal sac or on the traversing nerve. Now target 0 is no facet, no disc in the upper zone. Target 1 is the axillary tissue which is lying much away from the entry in the interlaminar area, so not reachable. The parse defect may be reachable but the symptomatic part of the pars defect is ventral to the pars. Target 3, the disc, we have to go around the dural sac if you are coming in open surgery. Target 4, medial face of the passage, yes, you can go by cutting the inferior articular process. Target 5, again, and the foraminal G0 is not reachable by interlaminar axis. Target 6, that is the pouch of the annulus here just ventral to the nerve is not reachable easily you have to cut the medial facet and go around target seven 
and eight that is things happening around the roll pole of the inferior articular process are reachable by open surgery so that may be the right way i would say that open surgery is actually only indicated if the target is here no other target is easily reachable by posterior midline access so this in short is the secret of the new system where we will be coming from about dorsal to the spinous process in the medial extrapyramidal part because the segmental artery would be here we will land on the sap tip and we will come inside the canal that is smriti system okay next please this is the most okay so what is reachable by posterior midline axis we have already seen the disc will need removal of facet upper lamina and some edge of the lower lamina and we'll have to go around the thecal sac the facet under surface will need medial facet removal and destabilization ligament exposure will need a lot of bone removal and destabilization surgery open may involve vascular plane and it is dorsal to the ligament and you are working towards the dura whereas transforaminal is ventral to the ligament against the bone and the main thing is posterior midline open surgery is commonly under ga and comorbid patients it may be difficult next please now what is not reachable by posterior midline or the variants of posterior midline like ube and psld the upper zone target one of axillary tissue which is the commonest cause of failed open surgery is not reachable by ube or psld i have worked with two experts from korea on ube and my system psld and my system and i can tell you that you cannot remove the lateral ligamentum flevum or the things lying in the axilla without causing problems to the root the middle zone disc needs facet removal facet under surface needs bone removal and foraminal tissue may not be accessible the lower disc pouch will need iap removal 7 and 8 are definitely possible but we have to remember that the root is immobile at the start of lower zone next please so how do we reach where midline access cannot go or reach the upper zone we reach closer to disc upper end plate towards the upper zone from the middle zone landing middle zone we land in the disc and cover the foraminal tissue the medial facet face is not reachable just by cutting the facet or under surface lower zone disc easily reach part to roof reach by oblique entry and ventral sap cutting because the sap becomes the upper edge of the lamina so it is possible and targets 1 2 in upper 3 5 in middle and 6 can be tackled by transforaminal classic endoscopy and 4 7 8 can be tackled by this new system next please so this is the new system this is a book which i have written about the new system the philosophy how we do it and in the picture on the left you can see the classic cannula coming in the foramen and the needle coming as the new system and of course it is followed by certain instruments i will quickly tell you how i go about it next please we land at this medial pedicle line and the lower end plate line at the junction which is the tip of the sap next please we know that the lower lamina upper edge in an, is an extension of the sap so we try to target like this the yellow line now please remember the yellow line which is showing the arrow outwards is actually indicative of the lay of the ligamentum flevum so we are theoretically retracing the ligamentum flevum from above the lateral ligamentum flevum then the medial right up to the center next please now here is a dissection dissected specimen left side we see from the left outside this is vertebral body vb ivd is the disc 
LN is the nerve from above, LN is the exiting nerve. You can see the pedicle, the nerve coming below the pedicle, and the blue circle is a point where we land, which is below the pars, above the SAP, and above the transverse process. Now, there is a space here, which is dorsal to the nerve, and we can safely land here. Next, please. The same picture which I already shown you, we follow the black, the yellow arrow right up to the midline along the ligamentum clavum, remembering that the upper edge of the lower lamina continues as SAP. Next, please. This is to highlight the point that SAP and the upper edge of the lower lamina is one structure. So if you have hypertrophic ligament here, you can always come oblique, even in the classic endoscopy, cut the undersurface and access this area. Next, please. So this is an important slide where you can see this one, two, three will be the steps. We'll land at one, we'll go to two, then we will follow these white arrows right up to three. This is an IAP, this is a ventral dissection. We are looking at the ligamentum flavum from the ventral aspect, and this can be done without a removal of the bone. Next, please. So there are multiple steps which I have. Next, please. Next, please. So these are the instruments in very short, I will tell you, it's very simple. The first one on the left is a four millimeter pin. The, the second, third, fourth, fifth are dilators. And this is an active sleeve, as I call it. And there is a lateral opening in the sleeve called as a slit in the sleeve. This is mainly because, as I told you, working for stenosis is lateral. It is not the end of the tube. It is not the end of the cannula or end of the scope. Now, these are additional instruments with the traditional classic transforaminal system. So anybody who has these can easily go in and start working right from today. Next, please. This is a wireless or wire-free camera, wire-free light source, which makes my job much more easy because there is no big uh, entangled wires around. Next, please. Uh, this blue point is a point where I land and follow this. Next, please. So this blue tube is my cannula, which comes on the tip of the SAP. There is a space here, as you can see, there is about 2.7 millimeter space here. And my tube is 5.5. And theoretically, I'm actually in the foramen, lower part of the foramen, inside the facet. Next, please. So this is the middle zone, and you can see ligament on the medial face of the facet. This yellow arrow shows target number four, which is not accessible by classic endoscopy, which needs open surgery. But if you believe in what we are talking, you may as well access this by coming from above. Next, please. Same thing, we land here and go towards the midline. Next, please. Now, important point is when you're landing in this plane, it is a vascular plane. As you can see here, the veins are more ventral to it. You're landing somewhere here and you're landing below the ligamentum flavum. Next, please. Now, there are three important variations we have. One is a disc collapse, which will reduce the height of the disc and the SAP may override and Mahindra uh, showed in the morning how he tackles that. That is the right way. The second is the facet may be sagittal, as you can see here. And here you also have one more important finding, which we have recently discovered, and we will publish it very soon, is that the IAP can dig inside the central canal. I mean, you can see here, this is a facet joint, and you can see the tip of the IAP going in the central canal. So this is type 1 lysis but the tip of the IAP either has to be pulled back, that is, we have to have a fixation, or you need to remove this as to decompress the structure properly. Next, please. So, important, 
This M is a medial part of the intertransverse muscles and ligament. L is the lateral part. And we need to remember that we land at five and medial to this M. Because if you go lateral, you will have the segmental artery. Next, please. So this again highlights what we do. Next, please. This yellow is lateral ligament, maroon is the medial ligament, red is the central ligament. We are in no way concerned with the central ligament. Next, please. So this is my system coming from above. This is the classic system from Constant. We can work together. Next, please. We are having two things in the same foramen. This is a picture from one of the patients where my classic endoscope is looking at this structure coming from above and working on the medial side of the facet. I can use a curette on the medial side of the facet under vision. Next, please. So this is where I lie on the medial side. This is a dissected specimen, which tells you where I am. Next, please. I think that's, yeah. So this is the last slide. It shows you the system which is available. This is waiting for launching probably tomorrow. You may have a look at it. It's uh, shown at our stall outside in Mission Spine Foundation stall. It's a very simple system. If you want, if you're interested, you can always email me or message me. That's it. Thank you very much. I'm open to questions. Thank you, sir. No, I'm sorry it took a long time because uh, there were a lot of new things which I had to talk about. I hope that I have made a lot of things very clear and I'm sure that uh, some of you at least would be very, very encouraged and stimulated to think of this way of treating the stenosis in a better, minimally invasive endoscopic way. There's one important point which I would again emphasize as was discussed in the morning by our anesthetist and special emphasis by Dr. Mahesh that this surgery, if the patient is fit, may be done under general anesthesia or epidural anesthesia. But if the patient has comorbidity, then it is better that we do it under local anesthesia. Since it is not for pain, there is no problem. Thank you. If there are any questions, please ask me, or you can ask my colleague, Dr. Omkar, because he has had access to this system. He has seen us using it. Some of you have seen it, us using in our system, our training in Derwan. And uh, we have been doing this for almost a couple of years. The basic concept for about six years, the new concept with the new instruments will last one, one and a half years. Thank you, sir. Uh, any questions from the audience? I believe this uh, concert will take some time to sink in. So... Yes. I give two years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I think yes, sir. So there seems to be no questions now. So thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, taking your time, apart even for your recurring from health. So we all wish you that... Uh, we see you in one of the I conferences live. The audio visual people for helping me out with this presentation. Without their help, it was not possible. I also thank, uh, even though I'm a part of the organization since I'm absent, formally I thank the organizers who are there locally. You have done a good job. I'm very happy to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I may warn you that I may, we may be holding you for a long time today, tonight, because uh, we have two more surgeries to go, and uh, I think four or five uh, talks more to go. So it may be, maybe we'll finish by eight. Is it okay? Or uh, if somebody wants to have a quick dinner or? Yeah, those who want to watch, they can. I mean. We have two more live surgeries. One is uh, recurrent L5 S1 disc, which will be done transforaminal. The other is interlaminar, two level. And uh, so we have four or five talks. And Sukumar has to leave by flight. So we are uh, rushing off with this talk. Let's see. Let's see. Let's how it goes. So.
good evening everyone so sorry i'm crashing in between uh, i need to go to the airport so morning you saw two transferamel surgeries so transferamel surgeries when medial to the medial pedicular line is easy so you can e easily do uh, the principles are different so the moment you come to foramen and extra foramenal area so the the there are light a slight change in principles so just i'll go give a example so this patient you can see hello punch volume pinch hello is it okay now yeah so this case you can see young gentleman left uh, radiculopathy so obviously there is a foramenal disc here so as a open surgeon or as a spine surgeon or an endoscopic surgeon so the landing is very important here so what options we have here there is a foramen stenosis so op options standard approach wilsey's approach for a microscopic surgeon ma surgeon uh, a tube surgeon can go laterally through the the uh, parafacetal area in the intertransverse plane so or biportal can be done ube or uh, full endoscopic spine surgery which i have been doing since long time so when you say full endoscopic spine surgery uh, everyone has seen since morning it just a single port surgery so everything is there the two options one is a landing in the foramen or there is one more approach called extreme lateral approach uh, pr uh, concept given by dr rooten where you land on the inferior pedicle dead lateral touch the inferior pedicle just walk on the facet and remove the exiting root so thanks to all these uh, professors who dedicated their life to endoscopy i was fortunate except for the top two i was almost uh, uh, been th to everyone so when we take minimal invasive surgery uh, being doing this i've done uh, everyone has done it to remove the 3 4 mm of surgery we do lot of uh, damage there so there are so many options we have endoscopic assisted surgeries people say they do endoscopy through this which which is not true so definitely when you say endoscopy uh, and full endoscopy rather it it should be done through a single port and the channel should be the working channel through the same port so advantages as we have been seeing since morning and uh, the tools same tools which we use for any other surgery so there are two approaches but here if you want to go to the foramen then either you come through the transforaminal route or you come from interlaminar contralateral approach it is possible we can do it easily so again transforaminal since morning we are hearing the lectures why transforaminal so you saw today the fragment we reach the pathology first then we see the root in interlaminar you see the root and go to the pathology next so always there is a challenge handle the root first then the pathology next so in transforaminal that is not there so you are uh, tackling the pathology first so chance of violation of neural element is less and again pedicle to pedicle work can be easily done and when you say foramen definitely uh, the transforaminal approach is the best approach or least invasive approach and uh, all beginners will have this myth so when you start your career as a endoscopic surgeon especially transforaminal surgery these are the myths always there so these are all myths it's not true we can do we can like say circumvent all those things and again this is a, a cadaver uh, uh, specimen uh, done by dr gore so when you say interlaminar you tend to remove so much bone you need to do because the lateral edge of the root has to be seen in interlaminar but when you go transforaminal there is no need to re remove the the bone the facet loss is less and the joint violation is less so interlaminar even for a simple disc at l4 5 you have to do some uh, facet work and you might end up in to opening up some joint inferiorly so again when you say what choice what is that how to uh, how do i choose which technique for uh, the different pathologies so always there is no doubt transforaminal extraforaminal transforaminal approach or postolateral approach there is no doubt 
lateral recess there is always debate and up to the surgeon expertise whether how he is trained whether he is a good uh, interlaminar surgeon or a transforaminal surgeon it's up to him to choose how is what is he good at it central again uh, the stenosis part i believe uh, the or a good in my hands is uh, interlaminar for a disc definitely uh, is only disc pathology so i'll go transforaminal again how we go transforaminal the same route the cambins triangle and uh, how do you plan when you say you are dealing with a if the case you saw in the previous slide left foraminal extra foraminal disc how do you plan so whenever you see here in this picture the difference between a conventional transforaminal surgery and extra foraminal surgery is so you see the the root the pathology is uh, the exit the traversing route in uh, conventional disc the foraminal extra foraminal disc the pathology the root compression is exiting root so you are dealing with the exiting root not with the traversing root so what do exiting root has definitely you are have to deal with the ganglion so handling the ganglion because it is very sensitive you might injure or you might have some uh, what is a thermal injury to the ganglion and second thing is the angle you see the angle so normally you around say 30 to 40 degree angle you go for a normal disc for the foraminal extra foraminal disc the trajectory is very steep or more medial it's like this so simple way of calculation you ask your uh, mri technician to give you uh, the field of vision sorry field of view fov larger fov so that his muscles epidural uh, sorry soft tissue that is the uh, subcutaneous fat is also given here so that you can calculate very easily the how much and you should give a marker here the centimeter marker you can calculate how much you need to go from the midline this is very easy in mri you can calculate with that a rough angle also you get you can do it easily for all cases and uh, the addressing the foramen again there are two major techniques since morning you are hearing it's inside out and outside in so these are the two gentlemen who introduced this philosophy inside out by professor yang and uh, outside in by thomas hoogland so these were the one who pioneers who try to conceptualize work around the foramen so what is inside out you go into the disc in inside out then come out slowly that's what you saw today so the outside in approach is where you just land at the pathology don't go inside work around then enter the disc so for a beginner outside in is very difficult there will be a lot of bleeding as you saw today drilling the facet there was so much of bleeding so that makes you uh, like say your uh, morale goes down and when you land this is this should be the foramen when you land you are doing a foraminal work this should be the landing in ap you should be at the foramen in lateral your part of bevel should be inside if this is a x ray or cm image you can get it then working in the foramen is very easy so here in this case it was done like this and uh, so you can see here being a, a left side so this is left side of the screen is cranial you can see this is a exiting root area this is a traversing root area so the disc is here the disc is here that's a so landing is very important if you land correctly so that's a fragment i am removing it and uh, this is a post removal is a one more fragment there and one more thing the foraminal extra foraminal fragment sometimes are very fibrous that also be understood sometimes the uh, hard humps there so that's a exiting root so you are working here on the, the exiting root not with the traversing root and this is a outcome so you drill a partially i have drilled a facet partially here so that i can give a good foraminal decompression because there was foraminal stenosis also in the, this second case you can see here again there is a foraminal uh, sorry extra foraminal fragment patient having a severe left radiculopathy a small fragment into the foramen also so again i land here so you can see the the ap image lateral image so ap i am at the foramen 
API I'm at the foramen and lateral I've just entered the disk. As a beginner, what does this give? When you are entire the inside the disk, your bevel is the, the cannula is not moving, not floating, and you are safe. So this is how it looks like. The angle you can see the steep angle. So you have a steep angle there, and this is just a video, a short video of the, the same patient. So again being left side, left of our screen is cranial. So I just landed a part of my cannula was inside the disc and I just rotated cranially. I'm just cutting the PLL, uh, sorry, uh, annular fibers. And the fat is seen. So this is a fragment. So I'll just remove the fragment. Never be happy once you remove the fragment. Once you remove the fragment, you will, there are always fragments left behind. You can just, there will be some bleeding. You can see there are some intraannular fragments here. There are intraannular fragments. I am hooking out. You can see the intraannular fragments which are trapped there. So uh, this is very important to understand that I'm uh, just cutting some annular fibers there. And there's just a fragment lying there. So this is very important uh, to give a clearance. Otherwise, you can see the fragments coming out. Once you are run a good fragment removal, so one more fragment, now you see the roots start falling down. The moment you remove the entire fragments, roots start falling down nicely. It's the root, you can see the root now, it is falling nicely. So this is how it is, it's the end point, now root has fallen down, it means that there are no further fragments. That's the exiting root area, so it's the exiting root, it's the traversing root. So I have confirmed there is nothing there here, there is nothing there inside the disk. So this is one more case, is again a foraminal, extra foraminal disk. Here I have not entered the disk, I just this is outside in approach, where I have not en entered the disk, I just landed in the, the space, that's the foramen area. When you land in the foramen, you are sometimes confused whether it's a muzzle fiber or a root. So as a beginner, you might get confused. You can see that's a congested, uh, the blood tip fragment. Once I remove, that is the annular rent. So now I know where is the annular rent. So you see, you can see that is the annular rent. I have not cut at all. So just this is outside in approach, where I land outside and remove the fragment. This is the fragment which is below the root. So this is a root. The moment you remove the fragment, root falls down. That's a root. That's the exiting root. So this is a outside in approach. So one more case. Sometimes you deal with this kind of a thing. One is a foraminal fragment and it is little bit up migrated. There is no other than that. There is no fragment. Intraannular, nothing is there. Completely extruded, foraminal and up migrated. Such patients also you can do a outside in approach where you need not go inside. Just land there, you can see the landing, little bit cranial landing, I have just landed in the foramen. Once you land in the foramen, again left side, so cranial, so cut the muzzle. Left side would be the exiting road, so I am just opening up uh, the space there, cutting the fr ligament from the tip of the apex of the, this is a the residual uh, ligament. You can see the fragment is visible to me. So I started removing the fragment. I have not entered the disc at all here. Then I cut the ligament, apical ligament, which is coming from the apex of the superior articular facet. I just cut that ligament a bit so that my visibility increases. So once I cut that, there are further fragments inside, I remove, you can see, so I remove the fragment. Now you can see the root starts visible. So until unless this happens, you should chase and clear the tissue. Only then you are sure that you are removed. Uh, the sometimes there might be some bl blood tinge to the fragment, but still it might be partial. So always try to follow, see the root in entirety so that you have not left any fragment. Don't do anything blindly. So you can see now there is entirely root is bare. The disk space is somewhere here. 
discrepancy somewhere here so we have gone up from the foramen we just followed the traversing route this is a traversing route so exiting route is somewhere here so that's the disk space so one more case again foramenal up for up migrated three of so this is how i have gone this is entirely in the foramen outside in approach gone inside and remove the fragment completely so take home message anyone wants to start foramenal extra foramenal better is the best approach is uh, transforamenal uh, endoscopy paracentral most of the time it can be done central i say central disc as i said in my hands i am good at transforamenal uh, if not experienced then go for interlaminar hard and cal calcified disc with osteophytes i always prefer interlaminar otherwise you break at least 2 to 3 instruments thank you so i welcome everyone to hyderabad in august so we have a advanced course in august so everyone are welcome to hyderabad where you can learn more about stenosis and fusion we are launching too many uh, uh, new tools and things uh, so we'll be showing how to do a transforaminal fusion interlaminar fusion and concepts of uh, stenosis surgery interlaminar approach and uh, transforaminal approach the practical tips how to remove the ligament what instruments to be used will be uh, uh, discussed and showed in live surgeries we will be operating around 12 surgeries during that time thank you good evening i am feeling bit sleepy because i couldn't get proper sleep yesterday anyway let us see uh, alpha s1 disc is always a difficult uh, uh, case for transforaminal approach so i will discuss in 10 minutes how we deal with the alpha s1 level of course the time is little short for this presentation because uh, we have to discuss the uh, three different approaches for alpha s1 each of which will take 20 minutes so when you progress you will face hurdles which is a sign of progress mm. so alpha s1 space has a unique obstructive anatomy so so for transforaminal approach this is because we have a crest which may come in the way especially in men ala of the sacrum the facet joint is very big at alpha s1 level compared to other levels and foramen height is very narrow so these are the problems at alpha s1 level and also we have a lordotic angle making your entry very steep and intervertebral space is narrower compared to other levels so transforaminal approach is not possible if the alpha s1 disc is deep seated and it carries a risk to the exiting route 
and sometimes if your angle is too much you will go and hit the s1 end plate causing bone damage and it is difficult to tackle up migrated herniation and in the end you will get irradiated more so the what are the options for l4 s1 disc we can do a suprailiac regular transforaminal approach or sometimes you may have to go for transiliac transforaminal approach and other option which is becoming very popular nowadays is full endoscopic interlaminar approach coming to suprailiac approach indication it is indicated in even if the iliac crest is high we can do in foraminal extraforaminal disc herniation some of the down migrator herniations which are paracentral this you can still manage with the suprailiac approach uh, what do you mean by high iliac crest if the in the lateral x-ray if the iliac crest is above the uh, end plate of l5 then you call it a high iliac crest coming to contraindication for regular transforaminal approach that is supra iliac approach if you have a central disc you can never reach because of the acute angle a dorsally migrated disc again you cannot approach and some of the up migrated herniations again you cannot do a regular transforaminal approach but this there are exceptions this is a patient who came came with a up migrated disc herniation similar to the case uh, operated just now so this is l5 s1 level up migrated herniation you can see that it is paracentral so it was still possible to do this supra iliac using the hook so we could take out the whole fragment in one piece and that is the post operative mri confirming complete removal of the fragment this is another patient again high iliac crest patient presented with severe l5 radiculopathy since 2 months if you see the mri there is a foraminal disc herniation and there is listesis at this level and this is the x ray you can see the high iliac crest listesis is stable so normally surgeons will go and do fusion for him which is absolutely not required he is symptomatic only for radiculopathy no back pain stable listesis so what you need to do is only decompression so this was possible in spite of high iliac crest we could manage to land the cannula in the foramen and uh, do this transforaminal approach so this was his gait you can see how severe the pain is this is because of compression of the dorsal root ganglion and he could not take even few steps without limping this is what happens when you have a foraminal disc extremely painful and they will have pain and dysesthesia even after surgery because of dorsal root ganglion irritation so we land directly on the fragment when you put the cannula you are on the fragment this is the beauty of foraminal disc herniation you are doing transforaminal approach you directly land on the fragment and take it out you see how big fragment is and once the fragment is out you can see the free floating dural sac as well as the decompressed root and you can see it is really pulsatile you can see the marked improvement in his gait after surgery and that is a post operative mri it is just fragmentectomy nothing else was done only the fragment was removed you can see the axial cut and patient had complete pain relief dysesthesia was there for 2 months and uh, which recovered and it is about 5 years and there was no more complaints from him he is not fused sometimes you may have to do foraminoplasty either a, a under uh, uh, outside in using uh, c arm or you can do a visualized foraminoplasty which will help in improving the access to the disc using a transforaminal suprailiac approach however in some cases uh, which i have mentioned as contraindication you cannot do a uh, trans foraminal approach by suprailiac uh, 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 region so in that case we may have to go for a transiliac approach which was described by dr said usman 
basically uh, embryologically ivlium develops from the same mesenchymal tissue as paraspinal muscles that's why this approach is possible indication you can tackle almost any disc herniation uh, including recurrent disc herniation sometimes we do endoscopic fusion with the a uh, transile like approach but it cannot tackle central canal stenosis you cannot remove the phlegm using this approach uh, if the surgeon is not experienced or if there is a development anomaly you cannot try this and in a dorsal migrated disc you cannot do a trans iliac approach steps steps are similar to your normal transforaminal approach nothing changes so entry point is 12 to 14 cm lateral to midline so we mark the ap and lateral lines so we don't consider the iliac crest is existent so we mark normally how you mark for l4 5 disc or l5 s1 disc for 5 s1 disc you take the ap and lateral line just like you mark normally so that is how you mark and you take the entry point so once you take the entry point we pass the needle when you pass the needle you hit the iliac crest so then you infiltrate with local anesthesia you can use either a, a, a trefine or a 11 gauge needle or k wire whatever so earlier we used to use k wire and used to use uh, scanlated reamers today we have this uh, uh, safe reamer system where you can pass a needle guide wire and uh, use manual reaming so the principle remains the same only the instruments are different so the target point is in the AP view is medial pedicle line, lateral view is posterior disc border. Nothing changes. It is just like regular transforaminal approach. There is no change. Only change is you are going through the iliac crest which comes in the way. Steps are exactly the same. Nothing changes. Your target point is the same. No change. Only thing is the crest which comes in the way is made bigger make a you make a hole and make it bigger so this how we may pass a k wire uh, this is what i used to use before nowadays we use uh, safe reamers once the wire is in proper place you just trim it 6 8 10 so 10 mm hole if you make in the crest it is good enough so once a uh, 10 mm hole is made in the iliac crest the rest of the steps are same like any other normal transforaminal surgery some important landmarks it is absolutely safe if you stick to the guidelines uh, one point of concern is superior gluteal neurovascular bundle which is about five centimeters below our track so there is enough space enough margin for error only thing is you should not venture venture anteriorly into the peritoneum that's all apart from that there is no risk so this is how the track looks like you can see the hole in the iliac crest and we have drilled a little bit of the ala of the sacrum and sometimes you can go through the uh, part of the facet to do for aminoplasty in one sitting so that's how it is approached <coughs> so so reaming can include the iliac crest ala of the sacrum and the facet so technical difficulties k were initial entry just like our needle entry this initial entry is most important if you target it properly then everything goes very smoothly no issues but most important is never go anterior or inferior where there is danger so I'll just show one video how it is done this is a patient who presented with again severe L5 radicular pain of three months duration you can see the uh, sequestrated disc fragment uh, up migrated disc herniation from L5 S1 level lying here it's up migrated disc lying in the axilla of L5 root so this was targeted with the trans approach this is the initial uh, sharp point which we use for uh, making the initial hole in the Iliac crest, then we pass the guide wire. This is a bead pin actually. So you can use any wire. Then we do serial reaming 6, 8, and 10 mm. This was done under epidural anesthesia so that 
you can see that this is very close to the root root is the exiting root comes here we are just below the root and it is quite safe because you are going from below upwards so final position of the dilator in the lateral view and ap view you can see it is in the foramen and you pass the cannula because it uh, it is up migrated you can never target with the supra iliac axis so it has to be trans iliac approach and this is what we see once we put the scope inside you are landing directly on the fragment because tra targeting is so precise you land on the fragment you don't go to the disk face at all you land on the fragment see here i am using a dissector to lift the exiting root which is at 3 o'clock position this is the exiting root you can see the fragments here this is the ligamentum phloem and here at 6 o'clock is the l5 body <coughs> so you can see it has he had multiple fragments this is the root here the disc is here this is the disc space this is the facet you can see i am again using the dissector to expose the fragments which are hidden in the axilla here this is the axilla of l5 root and again you have to use flexible graspers otherwise you cannot get access to this fragment you can see there are multiple fragments so just because one fragment is come out you it is not the end of the surgery this was a big fragment you can see the epidural bleed once it is cleared you still look for more fragments there may be small fragments inside you can see the exiting root very clearly you see there is a small debris. so that was the final fragment so just because one big fragment has come out it is not the end of surgery so this patient had so many loose fragments all of which were removed I think that was the last fragment which came out. And patient had complete relief of pain. Of course, these patients will have some dysesthesia for some time. Advantages of trans iliac approach, it is simple and safe provided you stick to the guidelines. Very, very versatile. You can approach almost any disc with the trans iliac approach. It is easy to target central upmigrated disc. Foraminoplasty is much easier. Limitations. There is one limitation in trans iliac approach is the cannula is fixed in a bony tunnel, so there is not much movement of cannula possible. So that's why your targeting has to be very precise. Your if your target is targeting is not proper, then you cannot change the angle unless you make the hole bigger. And there is little more bleeding and more operating time compared to a regular approach. So that's why today we are doing more interlaminar approaches to L5S1 space. 
indication you can do central paracentral up migrated down migrated recurrent disc herniation cauda equina all with interlaminar approach contraindication is extra foraminal disc herniations is a relative contraindication uh, it has solved almost uh, most of the issues with the other uh, the transforaminal approaches for l5s1 it is in fact less invasive than transforaminal approach simple quick and very effective this is because we have a wide interlaminar window at l5s1 level there is no bony obstacle in almost 90% of the cases unless there is the window is small you may have to do little bit of bone work but otherwise 90% of the cases zero bone work simple quick effective 10 minutes you can finish l5s1 level with one single radiation one shot is enough so this is a patient who came with the cauda equina syndrome patient had the urinary bowel bladder involvement since two days you can see the massive disc herniation almost entire disc is outside in the canal and uh, this was done with interlaminar approach you can see the flavum is open we have made a small cut in the flavum and you are directly on the disc fragment which is lying in the axilla of s1 root even this patient had uh, too many fragments so there are multiple pieces i will just uh, skip this long video i will just show the end point there are too many fragments and uh, you see this huge one and this is after discectomy and uh, you see the root and uh, the dural sac here so everything is decompressed and you see the opening in the flavum is only about 2 mm so that is the advantage of uh, interlaminar approach it is not like open surgery this is truly least invasive surgery for l5s1 this is a post operative mri all cauda equinus we do post op mri you can see complete excision of uh, all fragments patient had immediate recovery from cauda equina it's about 4 years and there is no complications so we thought we can finish uh, uh, all l5s1 problems with the, these three approaches but i was struck by this case this patient had severe l5 radiculopathy you can see the fragment here i did transiliac and suprailiac approaches i failed to remove the fragment patient has persistent pain even after surgery two of surgeries i had done for this patient and still with the fragment is not out so then we took the patient for a third mri scan so when we went for the scan we see the fragment here it is a very unusual site to find this fragment and when we went through the uh, mri sequences we found that this fragment is here and it is lateral to the exiting root so it is not in the foramen not in the canal it is outside and lateral to the exiting root here so we targeted here we took uh, a 4 mm incision i mean 4 cm from midline and a depth of about 8 cm so that's how it was targeted you see it is in the just lateral to the uh, pars and below the transverse process this is how it was targeted just para central i mean para spinal approach and this is the dilator position okay it is lateral to the exiting root you see the position of the canal this is the midline we have gone lateral to midline and this is the position of the canal and we landed on the fragment sorry so this is the fragment this here is the transverse process the bone which we see here is the transverse process the root is going here this way and the fragment is between the transverse process and the root this is a quite a big fragment that's why patient did not have any relief and it was quite a big fragment and that is the root you see the root is going there and that was the fragment and after the third surgery he was completely relieved and we did not do mri because he had enough mri <laughs> 
so he had some ehl weakness uh, which was there pre op and some disease pca which took about 3 months to recover and finally was fine so take home message alpha s1 can be sometimes be very challenging but interlaminar approach is uh, what we do nowadays very quick simple effective and avoids most of these uh, problems with the bony obstacles of course we can still do transforaminal approach for foraminal extraforaminal disc herniations but uh, sometimes transforaminal approach can be very difficult so but i suggest mastering all different techniques is very important because there may be a case where patient had previous open surgery where interlaminar approach is difficult then you can again do a transforaminal approach so any questions i will take thank you not little big it's quite big uh, it is quite big so it is much more invasive and we use the cannula to retract the root there is no separate root retractor we just put the cannula inside ret rotate it and retract the root probably we have a case tomorrow and we will show how minimally invasive it is i'm not saying you can't do see we are not against any open surgery you can do micro discectomy you can do laminectomy you can do distando but least invasive is interlaminar endoscopic approach there is no question about this yes again interlaminar approach if there is severe stenosis we can do multiple level decompression with the endoscopy no issues can you go contralateral side also if you want yes 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 today we will show you contralateral decompression severe l4 5 stenosis yes. we are doing contralateral decompression thank you with the 4.3 mm channel scope small incision 7 mm incision Thank you, Mahesh. Uh, next, I invite uh, Dr. Ankit Madaria to give his talk on foraminoplasty. Ankit is uh, like Virendra Sehwag of India. Yeah, he is is uh, the youngest and the most brilliant surgeon. And uh, what he has done in very few years is uh, is commendable. So, his videos, his technique is uh, we appreciate his uh, his work, and uh, and I'm sure that uh, you'll definitely you'll notice the difference. Thank you so much for your kind words.
good evening everybody i think everyone's getting tired so i'll keep it very simple and i just try to simplify whatever you have seen today and i'll try to convey my message in as as simple way as possible so basically what do you understand by foraminoplasty it's a transforaminal endoscopic spine surgery which is aimed at decompression of neural structures for the treatment of foraminal and lateral stenosis uh, if you look at this animation as the patient ages the disc height reduces and this leads to many osteophyte formation around the end plates and also around the articular uh, joint uh, superior articular process and inferior articular process and this causes impingement hello can you hear me okay so basically basically there's a i'll i'll point it over here okay, it's okay it's okay so basically there is a, a compression of exiting nerve root at the tip of superior articular process as the superior articular process rides upwards so we can understand it better by uh, seeing this picture in which you can see that uh, the tip of superior articular process with ligamentum flavum over the tip of it is compressing the exiting nerve root and the nerve root has no place to go because it is bound anteriorly by the vertebral body superiorly by the pedicle arch and also we can have a disc bulge which could be causing uh, compression from the inferior side so this is basically foraminal stenosis and foraminoplasty aims at decompressing the exiting nerve root at this foramen so for understanding foraminoplasty we need to uh, know a technique which is called as foraminotomy but many people confuse these two terms foraminotomy basically means just to open up the foramen to reach far off or difficult to reach targets but foraminoplasty is, uh, involves foraminotomy plus decompression of nerve structures so what does foraminotomy look like it looks like landing at the foramen and using your various mechanical tools like burrs curettes to take off this part of pinching bone from the foramen and decompressing the uh, exiting root while protecting the exiting root using your cannula so this is what basically foraminotomy means if you remove the ligamentum flavum from this foramen it means foraminoplasty so basically uh, you can remove the superior articular process up to the base and all up to the articular surface and it is very safe to remove such large part of superior articular process without causing any instability so basically indications of foraminotomy are just to improve your access to migrated or central disc fragments but foraminoplasty involves decompression of exiting root or traversing root basically in the form of foraminal stenosis or lateral stenosis so what are the various techniques of doing foraminotomy the simplest way is to use trephines which dr janvejay would show us in his presentation i think because he is very good at using trephines and uh, so i have seen him using basically what you do is you uh, dock and use your hammer to trephine out the uh, outer part of superior articular process but this is a blind technique so this can be dangerous in uh, hands which are not which are new to this technique second is outside in technique in which you use a tom shady needle and manual reamers uh, i'll play this video to show you the technique okay so basically in outside in technique you land at the superior articular process tip insert your tom shady needle under fluoroscopic guidance and then after hammering it you start with serial reaming to dilate that area after your needle has reached your entry uh, access desired point you change it with a guide wire okay is it it's playing again and again okay okay i'll move to the next slide and uh, the third form is motorized endoscopic burr which is our treatment of choice because in this you can see uh, we can do all those bone removal by visualization and basically these are two types one is straight burrs that you saw in the morning that dr sukumar was doing he was using a uh, straight burr 
putting it targeted at the bone and using his hand to angulate it. So this is the burr that was designed by Dr. Mahesha and we use it very commonly. It, that can be used with any normal orthopedic drill. You don't need to buy any expensive drill to use this burr. And you can use it to chop off the tip of superior articular process. And this is very fast technique to remove bone. And it is also very safe. The other technique is articulated burr in which we land at superior articular process and uh, under visualization we use a bendable burr. Basically bendable burr means you can use it straight and you can use it also in a bended form. So in when we land we s can start burring at the t junction of pedicle and superior articular process but as we go ahead you can see the burr will just go inside into a disc and not reach our target. So articulated burr are very useful to reach targeted areas to remove the bone where you need to reach it. And this is our preferred mode of decompression when we need to do, uh, remove a low migrated or down migrated disc herniations. So basically after you have done your foraminotomy, you can just remove the ligamentum flavum. And I'll go straight ahead to a case example to show you better how I remove ligamentum frame from the tip of superior articular process. So in this case, patient was having back, uh, only left leg pain since two years and she was not getting diagnosed why she having leg pain. So if we look at her MRI closely, we can see that she had a foraminal up-migrated disc with a tip of superior articular process impinging on uh, uh, the exiting nerve root. So my plan was to do a left transforaminal endoscopic foraminoplasty and decompress only that exiting root with removal of that up-migrated disc herniation that was pushing the nerve root much more dorsally. So basically it is a similar case like the I have shown in the photo which are disc on the anterior side with uh, upriding of superior articular process with the ligamentum flavum. So in this surgery, you can see this is the foraminal ligament that someone was asking what is its role. And this we have landed just at the foramen in the disc and this, cr this cranial, this is caudal. And as I turn towards the cranial side, you can see exiting nerve root, which is being pushed dorsally by an up-migrated disc herniation over here. So this was the one cause of her leg pain. So as we, as I saw that disc herniation, I used my annular cutter to loosen that disc amount and basically removal does not always means just you take out the fragment. It also involves because it's a chronic case it will be hard collagenized structures. So you have to remove entire annulus with the fragment and you need to use various mechanical tools to achieve those objectives. So initially while working you should always work underneath the exiting nerve root to decompress. This is a left articulating curette where I'm using it to detach the annulus from the uh, superior surface of the vertebral body, from the posterior surface of the vertebral body, superior vertebral. And this is very helpful and atraumatic way to remove those disc herniations. As you can see, multiple fragments are coming out and it is hard and collagenized because it's a chronic condition. It's a two year old case. After I'm satisfied with my anterior work, I'm going to target this tip now. As you can see, this is the exiting root and this is tip of superior articular process which is compressing this exiting root. So I am reaching this tip and you can see how much plastered this root is over here. So what I am doing right now is putting my left, uh, left, uh, sorry, curette over here and creating a space between exiting root and the tip of superior articular process. And I use this curette very commonly to remove this ligamentum flavum as well as tip of uh, superior article process to decompress this nerve root. And as you can see, this is very simple and atraumatic procedure. You don't need complicated annular cutters or different dangerous instrument to reach here. And just a to and fro movement of this curette can easily remove so much soft tissue and bone in one go from the tip of superior article process. As we decompress this uh, area, there are some more osteophytes on the superior surface which needs to be removed. So this is the in, uh, in IAP, uh, the, the roof of foramen, which is where we can see osteophytes which were compressing this exiting nerve root. So 
because this simple one curate can do all of these work. After you have done that, you can again come to the disk and do your debulking so that there are no residual fragments to prevent reherniations. And as you can see, there are so many loose fragments still there. And after all disk has been removed, this was the part after complete debulking. You can see this is the this was where the disk foundation was there, and this was the region where the tip of SAP was compressing it. And this is the superior part. So we can do all three side decompression by just one curette and some graspers. So this is this was a uh, video to show you how easy foraminoplasty is and is not very complicated, not very complex, and you don't need to be very worried about going. You just need to go to the nerve and remove all the tissue from there. It is a safe plane to work close to the nerve and then move everything away from there. Another example in which uh, there was a bulging disc with foraminal uh, ligamentum flavum hypertrophy on the underside of the facets. So I plan to remove disc from uh, transforaminal root, but after the removal of disc, Although the traversing route was decompressed, I was not happy with what looked like in this region. So we did a complete removal of the superior articular process along with the facet, uh, uh, along with the ligamentum flavum, and this is the final picture. So basically, foraminoplasty does not mean only exiting route; it also involves the traversing route, and you can use the same curette to do all these work. And uh, Basically, landing is the key, and uh, exiting route should always be protected with an operating cannula, and short, uh, soft tissue decompression should be done strictly under vision. And if you can follow these guidelines, it is uh, quite easy to do a foraminoplasty by a visualized method. Thank you so much. Sir. I tried to keep it uh, uh, short because we were already running, running late, so I deleted some of my slides now. And this is our day one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So nice talk, uh, Ankit. Uh, any questions? Uh, these surgeries, they look, uh, of course, they are time consuming. But then uh, with practice, it's uh, possible to cut down the time. But uh, it's not as simple as uh, what Ankit has shown. It takes time to learn this. So initially, discectum itself looks like a big procedure when you start doing uh, endoscopy. Uh, then doing these procedures again is an extension of uh, doing discectomy, but then it's not it's it's not that it's impossible. Definitely, it can be learnt, and uh, but it requires a lot of focus and dedication. That's what uh, endoscopy is all about. So I invite Dr. Ajay Ikde to please come out to the stage to felicitate Dr. Ankit. Dr. Ajay Gde is the most popular orthopedic surgeon in Mysore. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I call upon Dr. Janmajay to give his talk on canal stenosis management, tra management by transfer of root. Again, Dr. Janmajay is from uh, Jabalpur, and uh, he has done good work in uh, canal stenosis treating canal stenosis by uh, endosc transformal endoscopy. Most of his work on the, is on the upper zone, middle zone, and lower zone as well. Dr. Mayusha is in the OT. Dr. Mayusha and Dr. Girish, they are getting ready for the next case, which is a, a recurrent L5-S1 disc. So they are trying to do it by transformal route. And after that, we have one more L4-5, L5-S1 interlaminar. Uh, the thing is, now, whoever is interested to watch, they can continue to stay here. And uh, those who got some any other commitments, they can take leave and join us tomorrow. We have one more talk to go after this. Uh, thank you, Ravindra sir and uh, Mission Spine, and of course, uh, our Guruji, uh, Gore sir, for uh, giving me the opportunity to present my work. So I'll try to make it short. 
so the objectives of my presentation will be uh, to tell you how to decompress the lower zone which is basically the lateral recess uh, stenosis under local anesthesia using a full endoscopic approach uh, points that you need to remember during uh, this talk is that uh, the significant pathology is seen mostly in the lower lumbar region at L4-5 and L5-S1 uh, particularly because the lateral recess is uh, particularly well developed at L4-5, not so much at L5-S1 and L3-4 but still sometimes you do get those cases and frequently there is a small overhang of the disc bulging into the lower zone. So, uh, there is an annular pouch coming onto the lower vertebral body posteriorly from the annulus. Uh, the roof of the lower zone corresponds with the lower pole of the facet joint and our access to this area is hindered by the superior pedicle and the superior articular process uh, because of the small superior vertebral notch. And also this area contains most of the veins for this particular segment. Uh, Gore sir has already talked about this that the traversing nerve uh, in this region is fixed so by fixed what we mean is that the intrathecal nerve roots are mobile they can move around they can be pushed and uh, retracted or whatever but the traversing nerve because it is going out through the foramen so it is not that mobile as as are the intrathecal nerve roots uh, the lie of the facets also uh, gore sir had discussed so uh, sagittal facets will uh, more likely lead to uh, lateral recess stenosis Whereas uh, coronal, sorry, uh, sagittal facets will more likely lead to lysthesis and foraminal stenosis, whereas coronal facets will lead to a lateral recess stenosis. And it also dictates how much bony work we need to do uh, when we access this area. And the axilla of, of the nerve, traversing nerve axilla moves higher with respect to uh, the disc from cranial to caudal. So at L5 S1 disc space, usually the S1 nerve is completely separate from the dura even before even uh, cranial to the disc whereas at l34 the nerve takeoff is usually lower than the disc space our targets and patholo uh, or pathologies that we need to target are the ligamentum flavum mainly over the anterior and medial surface of the superior articular process or the uh, medial facet line and also that bulge that i just talked about into the lower zone uh, you may also have uh, synovial cysts in, these, uh, in this region. So the victim is always the traversing nerve. Sometimes if uh, there is enough of uh, uh, pathology there, amount of pathology, then the whole corda equina can also get uh, affected. And the medial or the inferior descending facet is hardly ever a cause of compression in these cases. Uh, I'll skip this slide because we know about the ligamentum flavum anatomy. So with regards to interlaminar versus uh, transforaminal approach, a few points I would like to present before you. So the traditional approach removes posterior ligamentum flavum near the midline mainly and not it doesn't go into the foramen because if you want to really decompress the foramen then you have to uh, get rid of the pars. You have to uh, get through the pars to be able to access that area. Uh, and often you can actually uh, miss out on uh, the pathology on the actual pathology in the lateral recess if you don't go lateral enough into the lateral uh, recess which is in the lower zone below the disc level and of course traditional approach uh, if you are doing uh, a open surgery then it obviously removes a large part of non offending bone for access which may also lead to instability Whereas transforaminal access can decompress the lateral recess from ventral, lateral as well as dorsal aspect. So or from 270 degrees except the medial aspect which is the uh, thecal sac. So when we are uh, going to land for uh, lower zone stenosis surgery, then we need to make sure that our targeting is uh, tailored to it. So we need to uh, take a slightly more superior skin entry and go uh, take a caudal trajectory so that our basic direction is towards the lower zone. And I will show it to you in the images. And you also need to be as uh, flat as possible. 
So you have to go in grazing the facet because that is where most of the work will be. So the landing point is posterior annulus towards the lower end plate or caudal end plate and as far as possible try to be medial to the pedicle. It may not be always possible but try to be. And ideal positioning of the bevel may uh, require you to undercut the SAP or shave the under surface of the SAP which I will show you in some of my videos. Uh, and sometimes the pedicle sh uh, superior border of the pedicle may also have to be shaved. So you will be enlarging the superior vertebral notch in order to access that lateral recess. So I hope you can see the ne ideal needle positioning for a lower zone stenosis surgery. You can see that my needle is uh, so you can see that my needle is needle tip is almost at the midline, and it is not too much inside the disc. It is in the posterior one fifth of the disc. So we are fairly flat. And uh, before I show you uh, a few cases, you need to recognize the signs of adequate decompression. So m the most important which of which is a free pulsation of the nerve. The nerve should be really able to flop up and down once you have, once you are finished with the surgery. If you have any doubt, then you should uh, look further. If there is any more, maybe there is a more annular bulge, or maybe you have left a little more of the ligamentum flavum uh, in the roof. Uh, secondly, you can also look at the filling and emptying of blood vessels uh, on the nerve or dura. When you raise the water pressure by stopping the water egress, then the blood vessels will empty and as soon as you leave, uh, let the water come out, the pressure drops and the blood vessels will start filling. You will also start having a lot of oozing once uh, you are done. And depending on all these things, you may even consider skipping dorsal decompression altogether. So I'll start with my first uh, representative case. Okay, so this was a 60-year-old female with the right L5-S1 claudication for the last three years. She did not have any bowel or bladder symptoms and no neurological deficit. Uh, and she had claudication in the right S1 dermatome. So looking at the scan, you can make out that she has a pretty much a global sort of stenosis uh, going from right to left. You can see that there is a lot of upper zone stenosis. Uh, you can see this. You can't. You can hardly see that tear, the teardrop of the fat over here. So the exiting nerve is compressed over here. Then, uh, as you go in further, the disc, the disc space is uh, com very much collapsed. And as you go in further, you can also make out all this ligamentum flavum, and the SAP tip is also overriding into the uh, into the foramen. And also the there is a lot of disc bulge. There is this annular uh, pouch that we talked about going caudally and of course all this ligamentum flavum. Uh, likewise in the axial images you can see that in the upper zone where the exiting nerve is supposed to be seen clearly you can hardly make out because uh, there is so much of stenosis over here and immediately in the next cut uh, axial cut below it uh, there is a lot of tissue over here. So what the G naught that uh, Goreser was talking about. 
and then of course all this lateral uh, recess ligamentum flavum as well so all of these things she has a fair bit of left sided uh, uh, compression also but obviously the right sided problems are more and she was not symptomatic for the left side so this is the initial cannula position i would uh, like to bring your attention to the fact uh, that how how uh, flat our positioning is so we are half in half out on a lateral view which means we half of the bevel is inside the disc and half of it is outside the disc and on uh, an on an ap we are inside the medial pedicle line so this is how you need to position your cannula to be able to work on the middle zone lower zone and as well as the upper zone so just to orient you we are going in from the uh, right side so just raise your right hand the, your thumb becomes the exiting nerve and your index finger becomes the traversing nerve so and upwards is 12 uh, o'clock is dorsal 6 o'clock is ventral left side is caudal right side is cranial so this was the initial image you can see the sap over here and i immediately started undercutting the sap uh, i'm doing it with a guj uh, at the time that I, i had made this video so i used to i used to use the guj more than a drill i also have another video using the drill and i all use the cannula bevel the edge of the cannula to dissect whatever i have uh, broken off whatever bone i have broken off away from the tissue so my uh, the cannula that i use is a little stronger so i don't mind pushing it in uh, without the dilator you can see i am shaving off the under surface of the sap the tip as well as uh, the tip is on the this is the cranial aspect the right side so the tip is over here the base is over here and the body is over here so now i am dissecting the whatever bone i have separated uh, and along with the ligamentum flavum attached to it away from the sap under surface now this is the use of the curette uh, it has to be used in a particular way only otherwise if you engage too much bone it will not turn and if you don't engage enough bone then it won't shave that tissue off the bone so using the curette is a little bit tricky but it comes with time and then i was clearing the sub annular all that annular bulge going into the lower zone uh and as i wanted to see the the neural tissue so i couldn't see it so i had to shave a little bit more of the sap this is towards the base so this is where we will be seeing the uh, lower zone or the lateral recess stenosis that that is our target for the lateral recess stenosis and so the flatter i get the more subannular disc material i can access and that's why uh, i can get more and more of that disc material out but now i have started seeing that plane between the ligamentum flavum and the annulus and there's dural tissue just uh, between them see this is the dura this is the dura over here this is the traversing nerve now we want to remove the ligamentum flavum from the dorsal lateral aspect of the traversing nerve and here you have this superior foraminal ligament coming outwards now i am creating this plane between the ligamentum flavum 
and the SAP. Uh, here you can appreciate very well uh, how I am taking out that uh, annular pouch at, uh, which goes into the lower zone. This is the annulus and this is the pouch going into the lower zone. So I have dissected it away. I have uh, freed it from its, uh, the annulus from its attachment to the vertebra and the whole thing has uh, come out. So the ventral tissue is completely freed. And now using the hook, I am dissecting the ligamentum flavum from the under surface of the lamina. So we have gone now towards the central ligamentum flavum. So this is uh, posterior to the dura. All this ligamentum flavum is coming out from the, from behind the dura. But I was finding it difficult, so I did a little more undercutting of the SAP. So once you've got rid of the bone, now you can see that all that ligamentum flavum which is uh, compressing the dura clearly. And you just need to use uh, curettes and hooks to get rid of that tissue. So you have to be very careful creating a plane between the ligamentum and the dura because in such chronic cases there can always be adhesions. So out comes that whole chunk of uh, ligamentum flavum. So this was the final result. You can see the, the dorsal surface of the dura and the traversing nerve as well as the dura flopping. And this is the post-op MRI. You can you have started seeing the uh, teardrop appearance now. You can see how much of the SAP we have drilled. And this is the post-op axial MRI. So compared to the pre-op, you can see how much of a difference it has made. And we've been able to access all of that dorsal ligamentum flavum in the lateral recess. Uh, is there time for another case or should I? Yeah. So another case uh, of a 63 year old male with severe left lower limb claudication for the last six months. Uh, he had S1 dermatome symptoms and no neurological deficit. So at first glance you might not see uh, the pathology but uh, look closely and you will see that there is a synovial cyst over here. And it is just about visible. Uh, this is the synovial cyst. It is better visible on the axial scan. So it's not, it's not a very big uh, synovial cyst, but unfortunately it is in the exact spa same spot where the traversing nerve lies. And because it is not mobile, so it, it is getting compressed terribly. And this was our uh, initial position. So we are half in, half out on lateral, but on the, on the AP we are very much close to the midline. So this is the initial, 
डबल क्लिक कर दूँ सो दिस वॉज द इनिशियल व्यू अगेन वी वी नीड टू वर्क एट द जंक्शन बिटवीन द पेडिकल एंड द एस ए पी वेर दे बोथ ज्वाइन दैट इज द कॉर्नर वी नीड टू एक्सपैंड द सुपीरियर वर्टिब्रल नॉच सो दैट वी कैन लुक थ्रू इट इन टू द लोअर जोन and this is exactly what's happening so we are on the left side raise your left hand the exiting nerve is towards the left so left is cranial this is caudal and we are working on the caudal part of the sap or the base of the sap and where it uh, con uh, continues into the superior border of the pedicle and we are making enlarging that superior uh, vertebral notch so i use a cutting bar uh my experience is that the because the tip of the cutting bar is atraumatic it doesn't have uh, serrations at the tip it only has serrations on the sides plus uh the sap that you are drilling on its inner surface it has ligamentum flavum so uh i feel it is not it 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 is not very easy to uh, accidentally go in and damage the traversing nerve because there is a curtain of ligamentum flavum which is protecting your uh, neural structures from the drill and anyway the drill is not going to cut at its tip but definitely you should be careful if you are using it near the exiting nerve because the exiting nerve is towards the side so that you can damage but traversing nerve very unlikely so you can see that we've created enlarged that superior vertebral notch this is the inner surface inner border of the sap and we've uh, drilled it this is towards the base this is towards the base and you can uh, appreciate where exactly we are working so at the inner surface of the uh, lower sap lower part of the sap then all this ligamentum flavum uh, had to be removed in order to get to the uh, synovial cyst and uh, initially it was it was difficult to recognize the neural structures because the nerve was so thinned out so it is important to go slow here i don't usually operate this fast i have sp uh, sped up the video so that we can finish earlier so you can see i'm uh, using the curette to uh get under the see where i have reached so i can uh, you can see my curette has gone behind the uh, s1 vertebral body also made a little space under the traversing nerve so that uh, i have some space to work over there on the right side you can see the so again you are supposed to enlarge the superior vertebral notch and through it you can you uh, see that is your window to see into the lower zone all this is the ligamentum flavum so once you've dissected that now you can start seeing the neural structures you can see the nerve clearly and it is severely compressed by the synovial cyst just above it this is the synovial cyst this is the uh, traversing nerve
so i have drilled off a small few 3 or 4 millimeters of the sap tip in order to be able to access uh, the structures adequately you can see the synovial cyst over here and the traversing nerve under it so this is the ligamentum flavum that i am removing so that i can access the synovial cyst you know it's coming out and it was very vascular uh, probably there was and finally we are able to get rid of the we brought it out and now with the hook we can dissect it completely from the crossing nerve and bring it out you can see all that uh, inflammatory tissue chronic granule now looking for some any remnants you can see we are behind the nerve and we can move the hook around just to make sure that there is nothing else remaining over there so there was a little bit remaining cranially and that part was also removed now we have a completely free traversing our vendura so i'll just show you the okay i think i've misplaced the post op so thank you any questions nice presentation very nice dissection thank this you this is my area of interest um <coughs> this is a question uh with myself as well because we are going uh like i also described sap syndrome in the morning and we are dealing with extra foraminally i was going through a presentation of a very senior uh, i forgot his name a very senior doctor from korea and uh, the point that he made in such cases is wh where we say sap syndrome is that uh, and particularly at l45 and l5 s1 is that when we are doing it from outside and given the structure of the sap which is going like this so what's happening the compression is mostly on the inside not on the outside but to have an approach of inside you have to go from outside so and and the reason why this was happening is not bone elongation which is happening it's a bone which is sagging up right or rather the upper part could coming down because of reduced okay, disc height or so weak muscles so the point he made is that better you yeah. go interlaminar and you only yeah, do you can go even more millimeter. Lateral, but i will accept yeah. this can you because i need to can you some mute the other also. yeah so they said that you just drill about 3 millimeters from inside because the nerve is going oblique otherwise if you do it from outside further sagging will happen in the future 
and now the nerve can actually get trapped outside, far outside, between the transverse process and uh, particularly at L5S1. So, have so you seen this in your cases? Uh, transverse process is in a different plane. It's it's dorsal to all. The only thing I that is I in the relation. To yeah, the I, I can share that presentation because I have a downloaded video from YouTube. Okay, but uh, uh, but for all of us to know that, uh, and this guy is like. I think now 70 years old, who had been doing endoscopy for a long time. And um, when an old man says, you need to hear, because they had a lifetime of experience, just that I'm saying. Um, but he had a very strong point to make, that particularly in lower area. Um, I guess uh, if the disc has not collapsed enough, and if you go into the disc unnecessarily and uh, take out those fragments, if the other side is free, then you are already going to free up this foramen. So even if you are done, uh, once you've finished your work, this foramen is going to be completely wide open. So I don't think any amount of uh, disc collapse will further cause uh, foraminal stenosis later on. And uh, I'm not sure it, it would be the transverse process because that is Maybe in a separate plane. Yeah. But uh, particularly at L5S1, the foramen has got a lot of structures around. So we are already drilling the SAP tip and uh, yeah. there is, o I mean, there is only so much SAP there, so well once... Th so that's the reason that since the SAP is so much, it can sag and again compress after some time. If the disc collapses yeah. more, yeah. yes. But when you have, when you've been into the foramen, usually you have done enough work on the SAP that not so much of it remains to be able to compress it, even if the disc collapses substantially more than what it has until the point of your surgery. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, now what uh, MRS you had, uh, you had shown. So there will be a doubt or uh, maybe a plan in many people's mind that uh, why the hell you want to do all that? Just put some screws and fuse it. So did it occur to you any time post-operatively or otherwise that uh, you know, why I'm taking so much of time or I don't know the, how the outcome will be. And, uh, you know, the patient will come back with pain. He's going to screw my happiness. So why I do all this? Just straight away put some screws and fuse it. No, it, it just, uh, I mean, putting in screws at that age is uh, still, it, it's not an easy task anyway. And it's not good for the patient. So for a 60-year-old who is, who uh, I haven't mentioned, but I suppose she must have had some comorbidities and, putting her under GA, I'm sure it is uh, definitely preferable to avoid all that and if you can do under local and without fixing that segment, I think it is much better for the patient. It's always, uh, is, uh, you know, whenever I see such patients in the OPDs, most of the patients who are elderly, they are okay with pain relief. They may not be asking for a complete 100% pain relief. They say, okay, I, if, uh, if you give me a pain relief of uh, where I can do my activities of daily living, that is good enough. No, when you look at that aspect of it, then definitely these surgeries will work out because uh, you're doing with minimal invasive under local anesthesia and uh, you give a uh, good relief of pain to those patients to do their activities. And this is these are repeatable also. Whereas uh, fusion is something, as you said, with the comorbidities, the risk is more. And again, um, with some complication, and that's the end stage, like a joint replacement, that's an end stage. So these procedures give you that leverage, initially at least. You know, you can give some pain relief to the patient. And if things don't work out, there's all fusion is always there. Well, I have one and more I'm point right. to add. So one patient came, I didn't find MRI, otherwise I wanted to include that in my presentation. Uh, a neighboring country's president's sister, wheelchair bound because not able to walk plus severe pain. I saw the MRI, severe canal stenosis in L45. So, and that was going all the way up and then uh, had a facetal hypertrophy also. So I said I'll do two sittings, one this side and one other side because it takes time. And uh, I decompress on one side, but I was able to go till the midline, dorsal thecal sac after removing the superior articular process. To our surprise, the patient was walking next morning and she didn't require second surgery. So even the other side symptoms were gone. So it, it's a very nice technique. I think we should have a good Indian data so that we can counter this entire surgery of doing full laminectomy, full ligamentum, flavectomy, and fusion. Yeah. So I think the reason why that happens is because uh, 
such as when you operate for cervical myelopathy the cord moves uh, backwards okay so it gets away from the compressive element so likewise here you decompress from one side the thecal sac moves towards the decompressed side so the other side also gets indirectly decompressed that is one of the probable causes why that works out and also i have uh, seen a few cases where I even like you said uh, i could uh, access the uh, opposite ligamentum flavum although maybe not work uh, onto it but uh, especially when the, uh, the the facets are not very wide you can actually uh, access the opposite side dorsally i think dr shiraj is coming up with another uh, endoscope which is 3.2 millimeters so then for such cases yeah not for such cases but i am thinking that once we have done the decompression initial and we have a space we can go opposite side because dura can be compressed there then we use a thinner endoscope and then and it has got work. a working channel so we can treat the other side also we can see that thank you thank you uh, thank you thank, thank you janmaj i request uh, dr ajay krishnan to hand over a momento We have one last talk, uh, facerogenic pain and the role of RF in uh, relieving the pain. Uh, the surgery is already ready, they put already put the needle in, so we'll finish quick with this talk and then go to the surgery, okay? Uh, lumbar facet joint pain and role of radio frequency neurotomy. If you see here, uh, the articular <coughs> surface of the facet joint consists of an hyaline cartilage, synovial membrane, and the capsule. This capsule and the synovial membrane is highly innervated by the nociceptor, encapsulated, and free nerve ending fibers. And the volume of this facet joint is like 1 to 1.5 ml. So whenever we do an intra-articular facet joint injection, we should not cross the volume of 1.5 ml because it will cause capsular rupture, which can reduce the efficacy of the results. So the boundaries, as we discussed, the anterior border of the facet joint has been formed by the ligamentum flavum. Posterior surface is covered by the uh, multifidus muscle. With regards to the axial morphology, we call it as face, uh, facet trophism whenever there is an asymmetry between the right and left facet joint angles and this is most commonly observed in the spondylosis where there is more uh, angulation of one sagittal uh, angulation of one facet joint angle when compared to the other and uh, this is a hand drawn diagram explaining the innervation here you can see the transverse process and the superior as uh, articular process and the spinal nerve, as it comes out uh, through the intervertebral foramen, it divides into dorsal and the ventral ramus. The dorsal ramus in turn divides into three branches, medial branch, intermediate and lateral branch. This medial branch just passes at the neck of junction of uh, superior articular process and the transverse process. And as it goes down, it goes beneath the mammalo axillary ligament, which is fixing the nerve there. And as it passes beneath the mammalo axillary ligament, it innervates the facet joint, the lower portion of the facet joint at that particular level. And then the branch further proceeds down to innervate the interspinous ligament, interspinous muscle. And it also gives a branch to a multifidus and the upper portion of the inferior facet. But this is something uh, different when we uh, see the innervation of the L5-S1 facet joint where the medial branch is just 
branches out from the dorsal ramus just near the facet joint here we could see that dorsal ramus is uh, like quite lengthy and uh, we do have an intermediate branch and there is no later branch for the l5 dorsal ramus and the most common etiology of this uh, facet joint is that uh, it is the, the degenerative process disc degeneration spondylolisthesis i'm sorry couldn't play the video and uh, inflammatory conditions like uh, rheumatoid arthritis ankylosing spondylitis post laminectomy or post fusion surgery so this is an important thing the clinical approach to diagnose a lumbar facet pain so i'll be discussing four papers where the prevalence uh, among the younger individual is 4.8 whereas among the older age above 60 is 50 there is a disparity in diagnosis because of the absence of clinical reference standard and uh, non reliability of imaging and besides the physical tests which we do perform uh, for diagnosing the facet pain also stresses multiple structures so this is the basically the pain will be in the paraaxial and in the axial region but it tends to extend to the lumbar gluteal posterior thigh and that is because of the sensitization of the nociceptors and uh, i just want to uh, show this image uh, from the uh, uh, <coughs> et al here you can see that the facet degeneration in the early 20s is like less than 5 percentage but as the age grows up the facet degeneration is almost like 80 percentage but they are the abnormal findings but those 80 percentage of the patients are completely pain free healthy subjects so to diagnose this facet joint arthropathy initially a paper was been published in neurochirurgia from the european uh, group where they set six diagnostic uh, criteria so three symptoms and three signs where the symptoms include unilateral or bilateral axial lumbar pain improves or elevated with rest absence of radicular pattern and signs included chem test lumbar facet strain and induced pain in the articular or transverse apophysis so lumbar facet sign is like like voluntarily passive um, lifting of the leg is done and suddenly you drop the leg but not to the ground at least to 20 degree and when this motion produces a pain then it is called as a lumbar facet sign positive chem test is ipsilateral rotation and uh, extension do provokes uh, pain that is chem sign so and uh, the evolution of uh, producing a diagnostic block in the uh, diagnosis of uh, facet joint pain has been given by these two papers so what is the evidence of diagnostic accuracy and value of non-interventional method in diagnosis of facet joint pain and this has been answered here so the reliability of the history and physical examination in detecting the source of pain is less certain and imaging it's not very useful in identifying the facet pain so next one can history and physical examination can be used to identify a painful facet joint or to select people for prognostic blocks so this paper says that the combination of symptomatology physical examination and confirmation by diagnostic block where we get a relief of more than 50 percentage can only be said as a facet joint pain positive <coughs> so this is the practice algorithm where we have three major criteria tenderness overlying the facet joint referral leg pain limited to above the knee and pain worsened with extension flexion or rotation towards the ipsilateral side these are considered to be the uh, signs positive of facet complaints and once you get a diagnostic block more than 50 percentage uh, pain reduction we can go for radiofrequency neurotomy uh, <coughs> for further management so if a patient has been diagnosed as a facet joint uh, pain we do have three different options the first one is radio frequency neurotomy of the medial branch second is facet joint intraarticular injection third is endoscopic denervation of the facet joint irrespective of the procedure we do position the patient with the bolster, su bolster support the prone position so with this we have um, this bolster used to nullify the lumbar lordosis and it also decreases the abdominal pressure and uh, this is the ap view here you can see the uh, <coughs> medial branch orientation and uh, as we can see a true ap view we cannot identify the facet joints and uh, once we take an ipsilateral oblique view we can see the facet joint being opened up here you can see the facet joint and uh, this is the point at <coughs> at which we can do the radio frequency ablation or intra articular uh, 
facet joint injection or we can also do an endoscopic denervation. So this is a, a diagnostic facet median branch block where we take an oblique of 15 to 20 degree. Here you can see the curvature where the median branch lies. We keep the pointer and uh, on uh, end on view we um, go with the 22 gauge spinal needle. So we take an AP view. Here you can see exactly the needle tip is at the junction of the base of the superior articular process and the transverse process. Confirm it in the <coughs> uh, lateral view and you can give 0.5 ml of 2% lignocaine for the diagnostic test. And uh, this is an image showing I have done this case for a patient with rheumatoid arthritis with pacemaker. It was a relative contraindication but uh, since the patient was on pacemaker I just gave an intraarticular steroid uh, injection in the facet joint. So <coughs> when we compare both uh, this intraarticular steroid injection and the uh, medial branch uh, radio frequency ablation, the duration of pain relief uh, with respect to the radio frequency ablation is more. But when we give intraarticular steroid injection, as the degenerative process worsens, we usually get a grading of two to three. There is a narrowing of the joint space and which has further been compromised by the uh, osteophytes. <coughs> the thing is already the joint space is like 1 to 1 1.5 ml and if we get further narrowing the amount of therapeutic drug that we are going to inject uh, will be like less than 0.5 ml so the duration and the efficacy of that uh, intraarticular injection is reduced. So RF technical consideration. So RF is the process by which when you give electricity it causes isolation of the ions and this isolation produces a friction and this friction is going to produce a heat energy and it, going and it is going to cause thermocoagulation. And the lesion is being produced in an elect elliptical manner. <coughs> Sorry. The lesion is usually parallel to the electrode and it is not over the tip of the electrode. So here you can see the dissection. Here uh, you can see the L5 superior articular process and the transverse process and this is the mammillo axillary ligament. Here we have three branches of the L5 dorsal ramus, medial branch, intermediate branch and the lateral branch. Now the main hindrance for doing the radio frequency ablation is the mammillo axillary ligament because when you keep the needle there and when you do an RF the nerves will not be ablated properly. So our main point is that we have to target the nerve in this region so that the duration of the pain relief that we get secondary to the RF ablation will be like for more than two years. So ideally we keep the needle as uh, proximal as possible so that the entire medial branch could be ablated. So this is just an oblique view. Here you can see the course of the median branch and this is the mammillo axillary ligament and this is the accessible segment of the nerve and I have to keep my electrode here so that I am going to destroy the nerve uh, to give a good uh, result. And uh, this is the lateral view where I will be targeting this region. So one most important point, uh, the needle should be kept in the near parallel uh, region to the nerve and not completely parallel to the nerve because we can miss the chance of ablation and even perpendicular the uh, doing a lesion perpendicular to the nerve also uh, causes uh, less chance of ablation. So the ideal position of the needle should be in a crossed way which I can show you in my patients so, so that you can ablate the entire length of the medial branch and you can give a very good relief to the patient. So I'm just doing a <laughs> radio frequency ablation in the left L45. So I used to take my needle from the medial to the lateral portion initially in the oblique view and when I make it in the uh, AP view, this will be my uh, RF needle orientation and this is my uh, lateral view. I'll ensure that my needle is not inside the foramen and uh, it is just posterior to the foramen. And once it has been done, these are the proper sensory and the motor stimulation testing results that has to be obtained and only when we get this one the duration that is it means that the, uh, the electrode is present exactly near the nerve and you will get a long lasting relief. So the sensory sh threshold should be less than 0.5, multifidus contraction should be less than 0.5 and there should be no gluteal or leg muscle contraction at two voltages post the, the once we achieve all these three things it means that our needle is in proper position and we can prevent the ablation of the nerve root or the DRG and we can just give local anesthesia 1 ml and we can start ablating for like up to 85 degrees Celsius. So this is the efficacy and validity of uh, radiofrequency neurotomy. 
in uh, chronic facet joint pain syndrome here they say that the response at 12 months is like uh, 60 percentage relief for 85 87 percentage and 80 percent relief for 60 percentage this is the conventional rf technique that we use but normally in my personal experience i used to do cooled rf where i used to where i have uh, patients uh, complaining of like pain free for more than two years so this is a comparison between intraarticular injection and the radio frequency denervation and the results are very clear that the radio frequency denervation gives a more prolonged uh, better relief when compared to that of the intraarticular injection and uh, finally just a last slide uh, regarding the endoscopically guided uh, foraminal and dorsal rhizotomy the first paper was been uh, published in <coughs> published by Anthony Young sir and uh, Shatish Chandra Gore sir which gives you the technique of how do we approach this uh, medial branch endoscopically and how we target them and what are the conditions where we target them. The diagnostic criteria remains the same only the procedure di uh, differs and uh, the next paper is saying that uh, the comparison between the radio frequency ablation and the lumbar facet joint uh, um, endoscopic rhizotomy here the results clearly states that the endos endoscopic rhizotomy gives a more prolonged relief but the degree of tissue damage which has been done by this procedure is more when compared to that of an RF ablation but still the data they have just given an interim results because this study was been uh, <coughs> done uh, they have started the study on 2017 and uh, ended it on 2021 still they are calculating the data and yet to be published yet so thank you very much Thank you, Vishnu. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Vishnu again uh, is very much interested in endoscope. Clean. Grasp for Clean, madam. Saline pressure. Height, man. Pump area, pump pressure code, grasper code. Cutter. Fluid, uh, increase the pressure. Fluid is not coming. Hello, Mahesha, we Hello? are watching you. Hello? Yeah, yeah, we, we are watching. Ha, ah, okay. So, this patient had a previous uh, open discectomy. Yes. For L5S1 disc herniation. Now, uh, he is 24 years old. Yeah. He has come back with the recurrent symptoms. Yes. If you see the MRI, there is a left paracentral disc protrusion at L5S1 level uh, with the uh, previous... Uh, evidence of previous open surgery yeah and uh, there is some facetal hypertrophy as well as uh, osteophytes there so we have taken an entry point of 16 centimeter here mm -hmm. one six one six is uh, two two lateral i mean i mean still uh, you know i had to drill some uh, facet first okay and uh, now what we are seeing is this hard uh, uh, annulus. Okay. So, is the, is the patient obese? I mean, uh, trunk white? Uh, no, the problem is uh, there is a lot of uh, the facet is big. Okay. So that's why I think previously 
uh, uh, endoscopy was tried, but uh, it was could not be done. Yeah. Now you can see the uh, S1 root free now after cutting the hard annulus here. Can you see? Uh, it's a little hazy huh? because it's bleeding. Huh? So uh, one second, uh, give me the cap. I will just uh, control some bleeding. So what I have done is first I have drilled the facet in spite of uh, taking a 16 centimeter entry point. I have drilled the facet and that is, uh, we can see the S1 now root. Yeah, that is the S1 root here. Yeah, 12. Okay. So I have to just cut this little bit here and decompress, that's all. Okay. There is not much of a fragment, fragment. here, exactly, but uh, yeah. it is just a hard annulus with a small disc underneath. So I am just rotating the cannula and the scope to see what I am catching. Clean. Cutter. The space is collapsed here. This space is collapsed because maybe I, we do not know what was the previous herniation. Maybe there was a massive disc herniation and yeah, uh, possible, possible. The space is completely collapsed. Yeah. So, cutter. I'll just remove this tissue, which is part of the annulus. because otherwise it will come in our way of vision, grasper. How many of you are uh, attending or seeing this endoscopy for the first time? Grasper. Only two? Three. So otherwise most of them have some exposure Cutter. to endoscopy? So you can see the S1 root very clearly now. Yeah. Can you appreciate S1 root? Yes, yes, yes. So this is a hard annulus which I will cut and I will use curate to do some more decompression. So what is happening is uh, uh, I am going towards the S1 end plate because of the direction. Grasper. So this is a left sided disc, so left sided symptoms. So you can imagine uh, he's working towards the end plate, upper end plate of S1. Yeah. It's a small fragment which yes. came out. Because I have taken a 16 centimeter yes. entry point, I could expose the root very easily without much drilling. Yeah, exactly, yes. Otherwise, I would have been drilling whole day. Yeah. So and there's a soft disc fragment which is coming up. Unlike the previous two cases, uh, there is not a big fragment here. Yeah. It is because of the chronic adhesions and uh, uh, hard annulus and there is a small fragment underneath. You will not see a very big fragment like the previous two cases here. This patient, if I remember, he had symptoms since the past one month and a couple of days back he came you see? back. Yeah. Can you see the yes, yes, yes. fragment? Yeah. Maybe that's why he was symptomatic. Yes. So I think the job is done. It's a big one. It is. It was hidden inside. Mm. And not coming out easily.
just refusing to come out. In this case, the elacrest was type 2. We have five types of elacrest. Oh. So it was type 2. Type. So uh, supralac was possible in this case. But then the, he had issues with the facet. The facet was quite huge. So if you go by regular, say 11, 11 centimeters, 30 centimeters, oh. then you go deep because the facet Hello, will not allow you to go horizontal. That's why no he has taken three centimeters more laterally and almost gone flat. He has not, he has not done any rimming. He has gone straight Fresh horizontal model, from a distance of 60 centimeters, which we routinely don't do. Yeah, unless the patient is very obese, it's very difficult. There are high chances that we go and hit the nerve uh, root. If you go say 11, 30 centimeters, you'll go anteriorly. But as you come back, come more laterally, then you go more horizontal. But when you go horizontal, then there's a chance that you hit the nerve root or you hit the cord, yeah. RF, RF. Now, what do you think the traversing route? Yeah. Exit route from where this side. This is the traversing route. Exit route will be here. This is the super input of uh, S1. This is left. So, the exit route will be here. Exit route will be upper end plate. Curate. This is the traversing route. So, that is the traversing route which you yeah. see there which is decompressed already. Mahesha, yeah. uh, can you orient us please? Yeah, 3 o'clock here, can you see? This is cranial. I mean, sorry, 9 o'clock. This is cranial. 3 o'clock is caudal. This is superior. 6 yeah, o'clock okay. is inferior. Fine, fine, fine. fine. This okay, is the root, okay. you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. Yes. This is the osteophyte here. Yeah. And this is the root here. Yes. So I will see if there is anything between the root and the osteophyte. Yeah, there seems to be a small fragment there. You see? Grasper. Most of the times, it's a small uh, soft fragment sitting over an osteophyte, which causes the symptoms. I don't want to remove too much there. So. Let me see. Curate. Curate again. Yes, grasper. Can you see the fragment is released? Yeah. It was under this root. Curate again. Curate. Grasper. Curate.
So I'm using curate to depress this bone. Arif. Cutter. Can you increase the light? Light seems to be some brightness. Cutter. Take it. Correct. Yes, that is better. It was looking you like a night uh, surgery. Yeah, that's okay. So I just broken the osteophyte there. Grasper, grasper. Clean. Curate. Grasper. <coughs> cutter, give me a cutter. Give me another cutter. Yeah, it's all hard annulus. Clean. 
cutter. You have a flexible cutter. Flexible. It's not there in that. From your set. Can you get it? Flexible cutter. RF. Okay. Ah, oh, sorry. Can you increase the pressure? Pressure is very poor. Cutter. Another cutter. There is another cutter. Maybe. Yeah. You have a flexible cutter? Flexible idea. <laughs> yeah, you see it is. See, this was the culprit. Can you see? Hello? Yeah, 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 we are on. Yeah, this was a fragment which was causing him symptoms probably. So that came out. That was impinging the root. RF, RF. I, I need a flexible grasper if you have. You see it is free now? Yes. Alpha pressure could up. I died. Cutter, okay, very good. Now I am using a flexible cutter, but it is hard. Okay. to remove that hump. So transforaminal surgery, this is one instrument oh. you should have. LA. No LA. LA they know. Madhwaliyalla. Madhwaliyalla. So I am removing this hump. See, I have not entered the uh, disk space because it is completely collapsed. This is angular, angular grasp, the cutter. This, this is, is a cutter. flexible cutter. Flexible cutter. Is there Sangli, sir, is that? Dr. Anil Sangli has excellent uh, range of instruments with him. Yeah, yeah, he's got... He's so got He's got Please a showroom of instruments. Convey my thanks to him. Because without this cutter, I cannot uh, remove this hump. Yes. Yeah. So, he has a big box of instruments here. He keeps buying, he's an investor. Yeah. So, so you can see the dural pulsations above. Okay. Okay. I will just remove this one hump here. It's oozing a little. That's why the picture is not very, very clear. Yeah, you can yeah, see, know. but uh, not very. No. RF. The pressure is very less, so that's why it is oozing. 
in spite of uh, pump pressure is uh, you see very little water is coming out of the scope cutter hmm. you see this is the disk space there is hardly about 3 millimeters yes, 4 millimeters RF. You can see the whole uh, tickle sac pulsating yeah. as well as uh, the root is free now. Cutter. There is one small hump there, so let me see if it is coming out. Sorry? Draping. Uh, RF. So what they have done is, uh, you have to see that blue Curate. plastic sheet. Yeah, cutter, cutter. It's a plastic sheet. We make a small hole in that. Yeah, so that uh, the hmm. fluid drops along the plastic sheet into a bucket now. Yeah, we just use that to prevent more soiling of the things. You understand cutter. what I said? We get this plastic cutter. sheets, sterile plastic sheets. We make a hole in that and put it over the cannula. That of the kind and through that you put the scope. So whatever saline is going down, it flows down the sheet into the bucket now. Yeah. This is a uh, technique used by urologists basically, you know. Grasper. Uh, Grasper. Flexible cutter. Flexible cutter. You can take the next case. Clean, clean. Curate. First RF. Temperature, I don't know, but uh, what we use is suppose this is RF. Uh, we use a bipolar. Suppose you don't have an RF, we use a bipolar also, but we keep it around 20 bipolar, regular bipolar. We keep it at 20 and use it. Okay, okay. Grasper, cutter, cutter, small cutter. The, the probe will be there. This probe you can connect it directly to the bipolar. This. this probe, what we have, what is using, you can connect it to a bipolar pottery also. Flexible cutter. Okay. Here we keep four, five. Here we keep maximum up to twelve. Flexible maximum cutter. up to twelve. Four, five, six. Clean madapa. Coagulation. No, it will not reach there. You cutter. Grasper. It's more of a cold cautery sort of systems. Polar. Flexible grasp per idea. Double. You ask me the numbers, it's around between 4 and 12, that's what you use. Yeah, 
Flexor Gasper. Yeah. Uh, Professor, uh, the Mayesh, are you expecting any fragment hiding under no, the No, the fragment is uh, out. Yeah. So I am just seeing if that small hump is there that I can remove it. That's okay. All. So the root is free. Yes. Actually, because if of the previous surgery, okay. there are adhesions. So yeah. it is not easy. Exactly. You can see the dural pulsations at top. Can you see? Yes, yes, yes. Cure it. So I just wanted to remove that hump. Yeah. So the dural pulsations you can see here. There is a small hump here, which I will just see if I can take it out. Cutter. Cutter. Yeah. No, that is part of end plate, so I'll not take it out. Cutter. So I have cleared it. Yeah, yes, you can see that. Very small, uh, very small hump is there. Uh, if possible, I will take it out. Otherwise, we can leave it as it is. So. Cure it. I can see the dural pulsations. Yeah, and the flapping of the handles yeah. also. So that means it is uh, decompressed well. So this is loose only. It is maybe there are some additions there. So oh, that's why. Uh, give me R. So I will just check how much I have gone here. AP, CM, AP. So if I go on up to near the midline, it is fine. You see, this is a small hump here. It's okay. So this is my extent of decompression. Okay, so just uh, near the midline, I think that is good enough. Sh show the show the IITV image, please. Down, down, go down. Can Aud you see? Audio visual. Hello. Yeah, yeah, we can see. Yeah, so that means uh, I have gone enough uh, medially. So <laughs> it is just a paracentral hump which I have cleared already. So dura is freely pulsatile. See him out, please. So, if you have any lectures remaining? No, we are done with the lectures. You are done with lectures? <laughs> so, we require about uh, 10 minutes to start the other case. Yeah, yeah. We will carry on with some discussions. Yeah. Nowadays. Okay. This is finished. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Wonderful. Okay. Wonderful. This is the first set. Okay. Yeah. The route is here. <coughs> Exiting route. Okay. Yes, Ranta. No, come here, Takali, though.
ಹೋಯ್ತಲ್ಲ ಸೊ ಪೇಶೆಂಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಫುಲ್ ರಿಲೀಫ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಪೇನ್ ಕಾಂಗ್ರಾಚುಲೇಷನ್ಸ್ ವಂಡರ್ಫುಲ್ ಸೊ ಯೂಶಲಿ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ರಿಕರೆಂಟ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ ದಿ ಎಂಡ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಡಿ ಕಂಪ್ರೆಷನ್ ಆರ್ ಡಿಫ್ರೆಂಟ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದಿ ಯೂಶುವಲ್ ವರ್ಜನ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ ಸಬ್ ಕಿಟ್ ಇನ್ ಸ್ವೈಕ್ರಿಲ್ ಒಂದು ಕೆ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಬಿಟ್ ಡಿಫರೆಂಟ್ you are not able to see the entirety of the neural tissue beans uh, uh, the scar tissue around there the other thing what happens is that the patient are in more pain than a virgin disc thirdly the local is not effective in that region instruments no other side gakla beda idu irli idu matra scope matra no other side gak nimdu scope idiya astare illa ha sir indra de use madu disc mar bantalla okay that's good nimdu in scope idra adu use madu ha scope matu idre idre camera la idu nimde ide fire adu use madu 4.3 alla same scope alla 4.3 alla but idu namge bekagutte bekagutte haudu namge ee box ond bekagutte idu use madilla alla open madilla alla ಹಂಗೆ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಕೊಟ್ಬಿಡಿ ಇದನ್ನು ಓಪನ್ ಮಾಡೋದು ಬೇಡ ಹಂಗೆ ಕೊಟ್ಬಿಡು ಅಲ್ಲ ನಮಗೆ ಇದು ಇದೇ ಬಾಕ್ಸ್ ಬೇಕಾಗುತ್ತೆ ಕೆರಿಸನ್ ಎಲ್ಲ ಇದೆಲ್ಲ ಇದೆ ಓಕೆ ಕೊಡಿ ಫೋರ್ ಸೆಪ್ಸ್ ಕೊಡಿ ಫೋರ್ ಸೆಪ್ಸ್ ಶೇವರ್ ಅದು ಇದಕ್ಕೆ ಹಾಕಿ ಹಾಂ ನೋವು ಸೈಡಿಗೆ ಹಾಕಿ ಶೇವರ್ ಮತ್ತೊಂದು ಮೂರು ಬರ್ ಹಾಕಿ ಅಷ್ಟು ಹಾಕಿದರೆ ಮತ್ತೆ ಆಟೋಕ್ಲೇವಿ ಕಳಿಸಿ ಅದು ರೆಡಿ ಆಗುವಾಗ ಸಾಕಾಗತ್ತೆ ನಮಗೆ ಮೋಪ್ ಹೆಸರೇ ನೀವು ಪೇಷಂಟ್ ಹೆಸರು ಬಾಲರಾಜ್ ನೋವು ಕಮ್ಮಿ ಆಯ್ತಾ ಮುಂಚಿತ ನೋವು ಹೋಯ್ತಲ್ಲ ಹ್ಞೂ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಭೂಪೇಶ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಲವ್ ಕುಶ್ ಪಾಂಡೆ ಆರ್ ಹ್ಯಾವಿಂಗ್ ಟುಡೇ ಲೇಟ್ ನೈಟ್ ಸೊ ಹಿ ದೇರ್ ಟಾಕ್ಸ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಕವರ್ ಟುಮಾರೋ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಒನ್ ಮೋರ್ ಟಾಕ್ ಬೈ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಸುಕುಮಾರ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಡನ್ ಬೈ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಮಹೇಶ್ ಆರ್ ಟುಮಾರೋ ಪ್ಯಾನಲ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಷನ್ ವಿ ಡೂ ಇಟ್ ಟುಮಾರೋ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ಬ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಇನ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಹೋಟೆಲ್ ಇಟ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಓಕೆ ಸೊ ನಾಟ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಮಿಸ್ ಎನಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಟುಡೇ the life surgery took little more time than expected beda yeah. dressing up okay. okay sorry namge e box id instrument ella beku so what you do is idu 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 ha take it ಇದು ಇದಕ್ಕೆ ಹಾಕಿ ಸೈಡ್ ಎಕ್ಸಿಗೆ ಹಾಕಿ ವಾಶ್ ಮಾಡಿ ನೋವ ಸೈಡಿಗೆ ಹಾಕಿ ಸೊ ಅದು ಇಟ್ಕೊಳ್ಳಿ ವಾಶ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಇದು ಫುಲ್ ನನಗೆ ಬೇಕಾಗತ್ತೆ ಈ ಬಾಕ್ಸ್ ಫುಲ್ ಬೇಕು ಇದು ಬೇಡ ಆಯಿತಾ ಇದು ಬೇರೆ ಇಟ್ಕೊಳ್ಳಿ ಒಟ್ಟಿಗೆ ಆಟೋಕ್ಲೇವ್ ಮಾಡಬೇಕು you can visit the stalls if you are free i think we can just go around yeah one more surgery will be there yes
Yes. Hello. Yes. Okay. Hello. Yes. Yeah, uh, we will be starting in another 10 minutes. Okay. Because uh, this is a alpha S1 disc herniation. Ah. So I will give you the details once I wash and come in. Okay. So this should be over in 30 minutes. So we will not uh, make yeah, you yeah. wait for long time. We have a plan for going out for dinner after that. In just 30 minutes it will be it's over. Sorry, better finish with <laughs> Actually, we wanted to put this in between the talks, but then it was not possible. So, this change over time is there. <coughs> no. Yeah, can you focus the MRI? Sterilium. Yes. Sterilium. Okay. Can you see the MRI? Hello? Yeah, Mahesha, tell me. Yeah, can you see the MRI? Yes, yes, yes. So, um, these are the sagittal section. This is a uh, patient, 38 year old patient with a driver by occupation who presented with back pain and bilateral sciatica. There yeah. is nothing particular uh, which is more. So, both are equal. Okay. So, he has uh, something like neurogenic claudication. Okay. So, and back pain, you, these are sections from left to right, you see here, yeah. there is a extruded disc, you come down, it is going up here in the midline, Okay. and slightly to the right side also. Yeah. If you see the sagittal sections, this is a uh, cut at the upper end plate, you can yeah. see there is a fragment there, Yes. this is at disc level, and this is at the lower end plate and there is some downward migration also. Okay. So basically it's a central disc with uh, compressing both the nerve roots on yes, either side? Yes, it is a central disc causing back pain and bilateral sciatica. Okay. So once we take out this fragment, he should be having good pain relief. Okay. So while doing interlabnar, we need more of retraction here? Hello? Hello? We are planning interlaminar or uh, transfer? Yeah, we are planning interlaminar. Okay. So, patient is under epidural, uh -huh. uh, single shot. Uh, so, we don't know because sometimes what happens is that if the depth of anesthesia is not adequate, uh, when we retract the root, there may be some pain. Okay. So, let us see how it goes. But anyway, we should be finishing it uh, in 30 minutes because uh, uh, interlaminar approach is... Uh, very quick, straightforward, and there are uh, no bony work uh, expected here. Yeah, we know your speed. So just uh, once we cut the flavum, we'll be in the epidural space and expose the disc and take it out. Okay. And for this, we don't require anything special here. Just uh, the scope, dilator, cannula. Then we require uh, one annular cutter, dissector, RF and graspers, that's all. We don't require flexible instruments here. Unlike the previous case where we had to use everything. So we will, I have marked the, can you show the CM? 
just show the no no the focus there I've just marked the level in the lateral view you can see the uh, level of marking I have used an 18 gauge needle and marked on the opposite side so I'll be going from left side because the fragment is uh, based more on the left side Normally back home I do these cases under spinal anesthesia because it is just one shot it will give good analgesia and uh, we don't have to monitor the patient for this L5 S1 disc because S1 root there is enough space and freedom for retraction unlike the upper lumbar disc. Sterilium. It's so very important to dry the field before you put this uh, drape or uh, oxide because if you don't dry it, all these adhesives will come out and patient will be wet at the end of the surgery. Second glove, seven and a half. Dialy ka kya nala jaye? Jaye ni jo scope, sorry jaye na, four point. Okay. So we will be using a four point three mm working tunnel scope from MP Medical. Glove, glove. Ah, da agu dilla. Dialy ter kya nala we require bigger one. Ili the. So ida agar. Okay. Under the cannula, where is it? Under. Ah, this one. Yeah. Seven and a half. Seven and a half. Can you get the camera and scope ready? Camera to God. That's uh, better. Camera. Camera scope to God. So, can you get the CM? Yes. 
So I will just uh, check uh, under AP. Should focus on the this one C CCTV. Yeah. Uh, come up. Show. Sure. Show. Sure. Can you see my knife? Hello? Yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, it is just at the medial pedicle line, just medial to the facet. Okay. Lateral. So one second. So I'll make the incision here. We now we want to see the CM picture. Yeah. Ah, okay, one second. We will show you in a minute. So there is a very good interlaminar window here. Okay. So we are not expecting any bony work. We will show in a minute uh, the IITV images. Mahesha, once you put the insertion, we are going to start the stopwatch. So. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you have 30 minutes. <laughs> 30 minutes now. Okay. So I have given uh, uh, more time. Now we know your speed. We can make it 20 also. <laughs> I did not tell 10 minutes. So maybe 8.30 we will start and 9 it should be over. Okay. We are just uh, getting the things uh, arranged. The scope, camera, yeah, RF, no hurry, no hurry. everything. So Ready, can you see? Uh, can you see the images? Yeah, yes, yes. So, alpha S1, you do start uh, just lateral to midline. Yeah. And make a 8 millimeter incision. And cut the fascia. So, yeah, cut the fascia. And then insert the dilator. So, normally I just take one shot. You don't take uh, much of CM. So, so you can feel the lamina and then go down. <coughs> sure. So, and Hi. that is the S1 lamina. So we have to go to the interlaminar space here. Sure. Okay. So that is the interlaminar window. We'll check lateral for. Uh, Confirmation. Once you have experience, uh, you don't have to take uh, much uh, uh, images in the interlaminar approach because you know where you are. So we are taking extra images for the conference. Canola ready, madam. Yeah. Okay. So we are in the interlaminar window now. And I'll put this uh, cannula. You can see the bevel, bevel facing medially. Okay. The bevel should be facing medially. Sure. So AP. So when you go for alpha S1, always uh, this. Uh, <coughs> your entry will be inferior because the interlaminar window is not parallel to the disc in the lateral view. So you will be always uh, little below, as you see here in the lateral view. Table fully down. So you can see the cannula. I'm quite happy with the position. Take it out. So you don't require any more CM unless there is some doubt. So table fully down. <coughs> yeah. Hello. So once Mahesh, we, sir? Yeah. Uh, so do we have to position the CM in a particular way or the position uh, or the patient in a particular way so that we can see uh, the interlaminar window the way Yeah, if you don't see the interlaminar window clearly, then you may have to take a Ferguson view. Okay. But here uh, I can see the window properly, so I have not taken. But 
If required, you may have, if there is lot of lordosis, then you may have to take a Ferguson view in the AP. Lateral okay. anyway, it doesn't matter. You have to take a true lateral. That's all. Bucket could have. So you can stop, uh, start the watch timer. Table fully down? Fully down? OK. So once we uh, put the scope, this is what we see. So can I get a step? So you will see some muscle fibers. in the interlaminar space. Once we take clear this muscle, you will see the flavum. RF. Foot switch in Utah, go up, brother. Yeah, yeah, press. Brother, you press, ah, OK, yeah, OK. Can you see the muscle fibers? Uh, yes, yes. And deep to that is the flavum. Yeah. And uh, here, this is the flavum. Can you okay. see? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Very so clear. six o'clock is facet. Twelve o'clock is midline. Okay. Okay. Nine o'clock is cranial. Yeah. I can feel the lamina, lamina here. Yeah. Okay. This is the alpha lamina. And uh, three o'clock is caudal. Okay. Okay. The ligamentum flavum or uh, it's uh, interlaminar ligament? Yeah, it is the flavum only. Okay. I've removed some muscle and the flavum is seen here directly. Okay. Okay. So with the bone cautery, if you touch the metal, yeah, it, it stops nice. working. Yes, sir. Okay. So this is the interlaminar window and that is the Flavum. So once you expose, expose the flavum, you have to cut it. Cutter, cutter. Which scope you are using this, Mahesha? This is a 4.3 channel scope from MP Medical. I think this is uh, Sangli sir's scope. Paramna scope. Huh? Ravindra sir's, okay. I don't know. Yeah, Paramna scope. I need scope. a good cutter. Another cutter. You use the same scope for all uh, interlaminar surgeries? Yes, I do use the same scope. Okay. I use the same scope for uh, transforaminal, interlaminar, cervical, everything. Uh, can you get the cutter from... Uh, because this cutter is not cutting well, so I need another cutter. So you can press on the cannula to stretch the flavum and then cut. Give order. So instruments what you are using also are uh, used in transforaminal? Yes, same instruments. Press. Stop, stop. <coughs> grasper, small grasper. <coughs> RF. Cutter, where is it? Okay. 
Brahaspa. So you need a good cutter to cut the flavour. See how many ones? One AP. Come. Till we get the cutter, I will just check one AP. Down, 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 down. Okay, sure. Okay, out. Can you get a cutter? Give the old cutter. You need to have two cutters basically. One is a straight cutter and another is angled cutter. Straight cutter is required when you do the initial cutting to enter into the canal. Once you enter the canal, we go laterally towards the facet. So that time you require angled cutter. Unless we have a good cutter, you can't cut this flavum it is because it is quite thick. Grass for Cutter Banta. So I am just waiting for cutter. And dissector idea. There must be a new one recently bought from Hepsons. Yeah, but uh, this one we require a much. Uh, Cutter. Cutter. This cutter, it is little big, so we require little smaller and angled cutters. So, grasp. So I am just thinning out the flavour. Ido, adhan li store si the cutta di dia bere. Store si the cutta. Hmm. Hello. Ah, salpa ido fog ay tapa clean mande. Clean mande, dry mande. Ille sa dry mande. Dry mud. Nand box sterile, lala. Okay, good. We'll have to wait for some time for the cutter to come. So. So here it is. I just made a small opening here with the dissector cutter. <laughs> okay, can you see the epidural space? 
uh, yeah. Uh, just made the entry Small into the epidural yes, space. Yes, yes, yeah. So cutter. The flavor is quite thick here. Cut. Can you see the epidural fat? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Can see the cord So I will try to manage with this whatever is available. So now I turn towards the lateral side. So what I do is I go inside, rotate my instrument by 180 degree and go lateral side. So I have to go laterally till I reach the lateral edge of the uh, root or the medial board of the facet. So still I have to go lateral cutter. So the patient is okay with uh, single, uh, single shot epidural? So far is okay, but we don't know. Yeah, we have to retract the root. Question comes uh, when we retract the nerve root, okay. So, you can go inside, cutter. So once you go inside, you can set the flavum and also see it better. Just try to go inside with this cannula. All right. So you will see the epidural fat, which you need to clear to define the root. So once you define the root, I need to go a little more lateral. Cutter. So I generally use imported cutters for this work, which work very well. RF, some bladers are there. <coughs> Again, fogging, brother. Fogging, fogging, just clean it. So, normally we use uh, camera cover. If you don't use camera cover, uh, this is what happens, there will be some water spillage and uh, there will be fogging. Once there is fogging, vision becomes poor. So, <coughs> cutter. If you have a kerosen, it is very good. Uh, we can cut this flavum easily. So, we don't have uh, any of them, so we'll manage with whatever we have. Okay. Cutter. Huh? How much time? No, you have to wait for any instrument you have to wait for at least 15 minutes before that you should not take because you cannot compromise on sterility time is not important can you see the facet here hello yeah uh, lateral i mean medial border of the facet i will show you in a moment okay can you see the bone here at uh, 3 o'clock position? It's oozing a little, we can't clear, but it's okay, we, we take it over. Uh, uh, give me a dissector if you have.
Can you see the bone here? Yes, yes, yes. This is the yeah. bone. So okay. this is the facet, OK? OK. So okay. that means you have reached the lateral limit of your phlegm dissection. OK. OK? Grasper. So once we reach there, you will see a picture like this where you can see only fat. So we need to clear the fat with graspers gently so that you don't pull out the root. RF, and then use coagulation. So here the fragment will be mostly in the axilla. So the root is there somewhere. Grasper. Grasper. <coughs> Sector. Grasper. I'm little inferior. What I'm seeing is S1 there. Okay, cutter. Because what has happened is uh, my entry is slightly inferior. So I'll just go more proximal. This is the L5 lamina. Can you see? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, cutter. This fogging is again again. Let's clean it up. Cutter. Fogging. Uh, what happens is, uh, if when you don't cover the camera, little bit water spillage, it will fog again and again. Okay, so dissector. So let us see where the root is. Okay, RF. Dissector. Uh, 
So can you see the disk here? Hello? Nobody there? Yes, yes. So this is the disk here. The root is here. You see the disk fragment came out. Yeah, coming out. Yeah. The root is here. Grasp. If I pull it, it won't come out. Okay, now it will come out. So I have not retracted the root. I have just uh, exposed the disk and I am taking it out. A small grasper. And the butter fog again. Clean. Next time you should put a cover. Without cover, you should not put it. Okay, small grass part. Can you give a another grasper? Grasper. It is refusing to come out. Give me another grasper. Uh, give a different one. Not don't give the used one. Give me another one. Well, it's not catching. Not catching, so, so it's not coming. So it is not catching so because the disk is soft. Cutter, 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 cutter. How much time is there? Arif. 
Rasmus. So I have retracted the root now. Can you see? Hello? Yes, yes. So this is the fragment? Yep. Okay. Take. Yeah, you have another five minutes to go. Yeah, I'm not uh, counting on time because uh, <laughs> I am not working in my usual. Yeah, you, it's not your setup. Different. And uh, some issues, so. No, but in spite of all that, you have you managed to finish it in half an hour. Anyway, the fragment is out in expected time and. Yes. Because normally we put camera cover and there is no fogging. So if you don't put camera cover, it fogs here and there. So Dissector. So there was one up-migrated fragment. Probably that has come with this small down-migration. So let us see if there is anything here. Where is the upper end plate? Yeah, this is uh, one more hard fragment here, which I will take it out. Luckily, our epidural is working without trouble. So that way we are safe. Grasper? Yeah, I told you Dr. Guraj is very good. So that way it's fine. We did not have to change it to anything else. This is the up-migrated fragment, you see? Yeah, yes, yes. Good. So it will come out now, okay? Yep, okay? Sir. Yeah, yes. Okay, this is a big yeah, piece, yes, okay? Yes, sure. Wow, yes. Um. Wow. Yes. Grasper, there is still maybe one more piece there. Yep. Dissector. So Give me the cutter. Ah, Grasper, cut up. Cutter, cut up. This is a hard annulus here, which I will cut it off. I think once we do that, it is finished. So, clean. Uh, I will not go into the disk space and do any destruction here. RF. Again, it is fogging, brother. Score camera to be cleaned again. Clean. Always put a camera cover so that this issue of fogging doesn't bother you. Still, it is troublesome. Just clean both sides. So here we are, RF. Dissector, give me dissector. RF, give me RF now.
There is a small hump here, which uh, I will not do anything probably. Grasper. A dissector, give me a dissector. Are Give me a cutter. The fragments are out, uh, some little final clearance is remaining, grass fur. So with that, I think it will be over. So I'm not going to enter the displays here because there is no need to do that. RF again, water, can you increase the water pressure? Pressure, thoda, padao. Increase the pressure a bit because nothing is coming. Saline is grasper. We have to change the saline. So when you want to do this endoscopy, always it's a better idea to get saline bags which are collapsible and it will give a good irrigation instead of the bottles. Bottles don't give Good pressure. Dissector, good up. Oh, curate, curate, idea, curate or hook. Saline salpa pressure. Oh, not there. Okay. Grasper. Cutter go down. Pump paaki de ra illwa. No pump? Huh? I'm not getting good pressure here, so that's why there is some oozing. So if I get a good pressure, there will not be bleeding. And again and again, this is fogging because we have not put a cover. Clean Madapa. Hmm. Grasper. So anyway, the procedure is so finished. So I just need to clear for my satisfaction. That's all. Uh, okay, Mahesh, then So you can break for... Uh, yeah, it's already dinner, 9 o'clock now. Yeah. So... Procedure is over. So yeah. The so route is free here, you see. Sure, yes. Uh, the fragments are out. So I'm not going to go into the disk space. Sure. That's all. There is a vehicle waiting for you outside. Yeah, okay. So the security guy will uh, guide you so they can okay, come back fine. to the hotel. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank yeah. you. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Grasper. Switch off. Close. Stand up. RF code up.
ਤੇ